Section 1 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Preface Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell On occasion of the 200th birthday of President Abraham Lincoln The Lincoln Storybook A judicious collection of the best stories and anecdotes of the great president, many appearing here for the first time in book form. Compiled by Henry L. Williams Preface the Abraham Lincoln statue at Chicago is accepted as the typical Westerner of the Forum, the Rostrum and the Tribune, as he stood to be inaugurated under the war cloud in 1861. But there is another Lincoln, as dear to the common people, the Lincoln of happy quotations, the speaker of household words. Instead of the erect, impressive, penetrative platform orator, we see a long, gaunt figure, divided between two chairs for comfort, the head bent forward, smiling broadly, the lips curved in laughter, the deep eyes irradiating their caves of wisdom, the storytelling Lincoln enjoying the enjoyment he gave to others. This talkativeness, as Lincoln himself realized, was a very valuable asset. Leaving home, he found in a venture at Yankee notion peddling that glibness meant three hundred percent in disposing of flimsy wares. In the camp of the lumberjacks and of the Indian rangers, he was regarded as the pride of the mess and the inspirator of the tent. From these stages he rose to be a graduate of the College of the Yarn Spinner, the village store where he became clerk. The store we know is the township vortex where all assembled to swap stories and deal out the news. Lincoln from behind the counter, his pulpit, not merely repeated items of information which he had heard, but also recited doggerel satire of his own concoction, punning and emitting sparks of wit. Lincoln was hailed as the capper of any good things on the rounds. Even then his friends saw the germs of the statesman in the lank, homely, crack-voiced hobbledy-hoy. Their praise emboldened him to stand forward as the spokesman at schoolhouse meetings, lectures, log-rollings, huskings auctions, fairs, and so on, the folk meets of our people. When watching him in 1830, said foresightedly, Lincoln has touched land at last. In commencing electioneering, he cultivated the farming population and their ways and diction. He learned by their parlance and Bible phrases to construct short sentences of small words. But he had all along the idea that the plain people are more easily influenced by a broad and humorous illustration than in any other way. It is the Anglo-Saxon trait distinguishing all great preachers, actors, and authors of that breed. He acknowledged his personal defects with a frankness unique and startling, told a girl whom he was courting that he did not believe any woman could fancy him, publicly said that he could not be in looks what was rated a gentleman, carried a knife of the homeliest man, disparaged himself like a Brutus or a Pope Sixtus. But the mass relished this plain, blunt man who spoke right on. He talked himself into being the local eminence, but did not succeed in winning the election when first presented as the humble candidate for the state senate. He stood upon his imperfect education, his not belonging to the first families but the seconds, and his shunning society as debarring him from the study he required. Repulsed at the polls, he turned to the law as another channel supplementing forensic failings by his artful storytelling. Judges would suspend business till that Lincoln fellow got through with his yarn spinning, or underhandedly would direct the usher to get the rich bit Lincoln told and repeat it at the recess. Mrs. Lincoln, the first to weigh this man justly, said proudly that Lincoln was the great favorite everywhere. Meanwhile his fellow citizens, stupidly tired of this merry Andrew, they sent him elsewhere to talk other folks to death. To the state house, where he served several terms creditably, but was mainly the fund of jollity to the lobby and the chartered gesture of the lawmakers. Such loquacious witchery fitted him for the Congress. Elected to the House, he was immediately greeted by connoisseurs of the best stamp, President Martin Van Buren, Prince of the Good Fellows, Webster, another intellect, Saturnine in repose and mercurial in activity, the convivial Senator Douglas, and the like. These formed the wrapped ring around Lincoln in his own chair in the snug corner of the congressional chat-room. Here he perceived that his rusticity and shallow skimmings placed him under the trained politicians. It was here, too, that his stereotype prologue to his digressions, that reminds me, became popular and even reached England, where a publisher so entitled a joke-book. 
Lincoln displaced Sam Slick and opened the way to Artemus Ward and Mark Twain. The longing for elevation was fanned by the association with the notables, Buchanan to be his predecessor as president, Andrew Johnson to be his vice and successor, Jefferson Davis and Alex H. Stevens, president and vice president of the CSA, Adams, Winthrop, Sumner, and the galaxy over whom his solitary star was to shine dazzlingly. A sound authority who knew him of old pronounced him as good at telling an anecdote as in the thirties. But the fluent chatterer reined in and became a good listener. He imbibed all the political ruses and returned home with his quiver full of new and victorious arrows for the presidential campaign, for his bosom friends urged him to try to gratify that ambition, preposterous when he first felt it attack him. He had grown out of the sensitiveness that once made him beg the critics not to put him out by laughing at his appearance. He formed a boundless arsenal of images and smiles. He learned the American humorist's art not to parade the joke with a discounting smile. He worked out Euclid to brace his fantasies, as the steel bar in a cement fence post makes it irresistibly firm, but he allowed his vehement fervor to carry him into such flights as left the reporters unable to accompany his sentences throughout. He was recognized as the destined national mouthpiece. He was not of the universities, but of the universe, the Mississippi of eloquence, uncultivated, stupendous, enriched by sweeping into the innumerable side by use and creeks. Elected and re-elected president, he continued to be a surprise to those who shrank from levity. Lincoln was their puzzle, for he had a sweet sauce for every roast and showed the smile of invigoration to every croaking prophet. His state papers suited the war tragedies, but still he delighted the people with those tales tagging all the events of what may be called the Lincoln era. The camp and the press echoed them, though the cabinet frowned. Secretaries said that they exposed the illustrious speaker to charges of clownishness and buffoonery. But his perennial good humor, perfectly poised by the people, alleviated the strain of withstanding that terrible avalanche threatening to dismember and obliterate the states and bury all the virtues and principles of our forefathers. Even his official letters were in the same vein. Regarding the one to England which meant war, he asked the secretary Seward if its language would be comprehended by our minister at the Victorian court, and added dryly, Will James, the coachman at the door, will he understand it? Receiving the answer, he nodded grimly and said, Then it goes. It went, and there was no war with the bull. Time has refuted the purblind purists, the chilly wet blankets, and the Lincoln stories, bright, penetrative, piquant, and pertinent, are our classics. Hand in hand with Father Abraham, the president next to Washington in greatness, walks old Abe the storyteller. End of section 1 This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Lincoln Calendar Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell Lincoln Calendar Abraham Lincoln, born February 12, 1809, Hardin County, Kentucky, Lincoln Day 1817 Settled in Perry County, Indiana, father, mother, sister, and self. 1818, October 5th. Mrs. Thomas Lincoln, Nancy Hanks, died. Buried Spencer County, Indiana. In 1901, a monument erected to her memory, the base being the former Abraham Lincoln Vault. Schooling, a few months, 1819, 20, and 28, about six months school. 1819. Thomas, Father of Abraham Lincoln marries again Mrs. Johnson, Sally Bush, of Kentucky. 1830, March. Lincoln family removed to Illinois, near Decatur. 1831, works for himself. Boat building and sailing, carpentering, hog sticking, saw milling, blacksmithing, river pilot, logger, etc., in Menard County, Indiana. 1831, election clerk in New Salem, Captain and Private re-enlisted in Black Hawk War. Store clerk and merchant, New Salem. Studies for the law. 
1832. First political speech. Henry Clay, Whig platform. Defeated through strong local vote. Deputy surveyor at three dollars a day. Sangamon County. 1834. Elected to state legislature as Whig. Resides in Springfield till 1861. Law partner with John L. Stewart till 1840. 1835. Postmaster, New Salem. Appointed by President Jackson. 1838 to 1840. Re-elected to state legislature. 1840. Partner in law with S. T. Logan. 1842. Married Miss Mary Todd of Kentucky. Of the four sons, Edward died in infancy. William Willie at twelve at Washington. Thomas Tad at Springfield, age twenty. Robert M. T., Minister to Great Britain, Presidential Candidate, Secretary of War to President Garfield. His only grandson, Abram, died in London, March 1890. 1844. Proposed for Congress. 1845. Law partner with W. H. Herndon for life. 1846. Elected to Congress, the single Whig Illinois member. Voted anti-slavery. Sought abolition in the D.C. Voted Wilmot Proviso. Declined re-election. 1848. Electioneer for General Taylor. 1849. Defeated by Shields for United States Senator. 1852. Electioneered for General Scott. 1854. Won the state over to the Republicans, but by arrangement transferred his claim to the senatorship to Trumbull. October debated with Douglas. Declined the governorship in favor of Bissell. 1856. Organized the Republican Party and became its chief. Nominated vice president, but was not chosen by its first convention. Worked for the Fremont Dayton presidential ticket. 1858. Lost in the legislature the senatorship to Douglas. 1859. Placed for the presidential candidacy. Made Eastern tour to get acquainted. 1860. May 9th. Nominated for president. Shutting out Seward, Chase, Cameron, Dayton, Wade, Bates and McLean. 1861. March 4th. Inaugurated 16th president. Succeeds Buchanan and precedes his vice, Andrew Johnson, whom General Grant succeeded. Civil War began by firing on Fort Sumter, April 12th. 1862, September 22nd, Emancipation announced. 1863, January 1st, Emancipation proclaimed, November 19th, Gettysburg Cemetery Address, December 9th, Pardon to Rebels proclaimed. 1864, Unanimous nomination as Republican presidential candidate for re-election, June 7th, re-elected November 8th. 1865, March 4th, inaugurated for the second term. April 14th, assassinated in Ford's Theater, Washington, by a mad actor, Wilkes Booth. April 19th, body lay in state at Washington. April 26th, Booth slain in resisting arrest by Sergeant Boston Corbett, near Port Royal. April 21st to May 4th, funeral train through principal cities north to Springfield, Illinois. 1871. Temporarily deposited in catacomb. 1874. In catacomb in sarcophagus. The completed monument dedicated. 1876. To frustrate repetition of body snatcher's attempt reinterred deeper. 1900. A fifth removal. The whole structure solidly rebuilt, containing the martyred president, his wife and their three children, as well as the grandson bearing Abraham's name. End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Childish Rhyme. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. In a copybook at the age of nine or ten, Abraham Lincoln, his hand and pen, he will be good, but God knows when. The small g led a public speaker to denounce the sort of men, sordid and ignorant, who write God with a small g and gold with a big one. This was a scrapbook in humble imitation of the albums in the East. 
another copybook motto, a year or so later. Good boys who to their books apply will all be great men by and by. End of section 3 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section number 004 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Little Hatchet Did It Read for LibriVox.org by Bill Elliott at Vocability.com In 1823, Abraham Lincoln went briefly to Crawford's school, a log house, pleasing the teacher by his attention to the simple course. The boy had read but a small library, principally Weems's Life of Washington, which had impressed him deeply. This is shown by the following anecdote told by Andrew Crawford, the Spencer County pedagogue. The latter saw that a buck's head, nailed on the schoolhouse, was broken in one horn, and asked the scholars who among them broke it. I did, answered young Lincoln promptly. I did not mean to do it, but I hung on it. He was very tall and reached it too easily, and it broke. Though lean, he weighed fairly. I wouldn't have done it if I had. I thought it would break. Other boys of the class would have tried to conceal what they did and not own up until obliged to do so. His immediate friends believed that the hatchet and tree incident in Washington's life traced this truthful course. End of section number 004. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Little Hatchet Again Turns Up. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. The Little Hatchet Again Turns Up. In his teens, Abraham Lincoln, while not considered a man, was able to swing an axe with full power. It was the borderer's multifarious tool and accompanied him everywhere. One time, while sauntering along Gentryville, his stepsister playfully ran at him of a sudden and leaped from behind upon him. Holding on to his shoulders, she dug her knees into his back, a rough trick called fun by these semi-savages, and brought him to the ground. Unfortunately, she caused him to release the axe in his surprise, and it cut her ankle. The boy stopped the wound and bandaged it, while she moaned. Through her cries, he reproached her and concluded, "'How could you disobey mother so?' for she had been enjoined not to follow her brother. "'What are you going to tell her about getting hurt?' "'Tell her I did it with the axe,' she replied. "'That will be the truth?' she questioned, with the prevarication of her sex inborn. "'Yes, that's the truth, but it is not all the truth. You tell the whole truth.' The mother was forgiving, and nothing more came of the casualty. End of chapter 5 This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's Wedding Song Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Lincoln's Wedding Song Abraham Lincoln's own sister Sarah married one Aaron Grigsby, a man in the settler's line of life. And Abraham, a youth under age, composed an apothalamium on the occasion. The title was Adam and Eve's Wedding Song and the principal verses are given to show what roughness pervaded the home on the frontier. The woman was not taken from Adam's feet, we see, so we must not abuse her, the meaning seems to be. The woman was not taken from Adam's head, we know, to show she must not rule him, tis evidently so. The woman, she was taken from under Adam's arm, so she must be protected from injuries and harm. End of section 6. This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Risk the Hogs and I Will Risk Myself Read for LibriVox.org by Esther At the age of seventeen, Lincoln, the strongest and longest yonker of the neighborhood, was led out by his father for six dollars a month and board to a James Taylor, ferryman of Anderson's Creek and the Ohio River. He was also expected to do the farm work and other jobs, 
as well as the chores in and about the house. This included tending to the baby, the good wives uniting to pronounce Abe the best of helps, as so handy, as Mrs. Toodles would say. He had attained his fixed height, exactly six feet three inches. This is his own record. He really did, with his unusual strength, more than any man's stint, and failing to gain full man's wages, whether it was his father or he handled it, he felt the injustice which soured him on that point. He enraged his employer's son by sitting up late to read, so that the young man struck him to silence. But the young giant refused from retaliating in kind, whether from natural magnanimity belonging to giants, or from respect for the young master, or from self-acknowledgment that he was in the wrong. He learned the craft of river boatmen in this engagement. One day, on being asked to kill a hog, he replied like the Irishman with the violin, that he had never done it, but he would try. If you will risk the hog, he said, I will risk myself. Becoming a hog slaughterer added this branch of occupation to the many of the men of all work. Taylor sublet him out in this capacity for thirty cents a day, saying, A will do any one thing about as well as another. End of section 7. This recording is in the public domain. Section 8 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The rest was vile. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. The rest was vile. The Lincoln homestead in Indiana, in 1820-23, to had at the first the primitive corn mill in the Indian fashion a burnt-out block with a pounder rigged to a well-sweep. A water-mill being set up ten miles off on Anderson's Creek that was superseded as improvement march by a horse-power one. To this Lincoln, as a lad of sixteen or seventeen, would carry the corn in a bag upon an old flea-bitten grey mare. One day, on unhitching the animal and loading it, and running his arm through the headgear loop to lead, he had no sooner struck it and cried, Get up, you de- when the beast whirled around and lashing out, kicked him in the forehead so that he fell to the ground insensible. The miller, Hoffman, ran out and carried the youth indoors, sending for his father, as he feared the victim would not revive. He did not do so until hours after having been carried home. When conscious, his faculties, as psychologically ordained, resumed operations from the instant of suspension, and he uttered the sequel to his outcry. Phil! Lincoln's own explanation is thus. Just before I struck the mare, my will through the mind had set the muscles of my tongue to utter the expression, and when her heels came in contact with my head, the whole thing stopped half-cocked, as it were, and was only fired off when mental energy or force returned. His friends interpreted the occurrence as a proof of his always finishing what he commenced. End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Section 9 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams No Heaping Coals of Fire on That Head Read for LibriVox.org by Esther No Heaping Coals of Fire on That Head The wantingly cruel experiment of testing the sensitiveness in reptiles armoured passed into a proverb out west in pioneer times. Besides carving initials and dates on the shells of land tortoises, Boys would fling the creatures against tree or rock to see if it perish with its exposed and lacerated body, or literally placed burning coals on the back. In such cases Lincoln, a boy in his teens, but a redoubtable young giant, would not only interfere vocally, but with his arms if needed. "'Don't terrapins have feelings?' he inquired. The torturer did not know the right answer, and, persisting in the treatment, had the shingle wrenched from his hand and the cinders stamped out while well, the sufferer was allowed to go away. Well, feelings are none, he won't be burned any more while I am around. He did not always have to resort to force in his corrections, as he obtained the title of peacemaker by other means, and the spell in his tongue at that age. End of section 9. This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Stumping the Stump Speaker Read for LibriVox.org 
by David Fetterman. When Lincoln became a man, and, divorced from his father's grasping tyranny, set up as a field hand, he lightened the labor in Menard County by orating to his mates, and they gladly suspended their tasks to listen to him recite what he had read and invented, or rather, adapted to their circumscribed understanding. Besides mimicry of the itinerant preachers, he imitated the electioneering advocates of all parties and local politics. One day, one such educator collected the farmers and their help around him to eulogize some looming-up candidate, when a cousin and admirer of young Lincoln cast a damper on him, crying out, with general approval, that Abe could talk him dry. Accepting the challenge, the professional spellbinder allowed his place on the stump of the cottonwood to be held by the raw Demosthenes. To his astonishment, the country lad did display much fluency, intelligence, and talent for the craft. Frankly, the stranger complimented him and wished him well in a career, which he recommended him to adopt. From this cheering, Lincoln proceeded to speak in public, his limited public, talking on all subjects till the questions were worn slick, greasy, and threadbare. End of section 10. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 11 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Making the Wool, Not Feathers, Fly. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. The export trade of the Indiana farmers was with New Orleans, the goods being carried on flatboats. The traffic called for a larger number of resolute, hardy, and honest men, as, besides the vicissitudes of fickle navigation, was the peril from thieves. Abraham Early made acquaintance with this course as he accompanied his father in such a venture down the great river. Then past apprenticeship, he built a boat for Gentry, merchant of Gentryville, and sailed it, with the storekeeper's son, Allen, as bowhand or first officer. He and his crew of one started from the Ohio River landing, and safely reached the Crescent City, safely as to cargo and bodies but not without a narrow escape. At Baton Rouge, a little ahead of the haven, the boat was tied up at a plantation, and the two were asleep, when they became objects of an attack from a river pest, a band of refugee negroes and similar lawless rogues. Luckily their approach was heard and the two awoke, having been warned that the desperadoes would not stand on trifles, the young men armed themselves with clubs and leaped ashore after driving the pirates off the deck. They pursued them, too, with such an uproar that their number was multiplied in the runaway's mind. Both returned wounded, Abraham retaining a mark over the right eye, noticeable in after life, and not to his facial improvement. They immediately unhitched the boat and stood out in the channel. I wish we had carried weapons, sighed Lincoln. Going to war without shooting irons is not what the Quakers hold it to be. If we had been armed, returned Allen, as regretfully, we would have made the feathers fly. It had not been too dark for the shade of the enemy to be perceived, so his skipper gave one of his earnest laughs and replied, huh, You mean wool, I reckon. End of section 11. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 12 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Log Rolling to Save Lives. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. Log Rolling to Save Lives. It was in the spring, after the deep snow of 1831, that three or four lumbermen, who had built a large flat boat for carrying a cargo to New Orleans, were on the Sagamon River, trying the rowboat, or scow, to accompany the vessel. The river was very high and on the run. Two of the men leaped into the boat, to get the drink for being the first in, 
and sent her out into the current. They were unable to stem it and roll back. Lincoln shouted for them to head up and try the sleeping or dead water along the shore. But they were mastered and paddled for a wrecked boat, which had a pole sticking up. But though the man who grabbed for it secured his hold, the boat was capsized and the other was flung into the tide. Lincoln, as captain, shouted out to him, Carmen, swim for that elm tree down there. You can catch it. Keep calm. Lay hold of a branch. The tree was at a convenient height, and Carmen caught on and swung himself out. But the icy water chilled him to the bone. But he was safe for the present. Seeing which, the captain called out to the other to let go his pole and let himself be carried down to the tree also. If he hung on in the open there much longer, he would become stiff and unable to swim. The man managed to reach his mate, and the two were joined at the tree. The manager of the rescue found a log, and, attaching a rope, rolled it into the stream, with the help of others who had arrived on the scene. They towed it up some distance to get a good send-off, and a young daredevil got on to it with the intention of being floated down to the tree, where all three would become passengers and be drawn home. But in his haste to do so, Jim Dorrell raised himself off the log by the branch he grasped, and, along with the other unfortunates, made three men to be saved. When the riderless log was hauled up in shore, Lincoln mounted it to make the next cast in person. Having an extra rope with him, he lassoed the tree and soon drew the log up. Cold as they were, the three men dropped down and straddled beside him. At his orders, the men on the bank held the rope taut, so that the log, allowed to swing off freely, slung around with the current to the side, and the four were disembarked. This made Abraham the hero of the Sagamon River among the boatmen. Narrated by John Rolls of New Salem, a witness. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's First Dollar Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell As in all farming communities, where the only movement of currency is when the crop comes in and the debts accumulating during the growth are settled, and the slight surplus spent, the Indiana pioneers little new extra cash. To obtain it, the men use their off hours in guiding intending settlers, assisting surveyors and prospectors, felling and hewing trees, and horse trading. Another source of income out of bounds was to send a stock of produce down the river to sell or barter for the southern plantation produce. As there was talk at home of furnishing their house, Abraham bethought him of this resource. His father consented readily to any notion that might result in gain, and his mother, though believing nearly two thousand miles of water travel onerous, allowed her yes. Besides, the young men, by excessive work on their place, had piled up a goodly stock of sellable stuff. Abram had only to make a boat. It was small, merely to hold the venture and his hand bundle of plunder for the trip and land cruise at New Orleans. Western country boys, who had seen the Crescent City, talked of the exploit as the Easterners of seeing Europe. Abe was maneuvering his boat on the Ohio River at Rockport when he heard the whistle announcing the approach of a steamboat. These craft were not enabled to make a landing anywhere, even with a run-out gangplank, but took passengers and parcels aboard by lighters. Lincoln's small boats seemed admirably placed to serve as a transport to a couple of gentlemen who came down to the shore to ship on the steamboat. The trunks were taken out of their carriages and they selected Lincoln's new boat among some others. In his homespun, the gawky youth looked what he was, not the owner of the craft and about to try a speculation on the river, but one of the scrubs. The scrubs, not from any relation with washing, quite otherwise, were those poor families on the outskirts of towns who lived in the scrub or dwarf pines. Accordingly, one of them asked, indicating the flatboat, Who owns this? The hero relates the story thus. I answered somewhat modestly, I do. Will you take us and our trunks out to the steamboat? Certainly, 
glad of the chance of earning something. I suppose that each of them would give two or three bits, practically the dime of nowadays. Lincoln carried the passengers aboard the vessel and handed up their trunks. Each of the gentlemen drew out a piece of silver and threw it on the little deck. Gentlemen, you may think it was a very little thing, and in these days it seems to me a trifle, but it was a most important incident in my life. I could scarcely believe my eyes as I picked up the two silver half-dollars. I could scarcely credit that I, a poor boy, had earned a dollar in less than a day, that by honest work I had earned a dollar. Lincoln's flatboatman wage was ten dollars a month. Related by Frank B. Carpenter, the portrait painter, as given out by President Lincoln to a party of friends in the White House Executive Chamber, Secretary Seward notably being among them. End of section 13 This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Conviction Through a Thrashing Read for LibriVox.org by Alex Sierra Conviction Through a Thrashing In 1831, Abraham Lincoln, returning from a voyage to New Orleans, paid the usual filial visit to his father, living in Coles County. A famous wrestler, one Needham, hearing of the newcomer's prowess in wrestling, more general than pugilism on the border, called to try their strength. As the professional was in practice, and as the other, from his amiable disposition and his forbidding appearance, was not so, the latter declined the honor of a hug and the forced repose of lying on the back. Nevertheless, taunted into the trial, he met the champion and defeated him in two goes. The beaten one was chagrined and vented his vexation in this defiance. Ye have thrown me twice, Lincoln, but you cannot whip me. I do not want to, and I don't want to get whipped myself, was the simple reply. Well, I stump ye to lick me, went on Needham, thinking he was gaining ground. Throwing a man is one thing, and licking him another. Look here, Needham said the badgered man at last. If you are not satisfied that I can throw you every time and want to be convinced through a thrashing, I will do that too, for your sake. The man backed out, but he was ever after one of the champion's warmest friends. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Boating on the Ground, A Little Damp Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg Boating on a Ground, A Little Damp In a letter of August 1862, the President alludes to the amphibious minor navy, which made their tracks wherever the ground was a little damp. This is hardly an exaggeration of western shallow water navigation. Lincoln, as pilot on the Sangamon River in 1831, was engaged to run a steamboat called the Talisman, after Sir Walter Scott's popular romance. It was to test the point whether the Sangamon River was navigable or not, an important local problem on which Lincoln later got into the legislature. As he had tried the river a good deal with the flatboats, he answered he would try and do the best he could. A large crowd flocked in from all sides to witness this experiment. Lincoln guided the bark well up to the new Salem Dam. Here a gap had been cut to let the vessel slip through. But at a place called Bogue's Mill, the water was rapidly lowering and they had to wheel about and get back or be shoaled and be held there until the spring freshets. The return trip was slow, as though the stream was in his favour, the high prairie wind delayed the boat. The falling water had made the broken hole in the dam impracticable. But Lincoln backed the talisman off as soon as she stranded and stuck, and, by casting an anchor so as to act as a giant grapnel, to tear away some more of the dam. The opening sufficed for the boat to coast on the stones and get over into deep water. I think, says an old boatsman, J. R. Rowe Herndon, 
that the captain gave Lincoln forty dollars to keep on to Beardstown. I'm sure I got that. End of section 15. This recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Initiator Installed. Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman. As a fruit of incessant study, Abraham Lincoln fitted himself to accept the post of a clerk at Ophit's store in New Salem in 1831. It was a responsible position, requiring strict honesty, intelligence, glib talk, attention, and courtesy to the few dames in the population of twenty households, with the back settlement to hear from. In fact, Lincoln's gifts and cultivated acquirements made him such a favorite that the list of customers from out of town was extensive. This promotion of a newcomer nettled the bad element of the region. They were located from congeniality in a suburb termed Clary's Grove. Like the tail which undertakes to wag the dog, this tag constituted itself the criterion and proposed initiating any accession to the inhabitants. To take the conceit out of the upstart who had leaped from the flatboat deck to behind the counter at the store, the acme of a bumpkin's ambition, they selected their bully. This Jack Armstrong was held so high by Bill Clary, father of the Grove Boys, that he bet with Ophut, over loud in his praise of his help, that Jack could beat Abe, and your Abe has got to be initiated anyway. Abraham refused under provocation to have anything to do with rough-and-tumble fighting, as known as scuffle and tussle and wooling and pulling in short. These agreeable features promised to include all brutalities save gouging, which was unfashionable so far to the north. But a man could not live quietly on the frontier without showing to such ruffians that his hands could shield his head. For the honor of the store, the clerk had to stand up to the opponent. The bout came off. In the first attack, Lincoln lifted the foe, though heavier, clean off his feet, but he was unable to lay him down in the orthodox manner, consisting in placing him flat on his back, with both shoulder blades denting the earth. The semi-victor amicably said, Let's quit, Jack. You see I cannot give you the fall, and you cannot give it me. The gang shouted for resumption of the sport, thinking this was a weakness of the competitor. They joined again, but Armstrong, having his doubts, resorted to foul play, kicking or legging, as the localism stands. Indignantly, Lincoln drew him up again and shook him in midair as a terrier does a rat. The rowdies, seeing their champion bested, shouted for him to make a fight of it. And probably they would have mixed in and made a fight for all in another minute. But Jack had his doubts set at rest as to the prospect of overcoming a man who could hold him out and off at arm's length, and begging to be set down, grasp his antagonist's hands in friendship, and proclaimed him the best man who had ever broke into that section. The two became friends, and the gang gradually dwindled by this recession from their ranks of their Goliath. End of section 16. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 17 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Horrors for the Third Time. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. The Horrors for the Third Time. When Abraham Lincoln was a poor young lawyer from Springfield, attending the perambulatory court down at Lewiston, Illinois, he found the place crowded by a Methodist meeting, as well as the court having an attractive case to try. He was obliged, because of exclusion from the inn, to put up at the sheriff's house. Mrs. Davidson herself could only offer him shares with Mr. Stephen A. Douglas, also a rising man, and Peter Cartwright, the noted preacher, on the floor, put on a feather bed. At that period, the wild goose flew low. It may be supposed that the student of Shakespeare might quote, 
when shall we three meet again on rising between the famous border worthies in the dawn the hospitality was so refreshing that the trio spent the next night there they sat up by the large fireside capping stories the enmity of lawyers and even of politicians is but skin deep and steve and abe clashed not at all to meet the minister's reproof lincoln rocked while story-telling in a cane-bottomed chair taken from the steamboat celebrated in spoon river annals as its first navigator lincoln was the more interested as he had been boatman and pilot on the river the sangamon in the eighteen twenties this toy boat the utility struggled into the high water of spoon river it is a tributary of the illinois now though the county is named fulton none of the inhabitants knew anything about the inventor of steam navigation and doubted that a steamboat existed near them hence the snorting puffing and clangor of the vessel as she surged against the freshet alarmed all the population in hearing when she ascended the virgin spoon one sam jenkins had been on a spree for a week and even he was roused by the tremendous sound as he rushed from his cabin by the terrific blaze from the huge smokestack and the furnace burning pitch pine he sank onto his shaking knees and yelled boys i've got em for the third time it's all up with me end of section seventeen this recording is in the public domain Section 18 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Whistle That Stopped the Boat. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. Lincoln was pitted, as a lawyer, against a brother of the toga, who was of fat and plethoric habit, and who puffed and blowed when most he wished to get on with his speech. The wag said, The gentleman reminds me of a little steamboat I knew on the Spoon River. She had been equipped with a whistle disproportionate to her capacity of steam power, and every time she blew off, it stopped the boat. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It is the deed, not the doer. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. It is the deed, not the doer. By one of those unaccountable contradictions which disturb one's calculation upon women's conduct, the fair sex took to him with extraordinary kindness, though he always remained shy in their presence. This favour on their part was fortified by his striking honesty in little points, which the close-seeing feminine eye never misses. To cap the climax, he defended the purity of social order with a rarity in those quarters sufficient to single him out. Not that the roughest westerner was not excessively gallant, but his restrictions in the lady's presence did not always curb his proneness to tall talk. Once in the way, a loafer hanging about in the store and having paid only attention to the dram counter, the necessary concomitant of the village centre, became garrulous, but unfortunately more than seasoned the flow with a profanity tolerably rich in variety, if not distinguished for refinement. He was of the Carly's Grove genus, as there was a crowd in the ladies' department, that is, the dry goods and finery, where it happened Lincoln was commonly besieged. The language was resented by women's weapons, tosses of the head, affected deafness, glances into the future, and so on but the clerk resented it in another way. He bade him be silent. Now the fellow thought with his kind that he was entitled to exhale the breath which was strengthened by the strong waters vended here, and expressed himself more foully than before. He had a resentment against the clod rising to be a flower of courtesy, and here was his opportunity to satisfy the grudge, and before an audience timid and not apt to intervene. Singularly, the men who most despise women are the ones who seek to have her applause. He wished to see the man who would stop him from uttering his sentiments. He was answered that his business would be attended to as soon as the offended ladies had withdrawn. The undesired witness took the hint and quitted the store. 
Thereupon, the long-limbed clerk verified the taunt of counter-jumper by clearing it at a bound. Will you engage not to repeat that rowdy blackguard talk in the store while I am the master, and leave instanter? The bully protested in a torrent of unrepeatable words. I see, said the champion of decency. You want a whipping, and I may as well give it to you as any other man. And he forthwith administered the correction. Not only did he drag him outdoors, but laid him out so senseless that nothing less than the border finish of a knock-down and drag-out encounter, the rubbing the conquered man's eyes with smart weed, revived him to beg for mercy and a drink. The victor allowed him to rise, converted his appeal into mockery by offering plain water, which the brute applied solely to his doubly inflamed eyes, and sent him away in tears. But the shock had a reparative effect. He became a good neighbour and a convert to temperance. This or a similar lesson to the village bully is testified to by an eyewitness of Sangamon, the resident of Viroqua, Wisconsin. His name is John White. He worked at chopping rails with the rail splitter on more than one job. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Turn out or be turned out. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. Turn out or be turned out. Superintendent Tinker of the W.U.T. says he heard Secretary Seward say to President Lincoln, Mr. President, I hear you turned out for a colored woman on a muddy crossing the other day. Did you? replied the other laughingly. Well, I don't remember it, but I always make it a rule. If people do not turn out for me, I will for them. If I didn't, there would be a collision. End of section 20. This recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Best Thing to Take. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. The Best Thing to Take. When Lincoln worked in and kept a grocery store, it was flanked by a groggery, and he had to supply spirits. But from that fact he saw the evils of the saloon, and early identified himself with the novel temperance movement. In 1843 he joined the Sons of Temperance. While he said he was temperate on theory, it was not so. He was practically abstinent. Not only did he lecture publicly, but at one such occasion he gave out the pledges. In decorating a boy, Cleophus Breckenridge, with a badge, after he took the pledge, he said, Sonny, that is the best thing you will ever take. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Drinking and Swallowing Are Two Things Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg Drinking and Swallowing Are Two Things It has been stated that Lincoln, after reigning at the village store, had become the idol of the settlement. A stranger to whom he was shown was not properly impressed. One of the clerk's friends, William Green, bragged that his favourite was the strongest man in the township. This was not affecting the critic, and even went on, the strongest in the country. Hmm, not the strongest in the state, denied the stranger. I know a man who can lift a barrel of flour as easily as I can a peck of potatoes. Abe there could lift two barrels of flour if he could get a hold on them. You can beat me telling razors, but taking a lift out of you or not, I am willing to bet that Abe will lift a barrel of spirits and drink out of the bunghole to prove he can hold it there. Impossible. What will you lay on the thing? They made a wager of a new hat, the Sunday hat of beaver being still costly. Green was betting unfairly on a sure thing, as he had seen his friend do what he asserted, all but the drinking flourish. Lincoln was averse to the wagering at all, but to help his friend to the hat, he consented to the feat. 
he passed through it, lifting the cask between his two hands and holding the spigot hole to his lips while he imbibed a mouthful. As he was slowly lowering the barrel to the floor, the winner exclaimed jubilantly, I knew you would do it, but I never knew you to drink whiskey before. The barrel was stood on the floor when the drinker calmly expelled the mouthful of its contents and drolly remarked, And I have not drunk that, you see. As a return for his action to win the hat, he asked Green not to wager any more, a resolve which he took to oblige him. End of section 22. This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Worsted in a Horse Trade. Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra. Until Lincoln, seeing that his decisions created enemies, whichever way they fell, renounced being umpire for horse racing and the like events, momentous on the border, he officiated in many such pastimes. Before he found them all wrong, he had a horsey acquaintance in a judge. This was at a time when he was practicing law, which involved riding on circuit, as the court went round to give sittings, like the ancient English justices, attending assizes. During such excursions, they played practical jokes, naturally. Among their singular contests was a bet of twenty-five dollars, as forfeit if, in horse-swapping, the loser rejected the horse offered on even terms with the one he put in. Neither was to know anything of the equine paragon until simultaneously exhibited. As good sport was indicated where two such errant jokers were in conflict, a vast throng filled the tavern-yard where the pair were to draw conclusions. At the appointed hour the court functionary dragged upon the scene a most dilapidated simulacrum of man's noblest conquest, blind, spavined, lean as Pharaoh's kind, creaking in every joint, at the same time as his fellow wagerer carried on under his long arm a carpenter's horse, gashed with adze and broad axe, bored with the aguar, trenched with saw and draw knife, singed paint and tar-spotted, crazy in each leg of the three still adhering, in short, justifying Lincoln to reverse his cry at viewing the real animal. Judge, for judge, this is the first time I ever got the worst of it in a hoss trade. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams How Many Short Breaths Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg How Many Short Breaths In the nearest town to the Lincolns lived a man called Captain Larkins. He was short and fat, and consequently puffing. He was logically fond of blowing, for example, if he bought any object, he would proclaim that it was the best article of its sort in the settlement. His favourite orating ground, in fact, the only theatre for displays, was the front of the village store, where, among the farmers who came into the dicker and purchase stores, he would dilate. Lincoln did not like the pompous little fellow, whose rotund and diminutive figure was in glaring contrast to his own, a young man, but colossal, while his stature was augmented by his meagerness. Gentlemen, bawled Larkins, I have the best horse in the county. I ran him three miles in two forty each, and he never fetched a long breath. Hmm, interrupted Lincoln, looking down at the man panting with excitement. Why don't you tell us how many short breaths you drew? End of section 24. This recording is in the public domain. Section 25 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Height. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. One of the committee appointed to acquaint Mr. Lincoln formally with the decision of the Chicago Presidential Convention of 1860 was Judge Kelly, 
a man of unusual stature. At the meeting with the nominee he eyed the latter with admiration, and the jealousy the exceptional cherish for rivals. This had not escaped the curious Lincoln. He asked him, as he singled him out, "'What is your height?' Six feet three. What is yours?' Six feet four. Footnote. This will probably never be exactly settled now. Speaker Reed agreed with this statement, but Miss Emma Gurley Adams, in a position to know, published in the New York Press, Mr. Lincoln told my father that he was exactly six feet three inches. This was at the end of his life. The contrariety of the assertions simply baffles one. "'Then, sir, Pennsylvania bows to Illinois,' responded the judge. "'My dear sir, for years my heart has been aching for a president I could look up to, and I have found him at last in the land where we thought there were none but little giants.' Stephen Douglas, leader of the Democratic Party, was a pocket Daniel Webster, and bearing the by-name of the Little Giant. End of section 25. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 26 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Measures and Men. Read for LibriVox.org by Joseph Finkberg. Measures and Men The earlier audiences at the White House were inspired by ludicrous ideas, far between patriotism and interest in the tall hosier. The habitual attendants and guests soon discovered that the chief was an unrivalled host, adapting modes of reception to the differing kinds of callers. He noticed once two young men who hung about the door so that, sympathizing with the shy, for he had been woefully troubled by that feeling in his youth, he went over to the pair, and to make them feel at home, asked them to be seated while they looked on. But they didn't care for chairs. The shorter of the two stammered that he and his friend had a talk about the President's unusual height, and would the host kindly settle the matter and see whether he were as tall as his excellency. Lincoln, who had been scanning the competitor and smiling, returned, He is long enough, certainly. Let us see about that. He went for his cane. Footnote. Lincoln's cane. This was the cane he carried instead of going armed, but he was forever leaving it anywhere about, so that nine times out of ten he went forth without it on his errand, browsing around and it was a wonder that this time he knew where to find it. And placing the feral end to the wall to act as a level, he bade the young man draw near and stand under. When the rod was carefully adjusted to the top of the head, Mr. Lincoln continued, Now step out and hold the cane while I go under. This comparison showed that the young man stood six feet three exactly, Lincoln's precise figure too. "'Just my height,' remarked the affable president to the herald of the match. He guessed with admirable accuracy. Giving both a shake of the hand, he gave them the good-bye warmly. He had seen that they were innocents, and shrank from letting them know that they had unconsciously offended his dignity. End of section 26. This recording is in the public domain. Section 27 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Prize for Homeliness Read for LibriVox.org by Jeremiah Britt The Prize for Homeliness In keeping with his proneness to jest at his own expense rather than lose a laugh, Lincoln is credited with telling the following story upon himself. In the days when I used to be on the circuit, law. I was accosted on the road by a stranger. He said, Excuse me, sir, but I have an article in my possession which belongs to you. How is that? I asked, considerably astonished. 
the stranger took a barlow from his pocket. This knife, said he, was placed in my hands some years ago with the injunction of the community, through its bearer, that I was to keep it until I struck a man homelier than I. I have carried it from that time till this. Allow me to say, sir, that you are fairly entitled to the testimonial. End of section 27 This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams how long legs should be read for LibriVox.org by joseph finkberg how long legs should be a quipster harping on mr lincoln's abnormal tallness had the mishap to draw upon himself some quizzing the president putting the nonplus on him by asking how long then ought a man's legs to be the answer was given by the sphinx long enough to reach from his body to the ground. End of section 28. This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Longmeter. Read for LibriVox.org. John Sherman will be remembered as originator of the politician's cover for electioneering activity. I am going home to mend my fences. He was fresh from Ohio, but he included in his round of duties, on visiting the Capitol, an attendance of a Lincoln reception. He waited in the long file for his turn to shake hands, and while doing so, wondered how he would be received. For the informal function was enlivened by the most untoward incidents, due to the host's simplicity, spontaneous acts and words, and the home-like nature of the scene. Truly enough, when his chance came, the meeting was eccentric. Lincoln scanned him a moment, threw out his large hand, and said, "'You're a pretty tall fellow, aren't you? Stand up here to me back to back, and let's see which of us two is the taller.' In another moment I was standing back to back with the greatest man of his age. Naturally I was quite abashed by this unexpected evidence of democracy. "'You are from the West, aren't you?' inquired Lincoln. "'My home is in Ohio,' I replied. "'I thought so,' he said. "'That's the kind of men they raise out there.' End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hardships strengthen muscles. As in the old country, kings evade the tiresome features of receptions, after a time, by retiring and leaving the ceremony to be carried out by a deputy, so the daintier presidents before the sixteenth one eluded the handshaking when possible. But, on the contrary, the man out of the West continued to the last, and the latest visitor had no reason to cavil at the grip being less hearty to him than the first comer. On visiting the Army Hospital at City Point, where upward of three thousand patients awaited his passing with enrapt respect, he insisted on no one being neglected. A surgeon inquired if he did not feel lamed in the arm by the undue exertion, whereupon he replied smilingly, not at all. The hardships of my early life gave me strong muscles. And as there happened to be in the yard by the doorway a chopping block with the axe left stuck on the top as usual, he took it out, swung, and poised it to get the unfamiliar heft, and chopped up a stick lying handy. When he paused, from no more left to do, he held out the implement straight, forming one line with his extended arm, and not a nerve quivered any more than the helve or the blade. The workers, who knew what hard work was, gazed with wonder at what they could not have done for a moment. One of them gathered up the chips and disposed of them for relics to the sightseers who welcomed such tokens of the great ruler. An American visiting Mr. Gladstone's country seat, Hawarden, and seeing the premier chopping a tree for health's sake, observed humorously, having also seen Mr. Lincoln employed as above, your grand old man is going in at the same hole ours went out. End of section 30. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of the Lincoln Storybook. 
by Henry L. Williams. He used to be good on the chop. Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots. In the beginning of 1865, the President was wont to pay visits to the James River, not merely to inspect the camps and the field hospitals, but to have a peep at the promised land, that is, Richmond, still held by the rapidly melting and discouraged Southerners as the last ditch. In one of his strolls, he came upon a gang of lumbermen, cutting up logs and putting up stockades and cabins for the wet weather. Joining one group, he chatted freely with the woodman and as one of themselves. Presently, he asked for the loan of an axe. The man, hesitating, since his blade had just been fine-edged, he explained that he was one of the jacks and used to be good on the chop and seizing the arm with familiarity he attacked a big log and using it as a broad axe shaped the rough hewn sides till it was a perfect slab he handed back the tool and stalked off amid cheers end of recording end of section 31 this recording is in the public domain Section 32 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Man Who Can Scratch His Shins Without Stooping Read for LibriVox.org One of the want-to-knows had the impertinence to inquire of Mr. Lincoln his opinion of General Sheridan, not yet known, who had come out of the West early in 1864, to take command of the cavalry under General Grant as Lieutenant General. "'Have you not seen Sheridan?' The answer was in the negative. "'Then I will tell you just what kind of a chap he is.' one of those long-armed fellows with short legs that can scratch their shins without having to stoop over to do it end of section 32 this recording is in the public domain section 33 of the lincoln storybook by henry l williams struck by the dead hand read for librivox.org by Ernst Schnell. struck by the dead hand Edwin Booth, the tragedian, brother of the regicide Wilkes, was at a friend's house. By the purest chance, dulling over the knick-knacks, he picked up a plaster cast of a hand. It was something more than a paperweight, he was intuitively prompted, for he said, handling it as reverently as Yorick's relict. By the way, whose is this? Before the cue could be given to hush or utter a subterfuge, someone blurted out, Abraham Lincoln's, don't you know? The murder was out, and the distinguished guest who suffered a long term for a crime wholly out of his ken was silent for the evening. W. D. Howells End of section 33 This recording is in the public domain. Section 34 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. This clinches it. Read for LibriVox.org. A party accompanying the President to the ground to see experiments with new ordnance in the Navy Yard in 1862 were diverted by his taking a ship's carpenter's axe from its nick in a spar and holding it out by the end of the handle, a feat that none of the group could imitate. He said that he had had enough of the Dahl Greens, Columbiads, and Raphael repeaters and that this was an American institution, which, I guess, I understand better than all other weapons. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Section 35 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's First Love Story Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman In 1833, when Abraham was just over twenty, he fell in love with Anne, or Annie Rutledge, at New Salem. Her father kept the tavern where Lincoln boarded, but the girl was engaged to a dry-goods merchant named McNeil. This man, pretending to be of a high old Irish family, likely to discountenance union to a publican's daughter, shilly-shallied, but finally went east to get his folks' consent. He acknowledged that he was parading under borrowed plumes, as he was a McNamara in reality. He stayed away so long that the maid, forlorn, gave him up, and listened to other suitors. Lincoln proposed, 
but waited till the apparent jilt was heard from. Then they were espoused. But a block to the match came in Lincoln having no position. Awaiting his efforts as a law student, the wedding was postponed. But meanwhile, death came quick where fortune lagged. She died and left her lover broken-hearted. He seems then to have been smitten with the brown study afflicting him all his life, and by some, like Secretary Boutwell, affirmed to be independent of the surrounding grounds for depression and grief. Fears of suicide led his friends to watch him closely, and he was known to go and lie on the grave of the maid, whose name he said would dwell ever with him, while his heart was buried with her. The rival McNamara returned too late to redeem his vow, but lived in the same state many years, a prosperous gentleman. End of section 35 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 36 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Put-Up Job or Chance Read for LibriVox.org The ways of the petitioner are deep and mysterious. The Virginian, Illinois, Inquirer, March 1, 1879, had the following. John McNamer, Namara, was buried last Saturday near Petersburg, Menard County. He was an early settler and carried on business at New Salem. Abe Lincoln was the postmaster there and kept a store. It was here that, at the tavern, dwelt the fair Annie Rutledge, in whose grave Lincoln wrote that his heart was buried. As the story runs, the fair and gentle Annie was John's sweetheart, but Abe took a shine to her, and succeeded in heading off Mac, and won her affections. During the war, a Kentucky lady went to Washington with her daughter to procure her son's pardon for being a gorilla. The daughter was a musician. Sitting at the piano while her mother was sewing, she sang, Gentle Annie. While it was being charmingly rendered, Abe rose from his seat, crossed the room to a window, and gazed out for several minutes with that sad, far-away look noticed as one of his particularities. When he returned to his seat he wrote a note which, as he said, was the pardon besought. The scene proves that Mr. Lincoln was a man of fine feelings, and that if the occurrence was a put-up job on the lady's part, it accomplished the purpose all the same. End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Marriage. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. Footnote. Addressing Kentuckians in a speech made at Cincinnati in 1859, Lincoln said, we mean to marry our girls when we have a chance, and I have the honor to say I once did have a chance in that way. End of footnote. In 1839, another Kentucky belle arrived in Illinois to follow the steps of her sister, who had found a conquest there. This Mrs. Edwards introduced Miss Mary Todd, and she became the belle of the Sangamon Bottom. Lincoln was pitted against another young lawyer, afterward the eminent Stephen A. Douglas. But, odd as it appears, Miss Todd singled out the ugly duckling as the more eligible of the two. Whatever the reason, strange in a man knowing how to bide his time to win, Lincoln wrote to the lady, withdrawing from the contest, allowed to be hopeless by him. His friend Speed would not bear the letter, but pressed him to have a face-to-face -face explanation. The rogue, who was in the toils himself and was shortly wedded, believed the parley would remove the, perhaps, imaginary hindrance. But Miss Todd accepted the deliverance. Thereupon they parted. But immediately the reconciliation took place. The nuptials were settled, but here again Lincoln displayed a waywardness, utterly out of keeping with his subsequent actions. He bolted on the wedding day, New Year's, 1841. Searching for him, his friends, remembering the fit after the Rutledge death, found him in the woods like the passionate pilgrim of ancient romance. Luckily he was inspirited by them with a feeling that an irrepressible desire to live till assured that the world is a little better for my having lived in it. Seeing what ensued, one could say then, good speed, to 
his bosom friend of that name. But his friend married in the next year, and in his cold loneliness so doubled, Lincoln harked back to the flame. She ought never to have forgiven him for the slight, but it was not possible for her to repay him with poetic justice by rejoicing Stephen A. Douglas, as that gentleman had looked elsewhere for matrimonial recompense. Lincoln and Miss Todd, in 1842, renewed the old plight, and never again were divided. End of section 37. This recording is in the public domain. Section 38 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Burlesque Duel. Read for LibriVox.org. Lincoln was plunged willy-nilly into the society he shunned at home, on entering the legislature at Springfield. A newspaper there published the account, from her side, of a young lady's difference with a noted politician, General James Shields. He married a sister of Lincoln's wife, and there was a feud between them. Shields flew to the editor to demand the name of the maligner, as he called the correspondent, or the editor must meet him with a dueling weapon, or his horsewhip. In the western states the whip was snapped at literary men as the cane was flourished in England at the date, 1842. The editor consulted with Lincoln as a lawyer and a friend. With his enmity as to Shields, the friend promptly advised him to say, I did it. This was, in fact, sheer justice, for it was Lincoln's wife who uttered the articles. And, by the way, their style and rustic humor were much in the vein of the Widow Badeau and the Samantha papers of later times. Mrs. Lincoln was not the mere housekeeper the scribes accuse her of being. Lincoln knew what was her value when he read his speeches first to her for an opinion, as Moliere courted his stewardess for opinions. Sumner heeded her counsel. Abraham championed the mysterious Aunt Becca, who had characterized Shields as a ballroom dandy floating around without heft or substance, just like a lot of cat fur where cats have been fighting. Is this not quite Lincolnian? Thus put forward, Lincoln received a challenge. Trial by battle, personal, still ruled. The politicians coupled with the necessity of going out with weapons to maintain an assertion in speech or publication were Jefferson Davis, Jackson, the President, Henry Clay, the Amiable, Sam Houston, Sergeant S. Prentice, etc., Shields naturally challenged the ladies' champion. As the challenged party, Lincoln, who had cooled in the interim, not only chose broadswords, not at all the gentleman's arm in an affair of honour, but, what is more, descanted on the qualities of the cutlass in such a droll manner, and words, that the second went off laughing. He imparted his unseemly mirth to his opponent's seconds, and all the parties concerned took the cue to soften down the irritation between the two persons formerly chums, and relatives so close. The meeting took place by the riverside out of Alton, where the leaking out of the gallantry of Lincoln in taking up the cudgels for the lady led to an explanation, although no such enlightenment ought to be permitted on the ground. Besides, all was ludicrous, the broadswords intolerably broad. The principals shook hands, but the plotters were not content with this peaceful ending. They had determined that the outside spectators on the town side of the river should be in at the sham death. They rigged up a log in a coat and sheet, like a man wounded, and reclining in the bottom of a boat, and pretended it was one of the duelists, badly stricken, whom they were escorting to town for surgical assistance. The explosion of laughter receiving the two principals when the hoax was revealed caused the incident to be a sore point to both Lincoln and Shields. End of section 38. This recording is in the public domain. Section 39 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Wanting to Dance the Worst Way Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder A Miss Mary Todd had come to visit a sister married in the neighborhood of Springfield. Lincoln was there as a member of the legislature sitting. He had eschewed society, though he liked it, in favor of study, but now rewarded himself for achieving this fruit of application by joining the movements around him. He made the acquaintance of Miss Todd, vivacious, sprightly, keenly insighted, so as to divine he would prove superior in fate to Stephen Douglas, also courting her. Although unsuited by nature and his means to shine in the ballroom, Lincoln followed his flame thither. Using the vernacular, he asked for her hand, saying earnestly, 
Miss Todd. I should like to dance with you the worst way. After he had led his partner to her seat, a friend asked how the clumsy partner had carried himself. He kept his word. He did dance the worst way. End of section 39. This recording is in the public domain. Section 40 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The statute fixes all that. Even Lincoln's marriage was to be accompanied by a diversion of that merry imp of incongruity always with him, as Shakespeare's most stately heroes are attended by a comic servant. He married Miss Mary Dodd of Kentucky at Springfield at the age of thirty-three. It was the first wedding performed with all the ceremonial of the Episcopalian sect. This was to the awe of the Honorable Judge Tom C. Brown, an old man and friend and patron of our Abraham. He watched the ecclesiastical functionary to the point of Lincoln's placing the ring on the bride's finger, when the irate old stager exclaimed at the formula, With this ring I thee endow all my goods, etc. Grace to Goshen! Lincoln, the statute fixes all that! End of section 40. This recording is in the public domain. Section 41 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. He did not know his own house. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1842, Abraham Lincoln married Miss Mary Todd, a Kentucky lady, at Springfield, where he took a house for the wedded life. Previously, while qualifying for the bar, he had dwelt for study over a furniture store. On account of his attending the traveling court, which compelled a horse, since he could not afford the gig associated with the chief lawyer's degree of respectability, he was frequently and for long periods away from home. In one of these absences his wife deemed it fit for his coming dignity of pletter to have a second story and a roof of a fashionable type set upon the old foundations. Under a fresh coat of paint, too, this renovation perplexed the homecomer when he drew up on his horse before it. At the sound of the horse's steps he knew that someone was flying to the parlour window, but affecting amazement he challenged a passer-by, "'Neighbour, I feel like a stranger here.' Can you tell me where Abraham Lincoln lives? He used to live here. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Only One Who Dared Pull Wool Over Lincoln's Eyes Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook the only one who dared pull wool over Lincoln's eyes. While Mr. Lincoln was living in Springfield, a judge of the city, who was one of the leading and most influential citizens of the place, had occasion to call upon him. Mr. Lincoln was not over particular in his matter of dress, and was also careless in his manners. The judge was ushered into the parlour, where he found Mr. Lincoln sprawled out across a couple of chairs, reclining at his ease. The judge was asked to be seated, and, without changing his position in the least, Mr. Lincoln entered into conversation with his visitor. While the two men were talking, Mrs. Lincoln entered the room. She was, of course, greatly embarrassed at Mr. Lincoln's off-hand manner of entertaining his caller, and stepping up behind her husband, she grasped him by the hair and twitched his head about, at the same time looking at him reprovingly. Mr. Lincoln apparently did not notice the rebuke. He simply looked up at his wife, then across at the judge, and without rising said, Little Mary, allow me to introduce you to my friend, Judge so-and-so. It will be remembered that Mrs. Lincoln's maiden name was Mary Todd, and that she was very short in stature. Leslie's Monthly. End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Long and Short of It, read for LibriVox.org by Megan Conkle The Long and Short of It The contrast between the statues of the Lincolns, man and wife, was palpable, but this hardly substantiates the story of the President appearing with his wife on the White House porch in response to a serenade, and his saying, Here I am, and here is Mrs. Lincoln. That's the long and short of it. End of section 43 this recording is in the public domain.
Section 44 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. All a Man Wants, $20,000. Read for LibriVox.org. In one of his messages to Congress, the President foretold and denounced the tendency of wealth acquired in masses, and rapidly by the war contractors and the like, as approaching despotism. He saw liberty attacked in the effort to place capital on an equal footing with, if not above, labor in the structure of government. It is never to be forgotten that neither he nor his cabinet officers were ever upbraided for corruption. Some, like Secretary Stanton, though handling enormous sums, died poor men comparatively. Footnote. It is true that Lincoln's first war minister, Simon Cameron, was accused of smoothing the way to certain fat war contracts, a wit suggesting simony as the term, but no charges were really brought. Lincoln said that if one proof were forthcoming he would have the Cameronian head, but Mr. Cameron died intact. End note. It is in accordance with this honesty of the honest old Abe rule that he said to an old friend whom he met in New York in 1859, "'How have you fared since you left us?' The merchant gleefully replied that he had made a hundred thousand dollars in business, and lost it all, with the reflection of Lincoln's and the Western cool humor. "'How is it on your part?' "'Oh, very well. I have the cottage at Springfield, and about eight hundred dollars.' If they make me vice-president with Seward, as some will say they will, I hope I shall be able to increase it to twenty thousand. That is as much as any man ought to want. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. I'll Hit the Thing Hard. Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra. In Coffin's Lincoln, it is stated that when Lincoln and Offutt, boating to New Orleans, attended a slave auction for the first time, the former said to his companion, By the Eternal, if I ever get a chance to hit this thing, I'll hit it hard. The oath was General President Jackson's, and familiar as a household word at the day. The promise is premature in a youth of twenty. Herndon, twenty-five years associated with Lincoln, doubts, but says that Lincoln did allude to some such utterance. But it is Dennis Hanks, cousin of Lincoln, who affirms that they too saw such a sight, and that he knew by his companion's emotion that the iron had entered into his soul. In 1841, Lincoln and Speed had a tedious low-water trip from Louisville to St. Louis. Lincoln says, There were on board ten or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continual torment to me, a thing which has, and continually exercises, the power of making me miserable. But his acts show that he hit the thing hard. It could not recover from the telling stroke which rent the black oak, the Emancipation Act. End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Lex Talians Christianized. Read for LibriVox.org. Frederick Douglass, the colored men's representative, called on the President to procure a pledge that the unfair treatment of Negro soldiers in the Union uniform should cease by retaliatory measures on the captured Confederates. But his hearers shrank from the bare thought of hanging men in cold blood, even though the rebels should slay the Negroes taken. Oh, Douglas, I cannot do that. If I could get hold of the actual murderers of colored prisoners, I would retaliate. But to hang those who have had no hand in the atrocities, I cannot do that. By F. Douglas in Northwestern Advocate. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Slave Dealer. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. You have among you the class of native tyrants known as the slave dealer. He watches your necessities and crawls up to buy your slave at a speculating price. If you cannot help it, you sell to him. But if you can help it, you drive him from your door. You despise him utterly. You do not recognize him for a friend or even as an honest man. Your children must not play with his. They may rollick freely with the little negroes, but not with the slave-dealer's children. 
If you are obliged to deal with him, you try to go through the job without so much as touching him. It is common with you to join hands with the men you meet, but with a slave dealer you avoid the ceremony, instinctively shrinking from the snaky contact. If he grows rich and retires from business, you still remember him and still keep up the ban of not intercourse with him and his family. Those who deny the poor negro's natural right to himself and make mere merchandise of him deserve kickings, contempt, and death. Speech. Reply to Douglas, Peoria, Illinois, October 16, 1854. End of section 47. This recording is in the public domain. Section 48 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Negro Home or Agitation Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman Lincoln was admitted to the law practice in 1837. He went into partnership with John F. Stewart. The latter elected to Congress, he united his legal talents with S.T. Logan's, a union severed in 1843, as both the associates were aiming to be congressmen also. Not being nominated, the consolation was in the courts, with Judge Herndon as partner. It was from this daily frequentation that the latter was enabled to write A Life of Lincoln. An old colored woman came to them for legal aid. Her case was a sad one. Brought from Kentucky, Lincoln's natal state, by a planter Hinkel, he had set her and her children free in Indiana, not fostering the waning oppression. Her son, growing up, had the rashness to venture on the steamboat down to New Orleans. His position was as bad as that of an Americanized foreigner returning into the despotic land. He was arrested and held for sale, having crossed a Louisiana law framed for such intrusions. A free Negro could be sold here, as if never out of bond. There was little time to redeem him, and Lincoln, whose view of the institution had not been enchanting, seized the opportunity to hit, and hit hard, as he said in the same city, on beholding a slave sale. The office was in Springfield, the capital, and the state house was over the way, while Lincoln continued to question and console the poor sufferer. His partner went over to learn of the governor what he could do in the matter but there was no constitutional or even legal right to interfere with the doings of a sovereign state. This omission as regards humanity stung Lincoln, always tender on that score, and he excitedly vowed, By virtue of freedom for all, I will have that Negro back, or a twenty years' agitation in Illinois, which will afford its governor a legal and constitutional right to interfere in such premises. The only way to rescue the unfortunate young man was to make up a purse and recompense a correspondent at the city below, to obtain the captive and return him to his mother. Such cases, of more often fugitive slave matters, were not uncommon in the state. Lincoln was already linked with the ultras on the question, so that it was said by lawyers applied to, afraid as political aspirants, Go to that Lincoln, the liberator he will defend a fugitive slave case. End of section 48. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 49 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Vow. Read for LibriVox.org by Harold Stewart. On the 17th of September, 1862, the Confederate inroad into Maryland was stopped by the decisive defeat of Antietam, and the raiders were sent to the retreat. Lincoln called the cabinet to a special meeting, and stated that the time had come at last for the proclamation of freedom to the slaves everywhere in the United States. Public sentiment would now sustain, after great vacillation, and all his friends were bent upon it. Besides, I promised my God I would do it. Yea, I made a solemn vow before God that, 
if General Lee was driven back from Pennsylvania, I would crown the result by the declaration of freedom to the slave. It was remarked that the signature appeared tremulous and uneven, but the writer affirmed that that was not because of any uncertainty or hesitation on my part. It was done after the public reception, and three hours' handshaking is not calculated to improve a man's chirography. He said to the painter of the Signing the Emancipation Act, Mr. Carpenter, I believe that I am about as glad over the success of this work as you are. The original was destroyed in the great fire at Chicago, where it was under exhibition. The pan and the table concerned should be in the Lincoln Museum. The inkstand was a wooden one, in private hands, and bought at public sale when Lincoln relics were not at the current high price. End of section 49 this recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Did I Takes to the Woods Read for LibriVox.org by Andra Hoots Secretary Seward, as manager of the foreign relations, met much trouble from the disposition of the aristocratic realms of Europe to await eagerly for a breach by which to enter into interference without quarreling. He was also a great troublemaker, having the innate repugnance of men of letters and voice to play second fiddle, since he was nominated to the trial ballot above Lincoln in the presidential convention. The black speck in the political horizon was San Domingo. The abolitionists wanted to help her to attain liberty, in which case Mother Spain would assuredly come out openly against the United States and consequently ally with the Confederacy. The statement of the dilemma, side with Spain or the Black Republic, reminded the President of a Negro story quite akin. A colored parson was addressing his hearers and drew a dreadful picture of the sinner in distress. He had two courses before him, however. But the exhorter asserted in a gush of novelty that this narrow way leads on to destruction and that broad into damnation. Feeling he was overshooting the mark by the dismay among his congregation, he paused when an impulsive brother started up with bristling wool and staring eyes and making for the door hallooed, In that case, this child he takes to the woods. Mr. President elucidated the black prospect. I am not willing to assume any new responsibilities at this juncture. I shall, therefore, avoid going to the one place with Spain, or with the Negro to the other, but shall take to the woods. A strict and honest neutrality was therefore observed, and San Domingo is still a bone of contention, though not with Spain, for it is an eye on our canal. End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Unpardonable Crime Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman The mass of examples of Lincoln's leniency, mercifulness, and lack of rigor lead one to believe that he could not be inexorable. But there was one crime to which he was unforgiving the truckling to slavery. The smuggling of slaves into the South was carried on much later than a guileless public imagine. Only fifty years ago, a slave trader languished in a Massachusetts prison, in Newburyport, serving out a five-year sentence, and still confined from inability to procure the thousand dollars to pay a superimposed fine. Mr. Alley, congressman of Lynn, felt compassion and busied himself to try to procure the wretch's release. For that, he laid the unfortunate's petition before President Lincoln. It acknowledged the guilt and the justice of his condemnation. He was penitent and deplored his state. All had fallen away from him after his conviction. The chief arbiter was touched by the piteous and emphatic appeal. Nevertheless, he felt constrained to say to the intermediary, my friend, 
This is a very touching appeal to my feelings. You know that my weakness is to be, if possible, too easily moved by appeals to mercy. And if this man were guilty of the foulest murder that the arm of man could perpetrate, I might forgive him on such an appeal. But the man who could go to Africa and rob her of her children and sell them into interminable bondage with no other motive than that which is furnished by dollars and cents is so much worse than the most depraved murderer that he can never receive pardon at my hands. No, he may rot in jail before he shall have liberty by any act of mine. End of section 51. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 52 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Beyond the Boon. Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. The other slave trade case is more tragic than the above. It roused much excitement, as the conviction for slave trading was the first under the special law in any part of the land. The object of the unique process was William Gordon. Sentenced to be hanged like a pirate, the most prodigious effort was made to have the penalty relaxed with a prospect that the term of imprisonment would be curtailed as soon as decent. It would seem that merchant princes were connected with the lucrative, if nefarious, traffic in which he was a captain. But the offense was so flagrant that the New York District Attorney went to Washington to block mistaken clemency. He was all but too late, for the President had literally under his hand the Gordon reprieve. The powerful influence reached even into the executive study. Lawyer Delafield Smith stood firmly upon the need of making an example, and Mr. Lincoln gave way, but in despair at having to lay aside the pen and redoom the miserable tool to the gallows, where he was executed at New York. Mr. Smith, sighed the President, you do not know how hard it is to have a human being die when you know a stroke of your pen may save him. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 53 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Vain is the Pope's Bull against the Comet. Read for LibriVox.org. The potency of the Emancipation Act was so patent to the least politician that, long before 1863, when its announcement opened the memorable year for freedom, not only had its demonstration had been implored by his friends, but some of his subordinates had tried to launch its lightning with not so impersonal a sentiment. To a religious body, pressing him to verify his title of abolitionist, he replied, I do not want to issue a document that the whole world will see must necessarily be inoperative, like the Pope's bull against the comet. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Section 54 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A volunteer captaincy worth two dollars. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell. A Volunteer Captaincy Worth Two Dollars While he was a lumberer, Lincoln was in the employ of one Kirkpatrick, who ran a sawmill. In hiring the new man, the employer had promised to buy him a dog or cant hook of sufficient size to suit a man of uncommon stature. But he failed in his pledge and would not give him the two dollars of its value for his working without the necessary tool. Though far from a grudging disposition, Lincoln cherished this in memory. When the Black Hawk War broke out and the governor called out volunteers, Sangamon County straightway responded and raised a company of rangers. This Kirkpatrick wished and strove to be elected captain, but Lincoln recited his grievance to the men and said to his friend William Green, or Green, Bill, 
I believe I can now make even with Kirkpatrick for the two dollars he owes me for the canthook. Setting himself up for candidate, he won the post. It was a triumph of popularity which rejoiced him. As late as 1860, he said he had not met since that success any to give him so much satisfaction. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Getting the Company Column Through Endwise. Read for LibriVox.org. Captain Lincoln was drilling his men, marching the twenty or so by the front, when he found himself before a gap in the fence through which he wanted to go. He says, I could not for the life of me remember the proper words of command, by the right flank, file left, march, Hardy's tactics, forgetting my company endwise so that it could get through the gateway. As we came near the passage I shouted, Company halt! Break ranks! You are dismissed for two minutes, when you will fall in again on the other side of the gap. End of section 55. This recording is in the public domain. Section 56 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Regular and Irregular. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. Regular and Irregular. In the Black Hawk War, Captain Lincoln came to cross purposes with the regular army commissariat. The latter insisted on the fare and under the service of the army being superior to what the Bucktail Rangers got. The latter, however, were empowered by the governor to forage rather freely, so that the settlers were said to fear more for their fowls through their protectors than from the Indians for their scalps. Once, when Lincoln's corps were directed to perform some duty which he did not think accrued to them, he did it. But he went to the army officer to whom he reported and said plainly, Sir, you forget that we are not under the orders and regulations of the War Department at Washington, but are simply volunteers under those of the Governor of Illinois. Keep in your own sphere, and there will be no difficulty. But resistance will be made to your unjust orders. Further, my men must be equal in all particulars to the regular army. William Green, who was in the Rangers. End of section 56. This recording is in the public domain. Section 57 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Knowing when to give in. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. If you will refer to the table of the presidents, you will see that Lincoln's origin is set down as English, but with the noted English love of fair play is coupled the art of not knowing when a man is beaten. This descendant of John Bull differs from his ancestors on this head. During the Black Hawk War, the soldiers in camp entertained themselves by athletic contests. The captain of the Sangamon Company excelled all the others, regulars and volunteers, in bodily pastimes. This induced the men to challenge all the army, pitting Lincoln against the whole field, one down to other come up. A man of another regiment, named Thompson, appeared, with whom the preliminary tussle to feel the enemy gave Lincoln a belief that he had tackled more than he could pull off this time. He intimated as much to his backers, who, with true western wholesouledness, were betting not only all their money, but their possibles and equipment. Disbelieving him, though he had never shown the white feather, the first bout did terminate disastrously for Illinois. Lincoln was clearly downed. The next, or settling bout, ended the same way. Only Lincoln's supporters would not see, and refused to pay up their bets. The whole company was about to lock horns on the decision when Captain Lincoln spoke up. Boys, Thompson threw me fair and clean, and he did the same the next time, but not so clearly. In peace or in war, it was always the same honest Abe of Sangamon. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 58 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Fruitful Speech Read for LibriVox.org by Christine A Fruitful Speech At the age of twenty, Lincoln was studying law in off hours, and used to walk over to Boonville, ten or twelve miles, the county court center, to watch how law proceedings were conducted. He was interested in one murder case, ably defended by John Breckenridge. In fact, Lincoln, hanging round the courtroom doors to see the lawyers come out, was impelled by his ingenious admiration to hail him and say, That was the best speech I ever heard. The advocate was naturally surprised at this frank outburst of the simple country lad. Years afterward, Breckenridge, footnote, not the ex-vice president and confederate cabinet officer of that name, end of footnote. Belonging to Texas, and having been an active confederate, was in the position to implore the executive's clemency. It was granted him, while the donor reminded him of the far-off incident, which he still insisted included the best speech I ever heard. The beneficiary might have retorted that the plea for his own pardon was, in his mind, more effective in sparing a life. End of section 58. This recording is in the public domain. Section 59 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A Captain Challenged by His Men. Read for LibriVox.org. At the outset of the Black Hawk War, an outbreak of Indians in Illinois, the popularity of Abraham Lincoln induced the young men of the Sangamon Valley informing a company of mounted riflemen, to vote him as their captain. The forces were very irregular irregulars, did no fighting as a body, and were insubordinate to the last. Once it was in an ironically amusing manner. The captain had saved a friendly Indian from a beating, that being General Cass's order, as well as what humanity prompted, though at the same time there had been Indian tragedy in his own family, and he had the racial Indian hatred in his blood. The mutineers threatened to still shoot the captive. "'Not unless you shoot me,' rejoined the taunted commander. The men recoiled, but one voiced the general sentiment in. "'This is cowardly on your part, Lincoln, presuming on your rank.' "'If any of you think that, let him test it here and now,' was the reply, equally as oblivious of military decorum. But they flinched, for he was larger and lustier than anybody else. "'You can level up,' he said, guessing their reasoning. "'Choose your own weapons.' The more sane roared with laughter at this monstrous offer on the superior's part, and the good feeling was renewed between chief and file. End of section 59. This recording is in the public domain. Section 60 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams General McClellan's Opinion of Lincoln as a Lawyer Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell The whirligig of time brings about strange revenges for a truth. General McClellan was chosen to visit the seat of the Crimean War to study the siege operations about Sebastopol. Returning and seeing no prospects in the air of his professional line, he became superintendent of the Illinois Central Railroad Company. He was acting for its president in December 1855, when a bill was laid under his eyes. It was the demand of Abraham Lincoln of the law firm of Lincoln and Herndon, Springfield, Illinois. The firm had offered in October to act for the company to defend a suit brought by McLean County. Lincoln had won it. To prevent any demur about the fee of $1,000, a fourth of that having been paid for the retainer, he had six members of the bar append their names to testify the charge was usual and just. Nevertheless, Superintendent McClellan refused to pay, alleging that this is as much as a first-class lawyer would charge. You see, Mr. Lincoln was still but the one-horse lawyer of a one-horse town. End of section 60. This recording is in the public domain. Section 61 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Kentuckians are clanny. Read for LibriVox.org. 
Senator John C. S. Blackburn, of the United States Supreme Court, began his life as a lawyer at the age of twenty. This should have won him sympathy in his first case. It was before Justice McLean. Opposed to Mr. Blackburn was the chief of the Chicago Bar, I. N. Arnold, afterward member of Congress, and author of the first biography of Abraham Lincoln. Blackburn was a Kentuckian, but, but the stereotyped reputation for courage does not include audacity in a court of law. He was nervous with this first attempt, and made a mull of his presentment, when a gentleman of the bar, rising and extending a tall, ungraceful figure, intervened and laid down the case on the young Kentuckian's lines so feebly offered and entangled, that the hearers might be glad to be so disembarrassed of a feeling for the novice floundering. The bench sustained Blackburn's demurrer. Arnold was so vexed that he objected to the volunteer intervener, whereupon the befriended man learned it was one Abraham Lincoln, as unknown to him as he was to fame. Lincoln defended himself against the senator's spite, by saying he claimed the privilege of giving a newcomer the helping hand. No doubt the fellow stateship backed his prompting. Related by Judge Isaac N. Arnold, Member of Congress. End of section 61. This recording is in the public domain. Section 62 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not to be thought of. Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. Not to be thought of. It has been seen that creditors treated the struggling Lincoln with the utmost forbearance, countering the adage that forbearance is not acquittance. He was given the occasion to show how he was neighborly when the turn came. A client of his was long deferring settlement when the lawyer met him by chance on the courthouse steps at Springfield. He accosted him cordially and remarked about an accident that had befallen him. Cogdale had been blown up by gunpowder and lost a hand. He began to apologize for the business delay, showing that he was crippled manually as well as in his pursuits. Lincoln plainly expressed his sympathy and sorrow. "'I have been thinking about that note of yours,' faltered the unhappy man. The lawyer drew the paper in question out of his wallet and forced it upon him. "'It is not to be thought of,' replied he, laughing in his droll yet saturnine mode. Cogdale honestly added that he did not know when he really could pay. But the donee hurried away, saying, "'If you had the money, I would not take it out of your only hand.' End of section 62. This recording is in the public domain. Section 63 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Skin Right and Close. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Skin Right and Close. In more than one event, the Lincolnian snappy and headlong manner was the fruit of study and deliberation. Apparently holding aloof from politics after his return from Washington in 1849, Lincoln was earning a great name at the bar. His popularity was the wider, as he did not disdain poor clients and often won a case without permitting any remuneration. There came to Lincoln and Herndon's office one day a poor widow. She was entitled to a pension of $400, but the agent, one Wright, who had drawn it for her, retained one half as his fee. This greed so stirred Mr. Lincoln that he at once went to the agent to demand disgorging of the money. On refusal, a suit was instituted for the recovery. At the trial, with his buoyancy, Lincoln said to his partner, You had better stay and hear me address the jury, as I am going to skin right and get the money back. He pleaded that there was no contract between the parties, that the man was not an authorised agent, his charge was unreasonable, he had never given the money due to the soldier's widow, but retained one half. Next he expatiated on her husband. During the Revolutionary War, experiencing the hardships of the old Continentals at Valley Forge in the winter, barefoot in the deep snows, ill-clad against the rigours, their feet cut by ice staining the ground, and so on. The men in the box were also affected to tears, like the spectators, while the pension shark wriggled under the invectives. The verdict was in favour of the relict. Her advocate not only remitted his cost, but paid her fair home and for her stay in Springfield so that she went off rejoicing. 
Lincoln's partner had the curiosity to look at his brief, which concluded, Skin right. Close. Related by Mr. Herndon, present at the trial. End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hooking hens is low. Read for LibriVox.org. Mr. Lincoln had assisted in the prosecution of a fellow who stole some fowls. The lawyer jogged homeward in the company of the jury foreman. He eulogized the young man for his good work in the prosecution, and when the other returned the compliment by speaking warmly of the jury's prompt and speedy deliverance of the verdict, the foreman replied, "'Yes, the vagabond ought to be locked up. Why, when I was young and perder than I am now, I didn't mind packing a sheep or two off on my back. But stealing hens, bah! It is low, and shows what the country is coming to.'" End of section 64. This recording is in the public domain. Section 65 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The State Against Mr. Whiskey. When Lincoln was a briefless barrister, frequenting the courts on their own peregrinations, to catch the eye of client or judge, he was at Clinton, Illinois, where a case came up of a very modern nature. To be sure, the shrieking sisterhood was then invented for the advocates of female suffrage and anti-slavery, but these twelve or fifteen young women presented themselves in custody for a novel charge. They had failed to induce a liquor dealer to restrict his license, and smashed his wine parlor incontinently. Although public sympathy was theirs for the act, as well as for their youth, prettiness, and sex, none of the lawyers would take up their defense on account of the influence of the brewer's and distiller's agent. In this emergency, Abraham Lincoln stepped into the breach and volunteered to defend the defenseless. I would suggest first, began he, that there be a change in the indictment so as to have it read the state against Mr. Whiskey instead of the state against these women. This is the defense of these women. The man who has persisted in selling whiskey has had no regard for their well-being or the welfare of their husbands and sons. He has had no fear of God or regard for man neither has he any regard for the laws of the statute. No jury can fix any damages or punishment for any violation of the moral law. The course pursued by this liquor dealer has been for the demoralization of society. His groggery has been a nuisance. These women, finding all moral suasion of no avail with this fellow, oblivious to all, to all tender appeal, and alike regardless of their tears and prayers, in order to protect their households and promote the welfare of the community, united to suppress the nuisance, the good of society demanded its suppression. They accomplished what otherwise could not have been done. The Lincoln Magazine End of Section 65 This recording is in the public domain. Section 66 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams as clear as moonshine, read for LibriVox.org. In 1858 Lincoln was committed to the political campaign, which was a passing victory, superficially, to his opponent, Senator Douglas, to eventuate in his accession to the presidency. So he had let legal strife fall into abeyance during two years. He was, therefore, vexed to have an applicant for his renewing that line of business, but at once welcomed the suitor on learning her name. It was Hannah Armstrong. He was eager to see her. She was the wife of the bully of Clary's Grove, the locally noted wrestler Jack Armstrong. After they had become friends, Lincoln had been harbored in their cottage in the days when poverty held him down, so he scarcely could let his head above water. The good soul had repaid his doing chores about her house, such as minding the baby, getting in the firewood, and keeping the highway cows out of her cabbage patch, after her husband died by darning his socks, filling up a bowl with corn-mush, at the period when it was a feast to have cheese, bologna, and crackers, in the garret where he pored over law-books. Her news was painful. The baby, whose cradle Lincoln had rocked, was a man now, and was in what the vernacular phrased pretty considerable of a tight fix. It looked as though Mr. Lincoln would have difficulty in loosening the fix, far more to remove it. 
At a camp meeting the young men had been riotous. Armstrong and a companion had been entangled in a fight for all comers, in which one man was seriously injured by some weapon. The companion, Norris, was tried and convicted for manslaughter of Metzger, receiving the sentence of eight years' imprisonment. But Armstrong was to be indicted for murder, as the injuries were indicated as inflicted with a blunt instrument, and a witness confirmed that they were done by a slung shot in Armstrong's hands. It was little excuse that he, like the rest implicated, was drunk at the time. Nevertheless, dissolute as was the young man of two and twenty, Lincoln did not need the woman's assurance that her son was incapable of murder so deliberate. Armstrong averred that any blow he struck was done with a naked fist. Furthermore, it was said that Metzger was not left insensible on the field of battle, but was going home beside a yoke of oxen when the yoke end cracked his skull. It was this, and no slung shot, that caused his death the following day. Recognizing that the complication forebode a strenuous task, Lincoln none the less accepted it, and assuring his old Aunt Hannah that he would not suffer her to talk of remuneration, he resumed the toga to contest the effort to take away Armstrong's life, and release Norris, as convicted under error. He closeted himself with the prisoner to hear his account, and upon that concluded he was guiltless. It has been said that Lincoln would never undertake a defense of a man he believed guilty. This held good in the present instance. As the statement about the slung-shot blow was made by a man who disputed the ox-yoke accident, and that the fatal hurts were received in the free fight at the camp-meeting, it was necessary that he should be explicit. He had seen the blow and distinguished the weapon by the light of the moon. Lincoln was accustomed from early life to relieve his brain when toiling or distressed, by the turning to a vein utterly opposed to those moods. His chief diversion from Blackstone and the statutes was his favorite author, Shakespeare. Hackett, the Falstaff, delighted in by our grandfathers, pronounced the President a better student of that dramatist than he expected to meet. As the ancients drew fates, as it is called, from Virgil, and the medievalists from the Bible, so the lawyer drew hints from his author. The process is to open at a page and read as a forecast the first line meeting the eye. The playbook opened at Midsummer Night's Dream. To refresh himself after his speeches in rehearsal, Lincoln had been enjoying the humor of the amateur actor clowns. So the line, leaping into sight, was on parallel lines with his thought. "'Does the moon shine that night?' so the text. Whereupon Nick Bottom, a weaver, cries out, A calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine! The pleader had his cue. It was not necessary to postpone the trial on the ground that the debate upon the new charge prevented a fair jury in the district. Besides, the widow would grow mad in the long suspense, even if the prisoner bore it manfully, though sorrowing for her and his misspent life. The trial was indeed the event of the year at the courthouse. The witnesses for the prosecution repeated about Armstrong much the same story as had convicted Norris. Armstrong had led a reprehensible career, and the deliberate onslaught with a weapon after the fight could hardly have been made by an intoxicated man. It was vindictiveness from being worsted by the unhappy Metzger in a fair fight. In vain was it cited that he and Metzger had been friends, and that the accuser was a personal enemy of the former. The case looked so formidable, unanswerable in short, that the state proctor's plea for condemnation might all but be taken for granted. However highly the prisoner had been elated by his father's friend, his own, having promised to deliver him before sundown, he must have lost the lift-up, for he wore the abandoned expression of one forsaken by his own hopes as by his friends. Norris, in his cell, could not have been more veritably the picture of despair. Lincoln rose for the final, without eliciting any emotion from him. He dilated on the evidence, which he asserted boldly was proof of a plot against an innocent youth. He called the principal witness back to the stand, and caused him definitely to repeat that he had seen Armstrong strike the fatal stroke, with a slung shot, undoubtedly, and by the light of the moon. The proof that his accusation was false was in the advocate's hand, the almanac, which the usher handed unto the jury, while the judge consulted one on his desk. The whole story was a fabrication to avenge a personal enmity, and the rock of the prosecution was blasted by the defense's fiery eloquence. The arbiters went out for half an hour, but the audience, waiting in breathless impatience, discounted the result. The twelve filed in to utter the alleviating, not guilty, and the liberator was able to fulfill his pledge. It was not sunset, and the prisoner was free to comfort his mother. In vain did she talk of paying a fee, 
and the man supported the desire by alleging his intention to work the debt out. Lincoln said in the old familiar tongue, "'Aunt Hannah, I shan't charge you a red—I said without money or price, and anything I can do for you and yours shall not cost you a cent.' Soon after, as she wrote to him of an attempt to deprive her of her land, he bade her force a case into the court, appeal to the Supreme Court, where his law firm would act, and he would fight it out. Regarding the rescued man, he enlisted in the war at the first call. He was still in the ranks two years later, when his mother, in her loneliness, begged for him of the President, Commander-in-Chief, for his release to come home. His leave was immediately written out by Lincoln's own hand, and the soldier went home from Kentucky. He remained a valuable citizen. It was Lincoln's speech and the moonbeam of inspiration that saved him. End of section 66. This recording is in the public domain. Section 67 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Nice clothes may make a handsome man, even of you. Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader. In 1832, Lincoln, elected to the Illinois Legislative Chamber, found himself in one of those anguishing embarrassments besetting him in all the early stages of his unflagging ascent from the social slew of despond. Unlike eels, he never got used to skinning. For the new station, however well provided mentally, he had no means to procure dress fit for the august halls of debate. He was yet standing behind the counter in Offutt's general shop at New Salem, when an utter stranger strolled in, asked his name, though his exceptional stature and unrivaled mien revealed his identity, and announced his own name. Each had heard of the other. The newcomer was not an Adonis, perhaps, but he was one compared with the awkward, leaning tower of Pisa, Cornstalk, who carried the jackknife as the homeliest man in the section. Lincoln was doubly the plainest speaker there and thereabouts. "'Mr. Smoot,' began the clerk, "'I am disappointed in you, sir. I expected to see a scaly specimen of humanity.' "'Mr. Lincoln, I am sorely disappointed in you, in whom I expected to see a good-looking man.' After this jocular exchange of greeting, the joke cemented friendship between them. The proof of the friendship is in the usefulness of it. Lincoln turned to this acquaintance in his dilemma. The future president may have divined the saying of the similarly martyred McKinley about the cheap clothes making a cheap man. He summed up his situation. I must certainly have decent clothes to go there among the celebrities. No doubt the state capital had other fashions than those prevailing at Sangamon Town, where even the shopkeeper's present attire, in which he had solicited suffrages, was scoffed at as below the mark. It was composed of flax and tow linen pantaloons, one Ellis storekeeper describes from eyewitnessing. I thought about five inches too short on the legs, exposing blue yarn socks the original of the farmer's socks of our mail-order magazines. No vest or coat, and but one suspender. He wore a calico shirt, as he had in the Black Hawk War, coarse brogans, tan color. "'As you voted for me,' went on the ambitious man, about to exchange the counter for the rostrum, "'you must want me to make a decent appearance in the State House?' "'Certainly,' was the reply, as anticipated." Lincoln was so sure of his wheedling ways by this time. And the friend in need supplied him with two hundred dollars currency, which, according to the budding legislator's promise, he returned out of his first pay as representative. End of section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The abutment was dubersome. Read for LibriVox.org. President Lincoln was told that the Northern and Southern Democrats had at last accomplished a fusion. Well, I believe you, of course, said he to the informant, but I have my doubts of the foundation, like my friend Brown. Brown is a sound church member. He was a member, too, of a township committee, having to receive bids for building a bridge over a deep and rapid river. 
The contractors did not seem to like the proposition, so Brown called in an architectural acquaintance, named, we will say, Jones. At the question, Can you build this bridge? he was overbold, and replied, Yes, sir, or any other. I could build a bridge from Sodom to Gomorrah with abutment below. The committee, being good and select men, were shocked at the strong language, and Brown was called upon to defend his protege. I know Jones well enough, he rejoined, and he is so honest a man and so good a builder, that if he states positively that he can build a bridge from Sodom to Gomorrah, why, I believe him. But I feel bound to state that I am in some doubt as to the abutment on the other side. My friend, I reassert I have my doubts about the abutment. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Good enough for the President. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Good enough for the President. It was while at the store in New Salem that Lincoln made the acquaintance of Richard Yates, contemporarily in office with him as War Governor of Illinois. So proud were the citizens of the colloquial abilities of their rising young man that they used to show him to visitors as their lion. Yates was introduced and stayed to hear him roar. Later, Lincoln asked him to join him in his noon meal at the cabin where a woman boarded him. The latter was one of those good souls who give the best in the larder, but are all the time apologizing. They had happened upon the ordinarily plain repast of bread, homemade, and the sweetest of corn, and milk from the cow. Flurried by the unknown company, the auntie, in dealing out the bowls to a numerous family, somehow, between herself and Lincoln, let the vessel slip, and falling to the floor it was smashed and the milk wasted. Lincoln disputed it was her fault, as she politely averred. She continued to argue for her guiltiness. Oh, very well, said Lincoln at last. We will not wrangle on whose was the slip, or, if it does not trouble you, it would not trouble me. Anyway, what is a basin of pap? nothing to fret about. Mr. Lincoln, you are wrong. The woman remembered the children to whom a lesson ought to be given. A dish of bread and milk is fit for the President of the United States. Both the guests are quest. The cream of a story is in the application. Years afterward, when the man from Sangamon, the unknown, occupied the Carroll chair, an elderly woman from Illinois called at the White House and requested an interview. It was the Aunt Lizzie of the above episode. Her mere mention of being home folks won her admittance, and her recognition the best of the executive mansion lard pantry. When she had finished the elegant collation, and intermingled the tasty morsels with reminiscences, the host slyly inquired if now in the presidential dwelling she stuck to the sentiments about the dye enunciated in her log cabin. Indeedy I do. I still stick to it that bread and milk is a good enough dish for the president. Lincoln smiled with his sad smile. He had been long, not to say a lengthy martyr to dyspepsia, and she uttered a truism that struck him to the digestive apparatus. End of section 69. This recording is in the public domain. Section 70 of The Lincoln's Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's First Political Speech Read for LibriVox.org. In 1831 or 32, Abraham Lincoln made his maiden political speech at Pappsville, or Richland, Illinois. He was twenty-three and timid, and the preceding speakers had rolled the sun nearly down. The speech is, therefore, short and agreeable. Gentlemen, fellow citizens, I presume you all know who I am. I am humble Abraham Lincoln. I have been solicited by my friends to become a candidate for the legislature. My politics are short and sweet, like an old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank, the international improvement scheme, and a high protective tariff. These are my sentiments and political principles. If elected, I will be thankful. If defeated, it will be all the same. Springfield Republican. End of section 70. This recording is in the public domain. Section 71 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Lightning Rod to Protect a Guilty Conscience Read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman 
one term in the illinois state legislature only wedded the predestined politician for a seat again at that table though it was not he who won the loaves and the fishes he was to speak at springfield the more gloriously welcomed as he was prominent in the movement hereafter realized of changing the capital from vandalia to this more energetic town the meeting had foreboded ill as a serious wrangle between two of the preceding speakers threatened to end in a challenge to a duel still a fashionable diversion but lincoln intervened with a speech so enthralling that the hearers forgot the dispute and heard him out with rapture he had found the proper way to manage his voice never musical by controlling the nasal twang into a monotonous but audible sharpness carrying to a great distance he was followed by one george Falker, a facing both ways profit-taking politician who had achieved his end by obtaining an office this was the land office register at this town he had been a prominent whig representative in eighteen thirty four the turncoat assailed lincoln bitterly much as pitt was derided in his beginning and had begun his piece by announcing that the young man lincoln must be taken down as if to live up to the lucrative berth mr farker had finished a frame house springfield still had log houses and not only in the environs either and to cap the novelty had that other new feature a lightning rod put upon it the object of the slur at youth had listened to the diatribe flattering only so far as he was singled out mr joshua f speed a bosom friend of lincoln reports the retort as follows the gentleman says that this young man must be taken down it is for you not for me to say whether i am up or down the gentleman has alluded to my being a young man i am older in years than in the tricks and trades of politicians i desire to live and i desire place and distinction as a politician but i would rather die now than like the gentleman live to see the day that i would have to erect a lightning rod to protect a guilty conscience from an offended god mr speed says that the reply was characterized by great force and dignity the happy image of the lightning rod for a conscience has passed into the fixed star stage of a household word throughout the west end of section seventy one this recording is in the public domain recording by rhonda fetterman Section 72 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Firing on a Flea for a Squirrel Read for LibriVox.org by Jeremiah Britt Firing on a Flea for a Squirrel In 1841, while serving a term in the Illinois legislature, Lincoln was the longest of the Sangamon representatives, distinguished as the Long Nine. They were much hampered by an old member who tried to put a stopper upon any measure on the set ground that it was unconstitutional. Lincoln was selected to spike his gun. A measure was introduced benefiting the Sangamon district, so that its electee might befittingly push it and defend it. He was warrantably its usher when the habitual interrupter bawled his stereotyped, UNCONSTITUTIONAL! The quasher is reported as follows in the local press, if not in the journal of the house, which one need not, perhaps, consult. Mr. Speaker, said the son of the Sangamon Vale, the attack of the member from Wabash County upon the unconstitutionality of this measure reminds me of an old friend of mine. He was a peculiar-looking old fellow, with shaggy, overhanging eyebrows and a pair of spectacles under them. This description fitted the Wabash member, at whom all gaze was directed. One morning, 
just after the old soul got up, he imagined he saw a gray squirrel on a tree near his house. So he took down his rifle and fired at the squirrel, as he believed, but the squirrel paid no attention to the shot. He loaded and fired again and again until, at the thirteenth shot, he set down his gun impatiently and said to his boy, looking on, Boy, there's something wrong about this rifle. Rifle's all right. I know it is, answered the boy. But where's your squirrel? Don't you see him, humped up about halfway up the tree, inquired the old man, peering over his spectacles and getting mystified. No, I don't, responded the boy. And then turning and looking into his father's face, he exclaimed, Yes, I spy your squirrel. You have been firing at a flea on your own brow. This modern version of seeing the moat and not the beam in one's own eye smothered the member for Wabash in laughter, and he dropped the standard objection of unconstitutional, as he had not his mark. End of section 72 This recording is in the public domain. Section 73 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Cream of the Joke. Read for LibriVox.org. By reason of the distances and the lonesomeness, it was the pleasant habit of candidates to make their electioneering tours together. In seeking re-election in 1838, Lincoln was accompanied by Mr. Ewing. They stopped at one country house about dark, when the good wife was going a-milking, while her husband was still afield. Intent on securing her, as she had the repute of being the grey mare, the two partisans accompanied her to the paddock. Ewing, to show his gallantry as well as his familiarity with farm work, a main point in such communities, offered to relieve the dame of the pail and fillet while she rested. In the meantime Lincoln chatted with her, so that Ewing could hardly get a word in. At his finishing his self-chosen task, he beheld the pair deeply absorbed, for Lincoln had exercised his glib tongue to such advantage as to secure her influence over her man's vote. End of section 73. This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. Parallel Courses In the 13th Congress, Jefferson Davis was in the Senate, while Lincoln and Alexander Stevens were in the House. End of section 74. This recording is in the public domain. Section 75 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Jumping Jim Crow. When in Congress he was a conscious Whig, as opposed to the cotton ones, that is, for the anti-slavery doctrine and not for cottoning for the South. He wrote home, as you at Springfield are all so anxious for me to distinguish myself, I have concluded to do so before long. He nearly extinguished himself, for suddenly he went right about face, according to the popular song, quite a political, if not a politic, course. You wheel about and jump about, and do just so, and every time you jump about you jump Jim Crow. He had gone against the general tide in hindering the Mexican War, as sure to bring Texas into the Union as a slave state, yet now he espoused its hero, rough and ready Taylor. He had to excuse himself as recognizing that the general was the Whig's best candidate, and as the Whig National Convention agreed with him, the apparent truckling was condoned. End of section 75. This recording is in the public domain. Section 76 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Facts are Stubborn Things. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Facts are Stubborn Things. Your letter on McClellan reminds me of a story that I, Abraham Lincoln, heard in Washington when I was here before. There was an editor in Rhode Island noted for his love of fun. It came to him irresistibly, and he could not help saying just what came to his mind. He was appointed postmaster by Tyler. Some time after Tyler vetoed the bank bill and came into disrepute with the Whigs, a conundrum went the round of the papers. It was as follows. Why is John Tyler like an ass? 
The editor copied the conundrum and could not resist the temptation to answer it, and which he did thus, because he is an ass. This piece of fun cost him his head, but it was a fact. Shatark Democrat End of section 76 This recording is in the public domain. Section 77 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Party Gad Read for LibriVox.org by John Leader Footnote Wilmot Proviso That money to buy Mexican land should not go toward slave buying. In 1846, General Cass was for the Wilmot Proviso at once. In March 1846, he was still for it, but not just then and in December 1847 he was against it altogether. When the question was raised in 1846 he was in a blustering hurry to take ground for it. He sought to be in advance and to avoid the uninteresting position of a mere follower, but soon he began to see a glimpse of the great democratic oxgad waving in his face, and to hear instinctively a voice saying, Back, back, sir, back a little. He shakes his head and bats his eyes and blunders back to his position of March 1847. And still the gad waves and the voice grows more distinct and sharper still. Back, sir, back, I say, farther back. And back he goes to the position of December 1847, at which the gad is still, and the voice soothingly says, So, stand still at that. Speech by A. Lincoln, House of Representatives, Washington, July 27, 1848. End of section 77. This recording is in the public domain. Section 78 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hard to Beat. Read for LibriVox.org. Of his Washington experience in 1848, Lincoln brought a pack of tales about the statesmen then prominent. He declared to have heard of Daniel Webster the subjoined. In school little Dan had been guilty of some misdoing for which he was called up to the teacher to be caned on the hand. His hands were dirty, and to save appearance he moistened his right hand on his way up, and wiped it on his pants. Nevertheless it looked so foul on presentation to the feral that the teacher sharply protested, "'Well, this is hard to beat. If you will find another hand in this room as filthy, I will let you off.' Daniel popped out his left hand, modestly kept in the background, and readily cried, "'Here it is, sir!' Told by Lincoln before the Honorable Mr. Odell and others. This is not the ex-governor, Mr. Odell, of New York, who pleads guilty to the editor of being too young to have had the honor of speaking with Mr. Lincoln. The worst luck, both would have profited by the mutual pleasure." End of section 78. This recording is in the public domain. Section 79 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams I reckon I took more than my share. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell Lincoln confessed at the outset of life that he was going to avoid society, as its frequentation was incompatible with study. He avowed at the same time that he liked it, which enhanced the sacrifice. No doubt so, since his Washington sojourn and his legal and legislative company earned him the title of the Prince of Good Fellows. To be coupled with the genial Martin Van Buren with the same epithet was indeed a compliment. At Washington he had, in 1848, made acquaintance with the fashionable world. He preferred the livelier and less straight ways of the Congressional boarding-house table, the Saturday parties at Daniel Webster's, and the motley crowd at the bowling alley, as well as the chatterer's corner in the Congressional post office. Still, as chairman of a committee, and by reason of his being a wonder from the Harrisute West, he was invited to the receptions and feast of the first families. Green to the niceties of the table, he committed errors, so frankly apologized for and humorously treated, that he lost no standing. At one dinner the experience was new to him of the dish of currant jelly being passed around for each guest to transfer a little to his plate, 
so he took it as a sweet, oddly accompanying the venison, and left but little on the general plate. But after tasting it he perceived that the compote dish was going the rounds, and suddenly, looking pointedly at his plate, and then at the hostess, with a troubled air, he said, with convincing simplicity, "'It looks like I took more than my share.' Supplied by the hostess and collected by J. R. Speed. End of section 79 this recording is in the public domain. Section 80 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln was loaded for bear. Read for LibriVox.org. An eminent man of politics has said that the similes of the learned, which liken Abraham Lincoln to King Henry the Fourth of France, and other historical notables, are far from the mark, and reveal their misapprehension of the Machiavel redeemed by moral goodness. He thinks that without the hypocrisy being censurable, he was more of the type of Pope Sixtus V. This celebrity, who, like Lincoln, was in the hog business at one time, pretended silliness to be elected pontiff. The die cast, he stood forth in all his native strength, keeping the friends who did not try to sway him, and becoming a rod of steel where he had been rated as lead. Footnote. Greeley stamped Lincoln as the slowest piece of lead that ever crawled. At the same time as he disparaged himself, mocked and laughed, he let out glimpses of true ambition, when his short-sighted advisers warmly crossed his ground of setting himself with freedom against the pro-slavery party, assuring him that he would thereby lose the senatorship as against Douglas, he confessed, I am after larger game, the battle of 1860 for the chair of Washington is worth a hundred of this. End of section 80. This recording is in the public domain. Section 81 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A bounteous president, if anything is left. Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder. Mr. Speaker. We have all heard of the animal standing in doubt between two stacks of hay and starving to death. The like of that would never happen to General Cass. Place the stacks a thousand miles apart. He would stand stock still, midway between them, and eat both at once. And the green grass along the line would be apt to suffer some too at the same time. By all means, make him president, gentlemen. He will feed you bounteously, if, if, there is anything left after he shall have helped himself. Speech. House of Representatives. July 27th, 1848. End of section 81. This recording is in the public domain. Section 82 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. THE ART OF BEING PAID TO EAT. READ FOR LIBRIVOX.ORG. I have introduced General Cass's accounts here chiefly to show the wonderful physical capacities of the man. They show that he not only did the labor of several men at the same time, but that he often did it at several places many hundred miles apart at the same time. And at eating, too, his capacities are shown to be quite as wonderful. From October 1821 to May 1822 he ate ten rations a day in Michigan, ten a day here in Washington, and near five dollars worth a day besides, partly on the road between the two places. And then there is an important discovery in his example, the art of being paid for what one eats, instead of having to pay for it. Hereafter, if any nice man shall owe a bill which he cannot pay, he can just board it out. Speech, House of Representatives, July twenty seventh, 1848. A tilt at a general drawing rations for himself and staff. End of section 82. This recording is in the public domain. Section 83 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Advice Not to Say No Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots Mr. Lincoln said to General Viel, If I have got one vice, it is not being able to say no and I consider it a vice. Thank God for not making me a woman. I presume if he had, he would have made me just as homely as I am. 
and nobody would have ever tempted me. End of recording. End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Best Car. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. The Best Car. From his previous sojourn in the capital, President Lincoln had a fund of good stories upon his predecessors. Among them was the following tale about President Tyler, one of the weakest chiefs the Republic has ever known, with the exception of Franklin Pierce. Lincoln said that this President's son, Bob, was sent by his father to arrange about a special train for an excursion. The railroad agent happened to be a hard-shell Whig, and having no fear of the great, and wanting no favor, shrank from allowing him any. He said that the road did not run any specials for presidents. Stop, interrupted Bob. Did you not furnish a special for General President Harrison? Died 1841. Suppose we did, answered the superintendent. Well, if you will bring your father here in that condition, you shall have the best train on the track. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, November 2008. Section 85 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Self made. Read for LibriVox.org. Self made or never made, says one of the apologists for Lincoln's ruggedness of character and outward air at an early political meeting, when asked if he were self-made, and he answered in the affirmative, the rough critic remarked, then it is a poor job, as if it were by nature's apprentice. But in 1860, when friends reproached him for the lack of old hickory, Jackson's sternness, he replied nobly, I am just as God made me, and cannot change. End of section 85. This recording is in the public domain. Section 86 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. His High Mightiness. Read for LibriVox by David Lawrence. His High Mightiness. The little court of the White House, wrangling about a fit title for the chief, that of excellency not being taken as sufficient, one disputant suggested that the Dutch one of High Mightiness might fit. Speaker Mullenberg, at the First Presidency, pronounced on the question at a dinner, where Washington was sitting. Why, General, if we were certain the office would always be held by men as large as yourself, how cleverly he shunned the use of either great or grand, or Mr. Wyckoff there, it would be appropriate enough. But if by chance a president as small as my opposite neighbor should be elected, his high mightiness would be ridiculous. The quarrelers were hushed, thinking of Douglas, the little giant, had preceded or should follow their colossus of six feet three. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, December 2008. Section 87 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Opinion at Thirty Diffident, but having been twice disappointed in love-making, Abraham wrote in support of a Miss Owen rejecting him, I should never be satisfied with any one blockheaded enough to have me. End of section 87. This recording is in the public domain. Section 88 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Blank Biography Read for LibriVox.org Lincoln had been reading from Edmund Burke's life when he threw down the book with disrelish. He fell into his habit of musing, and on reviving, said to his associate Herndon, I've wondered why book publishers do not have blank biographies on their shelves, always ready for an emergency, 
so that if a man happens to die, his heirs or his friends, if they wish to perpetuate his memory, can purchase one already written, but with blanks. These blanks they can fill up with rosy sentences full of high-sounding praise. He sent the Dictionary of Congress his autobiography in a single paragraph of fifty words, as an example. End of section 88. This recording is in the public domain. Section 89 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Homeliest Man Under Government Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Homeliest Man Under Government When General Lee surrendered to General Grant, one point was noticed by the spectators, which, it was held, distinguished the Cavalier from the Puritan. Grant was in his fighting clothes and his everyday sword by his side, while General Lee, dressed faultlessly as a soldier should always be, carried a court sword, presented him as an honour by the Southerners. So, in wars, Providence does not flourish the showy weapon, but uses a strong and sharp blade without ornamental hilt. Abraham Lincoln was the instrument of heaven for work. Ceaseless, bloody work, hard, for it was the least to his taste. From boyhood, the looks of the woodchipper and river boatman were subjects of jeering. Whether the budding genius spurned such adventurous aids, as graces of person in his career, or was already a philosopher who believed that handsome is that handsome does, is a winning motto, we may never know. It is enough that he joined in the laugh and kept the ball rolling. On the loss of a first love, one Annie Rutledge, a name he said he always loved, his friends were alarmed for his health and sanity. They took away the knife every man carried in the West, and discovered it was the obligatory one presented to the ugliest man, and not to be disposed of otherwise than to one still homelier. There is a record of the clerical gentleman to whom Lincoln was justified in offering it, who died with it in his uncontested possession in Toronto. As is the custom of an office holder going out of his seat, calls on the president with his successor to transfer the seals and other tokens. The unlucky man enumerated the good qualities of his substitute, and was surprised that Mr. Lincoln should dilate upon his with excessive regrets that he was going to leave the service. This Mr. Addison was indeed a first-class servant, but uncommonly ill-favoured. Yes, Addison, said the chief, I have no doubt that Mr. Price is a pearl of price, but, but nothing can compensate me for the loss of you, for when you retire I shall be the homeliest man in the government. End of section 89. This recording is in the public domain. Section 90 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Better looking than expected. Related by the President to Grace Greenwood. As I recall it, the story, told very simply and tersely, but with inimitable drollery, ran that a certain honest old farmer, visiting the capital for the first time, was taken by the member of Congress for his district to some large gathering or entertainment. He went in order to see the President. Unfortunately, Mr. Lincoln did not appear, and the Congressman, being a bit of a wag and not liking to have his constituent disappointed, designated Mr. R. of Minnesota. He was a gentleman of a particularly round and rubicund countenance. The worthy agriculturalist, greatly astonished, exclaimed, Is that old Abe? Well, I do declare. He's a better looking man than I expected to see. But it do seem as how his troubles have drove him to drink. End of section 90. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario. November 2008. Section 91 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. 
Lincoln and Superstition. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell. Lincoln and Superstition. Childhood impressions are ineffaceable, though they may be for a time set aside. Abraham Lincoln, with all his lofty mind, acquiesced in the vulgar belief that he took his son Robert to have the benefit of a madstone at a distance from where the boy was dog-bitten. He made the pact with a divine power as to the Emancipation Act, with a sincerity which robbed worldly wisdom of its sting, and he had dreams and visions like a seer. End of section 91. This recording is in the public domain. Section 92 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Dream. Read for LibriVox.org. Before any great national event, I have always had the same dream. I had it the other night. It is a ship sailing rapidly. To a friend, in April 1865. See Ship of State, a pet simile. End of section 92. This recording is in the public domain. Section 93 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's Vision Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman Abraham Lincoln had been nominated for the presidency. The consummation of his ambition had naturally a deep impression upon him. He came home and threw himself on the lounge, expressly made to let him recline at full length. It was opposite a bureau on which was a pivoted mirror happening to be so tilted that it reflected him as he lay. As I reclined, he says, my eye fell upon the glass, and I saw two images of myself, exactly alike, except that one was a little paler than the other. I arose and lay down again with the same result. It made me quite uncomfortable for a few minutes, but some friends coming in, the matter passed out of my mind. The next day, while walking in the street, I was suddenly reminded of the circumstances, and the disagreeable sensation produced by it returned. I determined to go home and place myself in the same position, as regards the mirror, and if the same effect was produced, I would make up my mind that it was the natural result of some principle of refraction or optics, which I did not understand, and dismiss it. I tried the experiment with the same result, and, as I had said to myself, accounted for it on some principle unknown to me, and then it ceased to trouble me. But the God who works through the laws of nature must surely give a sign to me if one of his chosen servants, even through the operation of a principle of optics, this, seeing one's simulacrum, or double, was so common, especially when looking-glasses were full of flaws, designedly cast faulty to give magical effects for conjurers, that old books on the black art teem with instances. Lincoln was right to demonstrate that the vision was founded on fact, and no supernatural sight at all. His trying the repetition was like Lord Byron's quashing a similar illusion, but a suit of clothes hung up to look like a friend whom he believed he saw in the spirit. A more widely read man would have dismissed the fetch like the president-elect, but with a laugh. End of section 93. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 94 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It is a poor sermon that does not fit somewhere. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. It is a poor sermon that does not hit somewhere. President Lincoln was wont to carry his mother's old Bible about with him in the capital city. Often he would be consulting it in mental plights. He said that the Psalms was the part he liked best. The Psalms have something for every day in the week, and something for every poor fellow like me. End of section 94. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 95 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Religion of Feeling. Read for LibriVox.org. Lincoln told a friend that he heard a man named Glenn say at an Indiana church meeting, When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That is my religion. End of section 95. This recording is in the public domain. Section 96 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Two Prayers. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. The Two Prayers. In Lincoln's inaugural address will be found the passage about the sad singularity of the two contendants in the fratricidal combat being Christians alike. Both read the same Bible and prayed to the same God. The example is forthcoming. There is plenty of evidence that the speaker always took counsel of God. His words are, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I have nowhere else to go. Footnote. No longer was Lincoln's piety held as hypocrisy, as in 1860 when a campaign song sneers at how each night he seeks the closet, there alone to kneel and pray. End of footnote. Connect with the Confederate commander, Robert E. Lee's avowal. I have never seen the day when I did not pray for the people of the North. Everybody thinks better than anybody. Lincoln. This is also ascribed to Talleyrand. It is only the rich who are robbed. End of section 96. This recording is in the public domain. Section 97 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams We shall see our friends in heaven. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell For weeks after the death of his son Willie, the inconsolable father mourned, in particular, on that day in each week. And even the military sights at Fortress Monroe to court a change failed to distract him. He was studying Shakespeare, Calling his private secretary to him, he read several passages, and finally that of Queen Constance's lament over her lost child. And, Father Cardinal, I have heard you say that we shall see, and know, our friends in heaven. King John, Act Three, Scene Four If that be true, I shall see my boy again, he said. Colonel. Did you ever dream of a lost friend, and feel that you were holding sweet communion with that friend, and yet have a sad consciousness that it was not reality? Just so I dream of my boy Willie. Colonel Lamon, the presidential bodyguard-in-chief, was the recipient of this spiritual confidence. End of section 97. This recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams More Praying and Less Swearing Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots On accompanying Mrs. Pomeroy, military nurse, to her hospital, the President discovered that the authorities of the house had forbidden praying to the patients, or even reading the Bible to them, as it was denominational. He promptly removed the restriction and furthered the visiting missionaries in holding prayer meetings, read the scriptures to his boys in blue, and pray with them as much as they pleased. If there was more praying, he said, and less swearing, it would be far better for our country. End of recording. End of section 98. This recording is in the public domain. Section 99 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Gloves or No Gloves Read for LibriVox.org An old acquaintance of the President's visited him at Washington. Each man's wife insisted on the gentleman, her lord, donning gloves, for they were going as a square party out in the presidential carriage, and the Washingtonians would not accept a king as such unless he dressed as a king. Mr. Lincoln, as a shrewd politician and a married man, put his gloves in his pocket, 
not to don them until there was no wriggling out of the fix. The other one had his on at the hotel where the carriage came to take that couple up. They went out and took seats in the vehicle, whereupon the newcomer, seeing that his host was ungloved, went on the rule of leaving the fence-bars as you find them. He set to drawing off his kids at the same time as Mr. Lincoln commenced to tug at his to get them on. "'No, no, no,' protested the caller, fetching away his kids one at a time. "'It is none of my doings. Put up your mittens, Lincoln.' And so they had their ride out without their hands being in guards. End of section 99 this recording is in the public domain. Section 100 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Use of Books. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. The Use of Books. Books serve to show a man that those original thoughts of his aren't very new after all. By an Illinois clergyman, knowing Lincoln in the fifties. End of section 100. This recording is in the public domain. Section 101 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Book Criticism. Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon. Lincoln's Book Criticism. For those who like this kind of book, this is the kind of book they will like. New York Times Book Review. July 7, 1901. End of section 101. This recording is in the public domain. Section 102 of the Lincoln Story Book by Henry L. Williams. The Hand to Hand Encounter. Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon. The Hand to Hand Encounter. Toward the evident close of the struggle, an English nobleman came to Washington, credited to the embassy. This was somewhat imprudent and imprudent of him, too, as, in early times, he was prominent among the British aristocrats who had supported the Confederate States. He had assisted in their being declared belligerents, a sore point. He had invested in the cotton loan, and voted in sustenance of the lairds getting the rebel pirates out of the mercy. Altogether, he must have attended the regular White House reception from thinking his hostility was unrecorded. But the President was clearly prepared for the fox paw. He spoke to the Briton smoothly enough, but when the unsuspecting hand was placed in his grasp, he gave it one of those natural and not formal grips which left an impression on him forever. The balladist line was realized for him. It is hard to give the hand where the heart can never be. End of section 102 this recording is in the public domain. Section 103 of the Lincoln Story Book by Henry L. Williams. Better Sometimes Right Than All Times Wrong. Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon. Better Sometimes Right Than All Times Wrong. In 1832, when candidate for the Illinois Legislative Chambers, Lincoln said he held it, a sound maxim better only sometimes to be right than at all times wrong. End of section 103. This recording is in the public domain. Section 104 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Making the Dagger Stab the Holder. Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon. Making the Dagger Stab the Holder Upon the first debate of the Lincoln-Douglas series, an admirer of the former, having no doubt now the stump speaker would defeat the metrocious parliamentarian, said, I believe, Abe, you can beat Douglas for the Senate. No, Len, I can't beat him for the Senate, but I'll make him beat himself for the presidency. Douglas did gain the prize, but he lost his chance in the presidential race by alienating the whole Southern vote. Related by Mr. Leonard Sweat, the Len above, to Mr. Augustus C. Buell. End of section 104. This recording is in the public domain. Section 105 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Tale of the Kite. Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon. The Tale of the Kite 
Congress, like the poor, is always with us. To General Grant, Grant's Memoirs. End of section 105. This recording is in the public domain. Section 106 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No Day Without a Line. Read for LibriVox.org by Logan McCammon. No Day Without a Line. I don't think much of a man not wiser today than he was yesterday. Abe Lincoln. End of section 106. This recording is in the public domain. Section 107 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Truth and the People. Read for LibriVox.org. The people are always much nearer the truth than politicians suppose. Abraham Lincoln. End of section 107. This recording is in the public domain. Section 108 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Call Me Lincoln. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. Like the friends, Abraham Lincoln had a dislike for handles to a name, and the first incurred a criticism in fastidious Washington circles by his using the last name, and not the Christian one, to familiars. To an intimate friend he appealed, Now, call me Lincoln, and I'll promise not to tell of the breach of etiquette if you won't. Ah, oh, how well he knew the vanity of great men's Horatios. And I shall have a resting spell from Mr. Lincoln. End of section 108. This recording is in the public domain. Section 109 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Eloquent Hand Read for LibriVox.org by David Fetterman The colonel of the famous Massachusetts Sixth, which fought its way through Baltimore, risen in riot, B. F. Watson, led fifty men to cleave their way through the pug uglies, vile toughs. On reporting at the Capitol, he found commanding General Scott, receiving the mayor of Baltimore, hastening to sue for this sacred soil, not being again trodden on by the ruthless foot of the Yankees. President Lincoln happened in, and, recognizing Colonel Watson, who was only second in command then, complimented him on his saving the capital, and introduced him to the company. Presuming that his quality would awe a young and amateur soldier, the unlucky mayor had the audacity to require his confirmation of his story. He said that he had dared the mob, and to shield the soldiers, marched at their head, etc. But the officer, still warm from his baptism of fire, truly replied that he could not give a certificate of character. He related how the riffraff had assailed the volunteers, wonderfully forbearing about not using their guns, and that the police and other officials had sworn that they should not pass alive, while the head and front, as he called himself, marched only a few yards, quitting on the pretext that it was too hot for him. Many times, said Colonel Watson, have I recalled the mayor's look of intense disgust, the astonishing dignity of the commanding general, and the expression, half sad, half quizzical, on the face of the president, at the evident infelicity of his introduction. If I did not leave that distinguished presence with my reputation for integrity unimpaired, the pressure of Abraham Lincoln's honest hand, as we parted, deceived me. End of section 109. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Fetterman. Section 110 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Woman. Read for LibriVox.org. 
Woman is man's best present from his maker. Abraham Lincoln. End of section 110. This recording is in the public domain. Section 111 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams To Think and to Do Well Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook To Think and to Do Well It is more than mortal to think and to do well on all occasions and subjects. This was to Senator James F. Wilson. End of section 111 this recording is in the public domain. Section 112 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Set the Trap Again. Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra. To fix extreme abolition upon Abraham Lincoln, Senator Douglas lent himself to assuring that his rival had taken part in a convention and helped pass a certain resolution. This was a fraud, as there was no such resolution passed, and Lincoln was not present. The main object of that forgery was to beat Yates and elect Harris for Congress, object known to be exceedingly dear to Judge Douglas at the time. The fraud having been apparently successful, both Harris and Douglas have more than once since then been attempting to put it to new uses. As the fisherman's wife whose drowned husband was brought home with his body full of eels, said, when asked what was to be done with him, "'Take out the eels and set em again!' Footnote, see Coleman's broad grins. So Harris and Douglas have shown a disposition to take the eels out of that stale fraud by which they gained Harris's election, and set the fraud again, more than once. Speech by A. Lincoln, Jonesboro, Illinois, September fifteenth, 1958 End of section 112. This recording is in the public domain. Section 113 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No royalty in our carriage. From August to mid-October 1858, Lincoln and Douglas warred on the platform throughout Illinois in a celebrated series of debates. As the senator was in a high position, and expected to reap yet more important honors, the Central Railroad Corporation extended to him all graces. A special car, the Pullman in embryo in reality, was at his beck, and a train for his numerous friends if he spoke. On the other hand, his rival, becoming more and more democratic in his leaning to the grotesque, gloried in travelling even in the caboose of a freight train. He had no brass bands and no canteen for all comers, on one occasion his humble freighter was sidetracked to let the palace cars sweep majestically by, a calliope playing hail to the chief, and laughter mingling with toasts shouted tauntingly through the open windows. The oppositionist laughed to his friends and said, "'The gentleman in that decorated car evidently smelled no royalty in our scow.' He scoffed at these fizzle-gigs and fireworks, to employ his phrase. But his keen sense of the ludicrous was not shared with his admirers. On the contrary, the women saw nothing absurd in drowning him with flowers, and the men in chairing him. Henry Villard relates that he saw him battling with his supporters literally, and beseeching them, who bore him shoulder-high, with his long limbs gesticulating like a spider's, for them to let me down. In another place, after Douglas had been galloped to the platform in his carriage and pair, his antagonist was hauled up in a hay-rack wagon drawn by lumbering farm-horses. End of section 113. This recording is in the public domain. Section 114 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Trap to Catch a Douglas In the course of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the former, among his friends, announced that at the next meeting he would put a settler to his contestant, and I don't care a continental which way he answers it. As he did not explain, all awaited the evening speeches for enlightenment. In the midst of Douglas's piece, Lincoln begged to be allowed a little question. The Lincolnian little questions were beginning to be rankling darts. Formally, the question was, 
can the people of a united states territory in a lawful way against the wishes of any citizen of the united states exclude slavery from its limits prior to the foundation of a state constitution in the homely way lincoln put it it ran suppose judge for judge douglas there was a new town or colony just started in some western territory and suppose there was precisely one hundred householders voters there and suppose judge that ninety-nine did not want slavery and the one did what would be done about it it was the argument about free soil and squatter sovereignty in a nutshell the wily politician strove to avoid the loop but finally admitted that on american principles the majority must rule this caused the charleston convention of eighteen sixty to split on this point and douglas lost all hope of the presidency end of section one hundred fourteen this recording is in the public domain Section 115 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Practice Before and Behind the Bar Read for LibriVox.org by Rick Rodstrom The debate between Douglas and Lincoln, while marked by speeches severe and stately, was interspersed with repartees and innuendos as might be awaited from former friends and become by double rivalry fierce enemies the senator did not disdain to stoop to casting back at lincoln's humble beginning and taunted him with having kept store and waited behind the bar before waiting before the bar judicial for his turn to practice law his adversary rose amid the laughter and rejoined what the judge judge douglas has said gentlemen is true enough i did keep a grocery and sometimes i did sell whiskey but i remember that in those days mr douglas was one of my best customers for the same but the difference between us now is that I do not practice behind the bar at present, while Mr. Douglas keeps right on before it. End of section 115. This recording is in the public domain. Section 116 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Knubial Amity Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Knubial Amity Mr. Douglas has no more thought of fighting me than fighting his wife, said during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, at a rumour that the Senator would challenge him for some personality. End of section 116 This recording is in the public domain. Section 117 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Model Whiskey Barrel. Read for LibriVox.org. During the Douglas Lincoln series of debates, the former made a jest counting upon his being president some day. He said that his father was a cooper, yet with prescience had not taught him the paternal craft, but made him a cabinet maker. His adherents, who counted on office if he won, loudly applauded. Douglas was a thick-set, rotund man, whose florid gills revealed that he was a host for boon companions. Lincoln was his antithesis, as tall, long-drawn, and somber as the cold-water man he was rated. He rose, and at once shot his shaft. I was not aware that Mr. Douglas's father was a cooper, but I doubt it not, or that he was a good one. In fact, I am certain that he has made one of the best whiskey casks I have ever seen." End of section 117. This recording is in the public domain. Section 118 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Fighting out of one coat into the other. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. 
I remember being once much amused at seeing two partially intoxicated men engaged in a fight, with their greatcoats on, which fight, after a long and rather harmless contest, ended in each having fought himself out of his own coat and into that of the other. If the two leading parties of today are really identical with the two in the days of Jefferson and Adams, they have performed the same feat as the two drunken men. Letter Declining a Jefferson Banquet Invitation Springfield, Illinois, April 6, 1859 End of section 118 This recording is in the public domain. Section 119 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Promising Face Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence The Promising Face Senator Douglas is of worldwide renown. All the anxious politicians of his party have been looking upon him as certainly, at no distant day, to be the President of the United States. They have seen in his round, jolly, fruitful face post offices, land offices, marshalships, and cabinet appointments, charge ships, and foreign missions, bursting and sprouting out in wonderful exuberance, ready to be laid hold of by their greedy hands. On the contrary, nobody has ever expected me to be president. In my poor, lean, lank face, nobody has ever seen that any cabbages were sprouting out. Speech by A. Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois, July 17, 1858. End of section 119. This recording is in the public domain. Section 120 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A House Divided Cannot Stand. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. A House Divided Cannot Stand. This often quoted passage was uttered in June, 1857, at Springfield, Illinois, during Lincoln's congressional campaign. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that this government cannot endure permanently, half slave and half free. I do not expect this house to fall. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become one thing or the other. End of section 120. This recording is in the public domain. Section 121 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Concert on Dred Scott Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Concert on Dred Scott The Supreme Court of the United States decided in a fugitive slave case, one Dred Scott, that no Negro slave could be any state citizen, that neither Congress nor a territorial organization can exclude slavery that the United States courts would not decide whether a slave in a free state becomes free, but left that to the slave-holding state courts. Lincoln, in debate with Senator Douglas, asserted that the latter, Chief Justice Taney and others, were in a league to perpetuate slavery and extend it. We cannot absolutely know, but when we see a lot of framed timbers, different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places, and by different workmen, as Stephen, Franklin, Roger and James, Douglas, President Pierce, Taney, Buchanan, and when we see these timbers joined together, and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, in such a case we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning, and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first blow was struck. The Divided House Speech June 17, 1858, Springfield, Illinois. End of section 121. This recording is in the public domain. Section 122 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Playing Cuttlefish. Read for LibriVox.org. Judge Douglas is playing cuttlefish a small species of fish that has no mode of defending itself when pursued, except by throwing out a black fluid which makes the water so dark the enemy cannot see it, and thus escapes. 
Lincoln, in Lincoln-Douglas Debate, Illinois, 1858. End of section 122. This recording is in the public domain. Section 123 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Voice from the Dead Read for LibriVox.org by Christine A Voice from the Dead Fellow citizens, my friend, Mr. Douglas, made the startling announcement today that the Whigs are dead. If that be so, you will now experience the novelty of hearing a speech from a dead man. With his arms waving like windmill sails, and his frame vibrating in every one of the seventy-five inches perpendicular, he shrilled, and I suppose you might properly say or sing in the language of the old hymn, Hark from the tombs a doleful sound. From Lincoln Douglas Debit, 1858 End of Section 123 this recording is in the public domain. Section 124 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams If I must go down, let it be linked to truth. Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder In 1856, a red-letter day in American politics, the Republican Party was organized at Bloomington, Illinois, and... After his speech at the inauguration, Abraham Lincoln was hailed as the foremost of the League throughout the West. A civil war raged, as he had foretold, in Kansas through repeal of the Missouri Compromise, and Douglas was forced to about face and actually vote, as Senator and Congress, against the very measures he advocated, with the Republicans. He sought re-election, and so believed he would allure them over to his side. At the Republican State Convention in June, however, Lincoln was the unanimous representative for Cook County, and he made the celebrated speech known as The House Divided Against Itself. This discourse had been rehearsed before his clique of friends, the men who afterward boasted that they had made the president out of the little one-horse lawyer of a little one-horse town. They agreed that it was sound and energetic, but that it would not be politic to speak it then. The Republicans were cautious, and shrank from uniting with the advanced theorists known as the abolitionists. Lincoln slowly repeated the debated passage. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I will deliver it as written. I would rather be defeated with this expression in the speech than be victorious without it. Before the persistence, the advisers again implored him to moderate the lines. It would defeat his election. It would kill the embryo party, and so on. But after silent reflection, he suddenly and warmly said, Friends, if it must be that I must go down because of this speech, then let me go down linked to truth, die, in the advocacy of what is right and just. That famous utterance of what was fermenting in the great heart of the people, and which perfect oneness with it and his own, enabled him to be the touchstone of the Satan yet disguised, cleared the sky, and all saw the battle, if not the doom, of the black stain on the United States. End of section 124. This recording is in the public domain. Section 125 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Come one, come all. Read for LibriVox.org. On his road to inauguration, Lincoln held a reception at Chicago. The autograph fiend was not prominent in the thick crowd, but still several little girls were pushed forward by their beseeching mamas, and under pretense of one gift deserving a return, gave flowers, and the spokesgirl said, as she waved a sheet of paper, Your name, Mr. President, please. But here are several other little girls— "'They come with me,' replied the little miss, with the intention of gaining her end alone. "'Oh, then, as my signature will be little among eight, more paper.' And he wrote a sentiment on each of eight sheets, and affixed his sign manual. End of section 125. This recording is in the public domain. Section 
Section 126 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Assisting the Inevitable. Read for LibriVox.org by Jordan Nelson. www.freewebs.com slash Jordan Nelson. Assisting the Inevitable. In 1854, the Missouri Compromise Bill of 1820, made to shut out the free states from the invasion of slavery, was repealed. The author of this yielding on a vital question to the pro-slavery party was Stephen A. Douglas, leader of the Democrats. He had been Lincoln's early friend, and they were rivals for the hand of the Miss Todd who wedded Lincoln, with spoken confidence and woman's astonishing art of reading men in the future, that he would attain a loftier station in the national Walhalla than his brilliant and more bewitching adversary. Indignant at this revoke in the great game of immunity which should have been played above board, the lawyer sprang forth from his family peace and studious retirement to fall or fulfill his mission in the irrepressible conflict. Lincoln delivered a speech at Springfield when the town was crammed by the spectators attending the state fair. It was rated the greatest oratorical effort of his career and demolished Douglas's political stand. The state, previously democratic, slid upon and crushed out Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska bill, and a Whig legislature was chosen. Having the senatorship in his eye, or even a dear if not a near object, Lincoln resigned the seat he won in this revolutionary house. On the other hand, a vacancy in the state senatorship at Washington falling pat, he was set up as Whig candidate. Douglas had selected General James Shields, who had married Miss Todd's sister, but was as antagonistic to his brother-in-law as Douglas himself. The fight was made triangular by the anti-Kansas Nebraska Bill Party advancing Lyman Trumbull. Although Shields was not strong enough, a substitute in Governor Matheson, a dark horse, uncommitted to either side, came within an ace of election in the ballotage. End of section 126. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Nelson, www.freewebs.com slash Jordan Nelson. Section 127 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Self Sacrifice, read for LibriVox.org. Mr. Lincoln had the finished art of the politician. He also had a magnanimous heart, ready to sacrifice all personal gain to the party. He proposed withdrawing and throwing all his supporters' votes over to Matheson, anything to beat Douglas. His friends resisted. He had distinguished himself sufficiently as a retiring man in letting Baker get the seat over his head. But he was terribly bent on this stroke of victory. He gave up the reins, and in his great self-sacrifice passionately exclaimed, "'It must be done!' He was said to be, then, a fatalist, and so vented this command as if he believed what must be must be, unlike the old doubter who said, "'No, what must be won't be.' The Douglasites could not meet this change of base, and Trumbull became senator by the Lincolnites' coalition. Lincoln publicly disavowed any such formal compact. End of section 127. This recording is in the public domain. Section 128 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A Fight Proves Nothing. Stung by the repetition here in the West by Horace Greeley's quip upon Douglas, whose trimming lost him supporters, he is like the man's pig which did not weigh as much as he expected, and he always knew he wouldn't, a partisan of the senators wanted to challenge Lincoln. The latter declared that he would not fight Judge Douglas or his second. In the first place, a fight would prove nothing in issue in this contest. If my fighting Judge Douglas would not prove anything, it would prove nothing for me to fight his bottle-holder. It is to be borne in mind that the senator had a high reputation as a convivial host, and the toady was believed to be his familiar, the bottle imp. End of section 128. This recording is in the public domain. Section 129 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Win the fight or die a tryin read for LibriVox.org. Though Douglas had his misgivings from knowing Lincoln is the ablest of the Republican Party, he was forced, by his standing and the pressure of his less dubious followers, to accept the oratorical challenge of the other. 
the trumpeteers at once boasted the little giant could make small feed of the animated rail fence. Lincoln said on the subject to Judge Beckwith of Danville on the eve, "'You have seen two men about to fight? Well, one of them brags about what he means to do. The other fellow, he says not a word. He is saving his wind for the fight, and as sure as it comes off he will win it, or die a tryin. End of section 129. This recording is in the public domain. Section 130 of the Lincoln Story Book by Henry L. Williams. Pills to Purge Melancholy. Read for LibriVox.org by Morgan Dowtrick. Pills to Purge Melancholy. The puritanic and classically sedate critics blamed the president for finding recreation in reading and hearing comic tales used to illustrate grave texts. He said to a congressman who brought up the censure at a time when the country was profoundly harried, Were it not for this occasional vent, I should die. End of section 130. This recording is in the public domain. Section 131 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Down to the Raisins. Read for LibriVox.org. It was the regular habit of President Lincoln to read the day's telegrams in order in the flimsy triplicates. They were kept in a drawer at the White House telegraph office. As he handled the papers almost solely, each edition would come to be placed on the last lot of the foregoing day. When this was attained, he would say with a sigh, There, I've got down to the raisins. It was due to the story, which amused him, of the countryman. This tourist entered a fashionable restaurant, and on viewing the long menu, and concluding that all the dishes were for the customer at the fixed price, manfully called for each in turn. When he arrived at the last line, he sighed in relief, and cried, Thanks be! I have got down to the raisins! End of section 131. This recording is in the public domain. Section 132 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Giant and Giant Killer. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Giant and Giant Killer. As Stephen A. Douglas, from his concentrated force and limited height, was nicknamed the Little Giant, his opponent, the elongated Lincoln, was dubbed the Giant Killer. End of section 132. This recording is in the public domain. Section 133 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Sentiments on a Moot Point. Read for LibriVox.org. The President's reply to an autograph fiend who sought his signature, appended to a sentiment, was, Dear Madam, when you ask a stranger for that which is of interest only to yourself, always enclose a stamp. End of section 133. This recording is in the public domain. Section 134 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Chestnuts under a sycamore. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Chestnuts under a sycamore. The President, on his way to the Department of War, perceived a gentleman under a tree, scraping among the heap leaves with his cane. He knew him, a Major Johnson, of the Department, an old District of Columbia man who had never been out of the District. "'Good morning, Major,' hailed the Executive Officer. "'What in the world are you doing there?' Eh, "'Looking for a few horse chestnuts.' "'Hey, do you expect to find them under a sycamore tree?' The president laughed freely and passed on. He ought to have removed the misguided botanist into the Department of Agriculture, where he might have learned something. End of section 134. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, December 2008. Section 135 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Still of Little Note. Read for LibriVox.org. 
On hearing that a man had been arrested in Philadelphia for trying to procure fifteen hundred dollars by forgery of Lincoln's name, he humorously said, "'It is surprising that any man could get the money.' The secretary pointed out that use might have been made of a signature given to a stranger as an autograph on a blank paper, the body of which had been improperly filled up as a note. "'Well,' answered the President, then, as to interfering, "'I don't see but that he will have to sit on the blister bench.' End of section 135. This recording is in the public domain. Section 136 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Tree Toad in Timotheus. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. The Tree Toad in Timotheus. In the early days when Abraham Lincoln went with his pioneer father to settle in wild Indiana, the chief diversion of the rude inhabitants was from the preaching of the traveling pastors. They were singular devotees whose sincerity redeemed all their flaws of ignorance, illiteracy, and violence. Abraham, with his inherent proneness toward imitation of oratory, used to take them off to the hilarity of the laboring men who formed his first audiences. Out of his recollections came this tale, which he liked to act out with all the quaint tones and gestures the subject demanded. The itinerant ranters held out at a schoolhouse near Lincoln's cabin, but in fine weather preferred the academy, as the Platoists would say, what was left of an oak grove, only one tree being spared, making a pulpit with leafy canopy for the exhorter. This man was a hard-shell Baptist, commonly imperturbable to outside signs and doings when the spirit moved him. His demeanor was rigid and his action angular and restricted. He wore the general attire, coonskin cap or beaver hat, hickory-dyed shirt, breeches loose and held up by plugs or makeshift buttons, as our ancestors attached undergarments to the upper ones by laces and points. The shirt was held by one button in the collar. This dress little mattered, as the leaf screen woven for the occasion hid the lower part of his frame and left the protruding head visible as he leaned forward, standing on a log rolled up for the platform. He gave out the text from Corinthians. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the law. The following runs, let no man despise him, etc. As he began his speech, a tree toad that had dropped down out of the tree thought to return to its outlook to see if rain was coming. As the shortest cut, it took the man as a post. Scrambling over his yawning, untanned ankle jack boots, it slipped under the equally yawning blue jeans. He commenced to scale the legs as the preacher became conscious of the invasion. So while spooning out the text, he made a grab at the creature, which might be a centipede for all he knew. And then, as it ascended, and his voice ascended a note or two, with the words, Be without fear, he slapped still higher. Then still speaking, but fearsomely animated, he clutched frantically, but always a lethal behindhand, at the unknown monster which now reached the imprisoning neckband. Here he tore at the button, the divine, not the newt, and broke it free. As he finally yelled, sticking to the sermon as to the hunt, worketh the work of the law. An old dame in among the amazed congregation rose and shrieked out, Well, if you represent Timotheus, and that is working for the law, then I'm done with the apostles. End of section 136. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, December 19, 2008. Section 137 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams If it will do the President good. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook If it will do the President good. G. H. Stewart, Chief of the Christian Commission, was a Bible distributor during the war. The organization had a special soldier's Bible called the Cromwell One, whose mixture of warrior and preacher seemed to couple him with Abraham Lincoln. The soldiers usually accepted a copy without pressing, though some said they preferred a cracker. 
but one man a philadelphian like stuart himself rejected the offer among the colporteur's arguments however was one that overcame him i'll tell you that i commenced my tract distribution at the white house and the first person i offered one to was abraham lincoln he took it and promised to read it i'll take one promptly cried the man if the president thought it would do him good it won't hurt me End of section 137. This recording is in the public domain. Section 138 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Grounds for a Financial Estimate. Read for LibriVox.org. When the mercantile agencies were young, they acquired a consensus of opinion upon a business man by annoying his acquaintances with inquiries. One such house queried of Lincoln about one of his neighbors. His reply was a smart burlesque on the basis on which they rated their registered listed. I am well acquainted with Mr. X, and I know his circumstances. First of all, he has a wife and baby. Together, they ought to be worth fifty thousand dollars to any man. Secondly, he has an office in which there is a table worth a dollar fifty, and three chairs worth, say, a dollar. Last of all, there is in one corner a large rat-hole, which will bear looking into. Respectfully, etc. End of section 138. This recording is in the public domain. Section 139 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams I wanted to see them spread. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook I wanted to see them spread. It is related that the ushers and secret service officials on duty at the executive mansion during the war were prone to congregate in a little ante-room and exchange reminiscences. This was directly against instructions by the President. One night the garden ushers were gathered in the little room talking things over, when suddenly the door opened, and there stood President Lincoln, his shoes in his hand. All the crowd scattered, save one privileged individual, the usher Pendle, of the President's own appointment, as he had been kind to the Lincoln children. The intruder shook his finger at him, and with assumed ferocity growled, Pendle, you people remind me of the boy who set a hen on forty-three eggs. How is that, Mr. President? asked Pendle. A youngster put forty-three eggs under a hen, and then rushed in and told his mother what he had done. But a hen can't sit on forty-three eggs, replied the mother. No, I guess she can't, but I just wanted to see her spread herself. That's what I wanted to see you boys do when I came in, said the President, as he left for his apartment. By Thomas Pendle, still usher in 1900. End of section 139. This recording is in the public domain. Section 140 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Lincoln Non Sequitur. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell. The Lincoln Non Sequitur. Though a Democrat, member of Congress John Ganson of New York supported the President, and he thought himself entitled to enjoy what no one had surprised or captured, the confidence of Abraham's bosom, as was the current phrase. He, calling, insisted that he ought to know the true situation of things military and political, so that he might justify himself among his friends. Ganson was bald as an egg, and the most clean-shaven of men. The northern Nero eyed the presumptuous satrap fixedly and drawled, "'Ganson, how clean you shave!' He had escaped another inquisition by his close shave. Told by Senator C. M. Depew. End of section 140. This recording is in the public domain. Section 141 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Why so many common people? Read for LibriVox.org. Like another Daniel, Lincoln interpreted dreams. He said that he had one in this guise. 
he imagined he was in a great assemblage like one of his receptions multiplied. The mass described a hedge to let him pass. He thought that he heard one of them remark, "'That is a common-looking fellow,' to whom Lincoln replied, still in the dream, "'Friend, the Lord loves common-looking people. That is why he made so many of them.'" Note. Another current saying substitutes the poor for common. End of section 141. This recording is in the public domain. Section 142 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Envy of a Humorist. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Envy of a Humorist. It is difficult for the present generation to perceive the streak of fun in the Petroleum versus Nasby papers, which regaled our grandfathers and Mr. Lincoln above others, who waited eagerly for the next letter in the press. He requested the presentation of the author, John Locke, and thanked him face to face. Neither like the augurs able to keep his face for such antidotes to the blues. He said to a friend of the postmaster at Confederate X Roads, if Petroleum would impart his talent to me, I would swap places with him. End of section 142. This recording is in the public domain. Section 143 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Stopper on Journalistic Gas. Read for LibriVox.org by Rick Rodstrom. Having examined a model cannon devised not to allow the escape of gas, he quizzically glanced at the group of newspaper reporters and said, I really believe this does what it is represented to do. But do any of you know of any machine or invention for preventing the escape of gas from newspaper establishments? End of section 143. This recording is in the public domain. Section 144 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Salt Before Pepper. Read for LibriVox.org. The cabinet, being assembled in September 1862, to consider the first draft of the Emancipation Act, those not yet familiar with the chairman's habit to supply a wet before the main dish, were startled that he should preface the business by reading the New York paper, Vanity Fair, continuing the series of Artemis Ward's tour with his show. This paper was the high-handed outrage at Utica. He laughed his fill over it, while the grave seniors frowned and yet struggled to keep their countenances. If they'd had more experience, they would have heard him read Josh Billings, particularly on the mule, from the New York weekly columns. It was as good as a play, the stenographer said, to see the president dart a glance over his spectacle rims at some demure counsellor, whose mole-like machinations were more than suspected, and with mock solemnity declaim, I have known a mule to be good for six months just to get a chance to kick its owner, in allusion to those remarkable feats of arms and legs, Early's or Stewart's raids, and Jackson's forced rapid marches, almost at horse speed, when the men carried no rations, but ate corn ears taken from the shucks, and roasted them at their pipes. The drawl ruler would bring in that mule again. If you want to find a mule in a lot, you must turn him into the one next to it. Only the rebel fly-by-nights were more like the Irishman's flea. When you put your hand on him, he was not there. End of section 144. This recording is in the public domain. Section 145 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Matching Stories Read for LibriVox.org by Christine Matching Stories The president looking in at the telegraph room in the White House happened to find Major Eckert in. He saw he was counting greenbacks, so he said jokingly, I believe you never come to business now but to handle money. The officer pleaded that it was a mere coincidence and instanced a story in point. A certain tailor in Mansfield, Ohio, 
was very stylish in dress and airy in manner. Passing a storekeeper's door one day, the latter puffed himself up and emitted a long blow, expressive of the inflation to oozing point of the consated tailor, who indignantly turned and said, I will teach you to blow when I am passing, to which the storekeeper replied, and I'll teach you not to pass when I'm blowing. Very good, returned the hearer. That is very like a story I heard of a man driving about the country in an open buggy, caught at night by a pouring rain. Passing a farmhouse, a man, apparently struggling with the effects of whiskey, thrust his head out of a window and shouted loudly, Hello! The traveler stopped for all of his hurry for shelter and asked what was wanted. "'Nothing of you,' was the blunt reply. "'Well, what in the infernals are you shouting hello for when people are passing?' angrily asked the traveller. "'Well, what in the infernals are you passing for when people are shouting hello?' The rival storytellers parted at events. End of section 145 This recording is in the public domain. Section 146 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Only Discredit. Read for LibriVox.org. A backhanded compliment of the acutest nature is credited to Lincoln as a lawyer and a gentleman. A Major Hill accused him of maligning Mrs. Hill, upon which Lincoln denied the accusation and apologized with whitewash, which blacked the bystander. I entertain the highest regard for Mrs. Hill, and the only thing I know to her discredit is that she is Major Hill's wife. End of section 146. This recording is in the public domain. Section 147 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No reliance on them. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. No reliance on them. Mrs. Secretary Wells more susceptible about press attacks on her idol, and everybody in Washington officialdom's idol, the President, called attention to fresh quips and innuendos. Pshaw! Let pass! The papers are not always reliable. That is to say, Mrs. Wells, interposed the object of the missiles, they lie, and then they rely. End of section 147. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, December 14, 2008. Section 148 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No Vices, Few Virtues. Read for LibriVox.org. Someone was smoking in the presence of the President, and had complimented him on having no vices, such as drinking or smoking. "'That is a doubtful compliment,' said the host. "'I recollect being once outside a coach in Illinois, "'and a man sitting beside me offered me a cigar. "'I told him I had no vices. "'He said nothing, smoked for some time, and then grunted out, "'It's my experience that folks who have no vices "'have plaguey few virtues. "'Mrs. General Lander, Miss Jean Davenport of Stage Life, "'the original of Dickens's Miss Crummies, "'must have heard this in the presidential circle, "'for she would say, if a man has no petty vices, he has great ones. A later version ascribes the reproof to a brother Kentuckian, also a stage companion, variation sufficient to prove the happening. End of section 148. This recording is in the public domain. Section 149 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams the apples of his eye read for librivox dot org by magdalena cook the apples of his eye up in the state out of my way says the narrator there was a farmer in the days when his sort were not called agriculturists he kept an orchard at the same time without being called a horticulturist he was just another kind of johnny appleseed for he doted on apples and used to beg slips and seeds of any new variety until he had one hundred and eighty-two trees in his big orchard i have counted them and longed for them early mid and late harvest 
He fit off the bug and the blight and the worm like a wizard. If there was one anything save his orchard he doted upon, it was his daughter of his, her name being Rose, and all that you can cram of lush and bright red and rosy posy nicety into that name. And yet he hankered much on the latest addition to his garden, a New York State apple, as he sent for and tended to at a great outlay of time anyway. This here daughter and that there apple tree were his delights. You might say the rose and the baldwin, that were the brand of the fruit, were the apples of his two eyes. Well, there were two men around there who cast sheep's eyes, not to say wolfish ones, at the fruit and the girl. They both expected to have the other by getting the one. Well, one of those days the pair of young fellows lounged along and kind of propped up the old man's fence around the orchard. They was looking out of the tail of the eye more for the rose than the other thing in the garden, but they could not help spying the Baldwin. It was the off year anyhow for apples, and this here one being first in fruiting had been spared in but one blossom, and so the old man cared for it with prodigious love. As mostly comes to pass with special fruit, this one being petted, throve, well, you have no idea how an apple tender to can thrive. It was big and red and mellow. Well, one of the fellows being the cutest, he saw the other had his cane with him and was sparing a windfall every now and then, and seeing how close he could come to flipping the ears of a hog wallering down the lane, or mayhap a horse looking over the paddock fence. Then a notion struck him. Lem, said he, for the rival's name was Lem, for Lemuel. Lem, he says, I bet you a dollar you can't fire at that lone apple and knock it off the stem. A dollar coin. But they were talking in coonskins them times. So Lem, he takes the bet, and sticking an apple on the switch, sends it kiting with such accuracy of aim that it plumps the Baldwin ka-chung in the plum centre, and away fly both apples. Then, while he grabbed the dollar, the girl and the old soul came out, and the old soul saw the pet apple rolling half-dented at his feet, and the girl ran between him and the two men. But the fellow who was such a good shot... He sees a little too late what he had lost for a dollar, and he scooted, with the old man invoking all the cusses of Herod against him. The other fellow, he opened the gate as bold as a brazen calf, and said, anticipating the old man, Oh, I don't come for apples. I want to spark your daughter. End of section 149. This recording is in the public domain. Section 150 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Whetstone Story Abraham Lincoln was not given to boasting, but he did pride himself on his gift of memory of faces. It included all sorts of things. Among the soldiers calling at the White House was one from his section. He knew him at sight, used his name, and said, You used to live on the Danville Road. I took dinner with you one time I was running for the legislature. I recollect that we stood talking together out at the barnyard gate while I sharpened my jackknife on your whetstone. So you did, drawled the volunteer, delighted. But say, whatever did you do with that stone? I looked for it more'n a thousand times, but I never could find it after the day you used it. We allowed that maybe you took it along with you. No, replied the presumed purloiner seriously. I sought it on the top of the gate post, the high one. Thunder! Likely enough you did. Nobody else couldn't have boosted it up there, and we never thought to look there for it. When the soldier was allowed to go home, the first thing he did was to look up to that stone. Surely enough, it was on the gate post top. It had lain there fifteen years, since the electioneerer had stuck it there as easily as one might place it on a table. End of section 150. This recording is in the public domain. Section 151 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams, The Monarch of All He Surveyed, read for LibriVox.org. Lincoln's coquetting with the science of Gunter, jack of all trades that he was, empowered him to perpetuate a fine pun on the United States Surveyor General in California, General Beale. This official acquired in his course so much real estate of the first quality that on a reference being made to it in the President's hearing, he observed, Yes, they say Beale is monarch of all he surveyed. New York Herald. End of section 151. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 152 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Men have faults like horses. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Men have faults like horses. While riding between court towns, Menard and Fulton counties, Illinois, Lincoln rode knee to knee with an old settler who admitted he was going to Lewiston to have some lawing out with a neighbor, also an old timer. The young practitioner already preached as a motto that there would always be litigation enough, and again exerted to throw oil on the riled water. Why, Uncle Tommy, this neighbor has been a tolerable neighbor to you nigh unto fifteen year, and you get along in hunk part of the time, don't he? The rank and tankerous man admitted as such. Well, now, you see this nag o' mine? He isn't as good a horse as I want to straddle, and I sometimes get out of patience with him but I know his faults as well as his pints. He goes fairly well as hosses go, and it might take me a long while to get used to another hosses' faults. For like men, all hosses have faults. You and Uncle Jimmy ought to put up with each other as man and his steed put up with one another, see? I reckon you are about right, Abe. And he went on to town, but not to law. End of section 152 this recording is in the public domain. Recorded by David Lawrence, December 15, 2008, in Brampton, Ontario. Section 153 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Puns on Proper Names. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Lincoln's puns on proper names. Though as far back as Dr. Johnson, punning was regarded as obsolete, it was still prevalent in the United States, and so up to a late date. Mr. Lincoln was addicted to it. Mr. Frank B. Carpenter was some six months at the presidential mansion engaged on the historical painting of the President and the Cabinet signing of the Emancipation Act, when the joke passed that he had come in there a carpenter and would go out a cabinet maker. An usher repeated it as from the fountainhead of witticism there. At a reception, a gentleman addressed him, saying, I presume, Mr. President, you have forgotten me. No, your name is Flood. I saw you last, twelve years ago, at... I'm glad to see that the flood still goes on. The draft rights in New York, mid-July 1863, had, at the bottom, not reluctance to join the army, but a belief among the Democrats, notably the Irish Americans, that the drawers were manipulated in favour of letting off the sons of Republicans. However, the Irish were prominent in resistance. The President said... General Kilpatrick is going to New York to put down the riots, but his name has nothing to do with it. In 1856, Lincoln was prosecuting one Spencer for slander. Spencer and a Portuguese dungy had married sisters and were at odds. Spencer called the dark complexion foreigner a nigger, and further said he had married a white woman, a crime in Illinois at that era. On the defence were Lawrence Weldon and C. H. Moore. Lincoln was teasled as the court sustained a demurrer about his papers being deficient. So he began his address to the jury. My client is not a Negro, though it is no crime to be a Negro, no crime to be born with a black skin. But my client is not a Negro. His skin may not be as white as ours, but I say he is not a Negro, though he may be a Moor, looking at the hostile lawyer. His speech was so winning that he recovered heavy damages, but being a family quarrel, this was arranged between the two. Mr. Weldon says that he feared Mr. Lincoln would win, as he had said with unusual vehemence, Now by Jing, I will beat you boys. By Jing, Jingo, St. Gingolphus, was the extent of his expletives. Byron found a St. Gingo shrine in his alpine travels. On paying the cost, Lincoln left his fee to be fixed by the opposing pair of lawyers, saying, Don't you think I have honestly earned twenty-five dollars? They expected a hundred, for he had attended two terms, spent two days, and the money came out of the enemy's coffer. End of section 153. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 154 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not so easy to get into prison. Read for LibriVox.org. William Lloyd Garrison, the premier abolitionist, was imprisoned in Baltimore for his extreme utterances when a stronghold of the pro-slavery party. After the war he visited the regenerated city, and for curiosity sought unavailingly the jail where he had been confined. On hearing the fruitlessness of his quest, the President said, "'Well, Mr. Garrison, when you first went to Baltimore you could not get out of prison, but this second time you could not get in.'" End of section 154. This recording is in the public domain. Section 155 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Them Three Fellers Again. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Them Three Fellers Again. The gamut of possible atrocities in connection with fulfillment of the threats of succession being run through the rumors became stale and flat. Lincoln, receiving one deputation of alarmists with considerable calm, no doubt thought to excuse it by saying, That reminds me of the story of the schoolboy. He found great difficulty in pronouncing the names of the three children in the fiery furnace. Yet his teacher had drilled him thoroughly in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so that one day he purposely took the same lesson in Bible reading and managed to have the boy read the passages containing those names again. As the dull pupil came to them, he stopped, looked up and said, Teacher, there's them three fellers again. End of section 155. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, December 14, 2008. Section 156 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln the Great and Lincoln the Little. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon. In 1856, the new Republican Party tested its strength by offering a ticket. General Fremont, popular through his invasion of California and Rocky Mountain exploration, was selected as the presidential nominee, with Dayton as vice. But during the balloting, Lincoln was opposed to the latter and received over a hundred votes. This news was dispatched to Illinois as a compliment to her favorite son. But on going to congratulate our Lincoln, the deputation found him easy and incredulous on the felicitation. "'You are barking up the wrong tree, neighbors,' he said gravely. "'That must be the great Lincoln of Massachusetts.' There was a Levi Lincoln, to whom he had been introduced as a form and as a kinsman of the Massachusetts Lincolns. So the namesake's mistake in modesty was pardonable in one who studied the train of politics most thoroughly since he had said he would be President of these United States. It was in his teens, but the saying is common property of young America, and it is more notable that before he left Indiana, and early in his new and unalterable one in Illinois, his astounded admirers prophesied the same goal. It is a fact that his own hand proves that in 1854 he says, I have really got it into my head to be United States Senator. Footnote. Nevertheless, a friend, Speed or Herndon, says a year or two later that Lincoln had no more founded idea that he would be president than Emperor of China it may be permitted to believe that no man is a confidant of his valet or friend. Letter to Joseph Gillespie, preserved in Missouri Historical Society Library. End of section 156. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 3, 2009. Section 157 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Go thou and do likewise. Read for LibriVox.org. Lord Lyons was the British ambassador at Washington when the Prince of Wales, now King Edward, was betrothed to the Princess Alexandra of Denmark, since Queen Regent of England. He used the most stilted, ornate, and diplomatic language to carry the simple fact. 
The President replied offhand with trenchant advice to the bearer, who was unmarried, "'Go thou, and do likewise.' This did not alter the amity existing between the two, for Lincoln so won upon the envoy that he notified his premier, Lord Russell, at a critical instant when England and France were expected to combine to raise the southern blockade, that it was wrong to prepare the American government for recognition of the Confederacy. As for the Russian alliance with the powers, that was a fable, since the Tsar had sent a fleet to New York, where the Admiral had sealed orders to report to President Lincoln, in case the European allies declared war. In consequence of Lord Lyons opposing the English move, he had to resign. A later account in Mallet's Shifting Scenes. End of section 157. This recording is in the public domain. Section 158 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Is the world going to follow that comet off? Read for LibriVox.org by Andy in Vernon, Scotland Two gentlemen going by stagecoach from Derot to Indianapolis in 1858 found one part of the vehicle occupied fully by a tall, countrified person, in a cheap hat, and without coat or vest, but a farm roundabout. They had to wake him up, but he was civil and polite enough in his unkempt way. They thought he would be a good butt for play, as educated folk were uncommon out there in 1847 and considered the untaught as their legitimate prey. So they bombarded the poor bumpkin with wordy pyrotechnics, at which the stranger bewilderingly added his laugh, and finally was emboldened to ask what would be the upshot of this here comet business. The comet was the talk, especially in the evening of the world as it was taken to forerun disasters. If the editor remembers aright, it was sword shape, that pretends war. The intelligent jesters answered him to confuse still more, and left him at Indianapolis. One of the two travellers was Judge Abram Hammond, and his companion who tells the story, Thomas H. Nelson of Terot, the latter, coming down after preening up, found a brilliant group of lights of the law in the main room. They were judges and luminaries of the bar. But who should be the centre of the galaxy but the uncouth fellow traveller? All were so interested in the story he was telling that Mr. Nelson could, unnoticed, inquire of the laughing landlord as to the entertainer of these wits. Abraham Lincoln of Sangamonvale, RMC. He was so stupefied that, on recovery, he hurried upstairs and got Hammond to Levant with him. But he was not to remain unpunished. Years after, when Hammond was governor of the state, and he to become minister to Chile, Nelson was at the same hotel Browning's at the capital, when looking over at the party, welcoming and accompanying the president-elect to Washington, he saw a long arm reached out to his shoulder. A shrill voice pierced his ear. Hello, Nelson. Do you think, after all, the whole world is going to follow that darned comet? Footnote Donati's comment off. The words were Nelson's own in reply to the supposed Rubens question in the stagecoach twelve years before. No joke of a memory, that, for a joke. End of section 158. Recording by Andy from Inverarn, Scotland. M-A-L-Y-S dot W-S. Section 159 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. 
A Good Listener Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon The invidious who would themselves get a word in accused Lincoln of monopolizing the conversation where he wished to reign supreme. This is contradicted in several instances. Rather, his confraternity described their meetings as swapping stories, the flow circulating. Mr. Bowen pictures Lincoln as getting up half-dressed after a speech at Hartford in his hotel bedroom at Mr. Trumbull of Stonington rapping at the door. Trumbull had just thought of another story I want to tell you, and the tired guest sat up till three in the morning, exchanging stories. This does not resemble monopoly. A clerk, Littlefield, in the Lincoln Herndon office, prepared a speech and said to his senior employer, It is important that I get this speech correct, because I think you are going to be the presidential candidate. I told him I would like to read it to him. He consented, sitting down in one corner of the room with his feet on a chair in front of him. Now, he said, in his hearty way, fire away, John. I think I can stand it. As I proceeded, he became quite enthusiastic, exclaiming, You are hitting the nail on the head. He broke out several times in this way, finally saying, That is going to go. It did go, as the fellow clerk, Ellsworth, of Chicago Zouave's fame, borrowed it and it disappeared. Wads for his revolver, perhaps. End of section 159. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 3, 2009. Section 160 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Carried the post matter in his hat. Read for LibriVox.org. It is to Abraham Lincoln it is fastened the joke that, as postmaster, he carried the mail in his hat. This was at New Salem, postmaster of which he was appointed by President Jackson, as he was the best qualified of any of the Burgesses. Indeed, he often had to read letters to their ignorant receivers, and habitually acted as town clerk in reading out newspapers for general good on the stoop. End of section 160. This recording is in the public domain. Section 161 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. President Lincoln dubbed them the Wide Awakes. Read for LibriVox.org by Cagliostro. In looking over the illustrated newspapers of the war, one may find drawn the processions anterior to elections of the various political parties. Gradually, the lines, at first only uniform in certain organizations, became regular as a body. The Republicans at Rich Hartford, having funds for the purpose, formed the corps of three or four hundred young men. They drilled to march creditably, assumed a kind of uniform, a cape to shed sparks and oil from the torches, and swinging lamps carried, and a hat, proof also to fire, water and missiles. In March 1860, Mr. Lincoln paid a visit to the college city to speak at the old city hall. He was introduced as one who had done yeoman service for the young party, the Republican. The word yeoman was understood in the old English sense of the small independent farmers. Old Tom Lincoln's boy came into this class. He assented to it and even lowered the level by presenting himself as a hard worker in the cause. A dirty shirt of the body. After the meeting, the marchers surrounded the speaker's public carriage to escort him to the mayor's house. His introducer was Sill, later lieutenant governor of the state. To him, the guest observed on the ride, Those boys are wide awake. Suppose they were seeking a name. We call them the Wide Awakes. The name was enthusiastically adopted. The white felt hat, with one flap turned up, was called the wide awake. But the election marchers did not wear them at all, 
Lincoln had added a new word to the language. End of section 161. This recording is in the public domain. Section 162 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Trust to the Old Blue Sock. Read for LibriVox.org by Capnallegra. Several incidents in Lincoln's early career earned him the title of Honest, confirmed by his uncommon conduct as a lawyer. Footnote, the Honest Lawyer. It is said that he was amused by the conjunction, which he observed, to an adviser who turned him into the legal field, was rather a novelty. He thought of the story of the countryman who saw a stranger by the god's acre, staring at a gravestone, without, however, any emotion on his face to betray he was a murner. On the contrary, the man wore a puzzled smile, which piqued him to inquire the cause. "'Relative of yours?' asked the native. "'No, not at all, except through Adam. But,' reading the epitaph, "'X, an honest man and a lawyer. Why, how did they come to bury those two men in one grave?' But a principal event was in connection with this postmastership. It was in 1833. After renouncing the position, he removed to Springfield to take up the study of the law. An agent from the post office department called on him to settle his accounts. Through some oversight, he had been left undisturbed for some years. He was living with a Mr. Henry, who kept a store, anterior to his lodging in Mr. Speed's double-bedded room. As he was poverty-stricken and had been so since quitting home, Mr. Henry, hearing that a matter of fifteen or twenty dollars was due the government, was about to loan it, when Lincoln, not at all disquieted, excused himself to the man from headquarters to go over to his boarding house. Usually, when a debtor thus eclipses himself, the official expects to learn he is a defaulter and has taken French leave, as we say on the border. But the ex-postmaster immediately came over and, producing an old blue woolen sock, such as field hands wore, poured out coin, copper, and silver, to the exact amount of the debit. Much as the poor adventurer needed cash in the interval, the temptation had not even struck him to use the trust, the government funds. He said to partner Herndon he had promised his mother never to use another's money. End of section 162. This recording is in the public domain. Section 163 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. If all failed, he could go back to the old trade. Read for LibriVox.org. The Illinois Republican State Convention of 1860 met at Decatur, in a wigwam built for the purpose, a type of that noted in the Lincoln Annals as at Chicago. A special welcome was given to Abraham Lincoln as a distinguished citizen of Illinois, and one she would ever be delighted to honor. The session was suddenly interrupted by the chairman, saying, "'There is an old Democrat outside who has something to present to the convention.' The present was two old fence-rails, carried on the shoulder of an elderly man, recognized by Lincoln as his cousin, John Hanks, and by the Sangamon folks as an old settler in the bottoms. The rails were explained by a banner reading, two rails from a lot made by Abraham Lincoln and John Hanks, in the Sangamon Bottom, in the year 1830.' Thunderous cheers for the rail-splitter resounded, for this slur on the statesman had recoiled on aspersers and was used as a title of honour. The call for confirmation of the assertion led Lincoln to rise, and blushing, so recorded, said, "'Gentlemen, I suppose you want to know something about those things. Well, the truth is, John and I did make rails in the Sangamon Bottom.' He eyed the wood with the knowingness of an authority on stumpage, and added, "'I don't know whether we made those rails or not. The fact is, I don't think they are a credit to the makers. It was John Hanks's turn to blush. But I do know this. I made rails then, and I think I could make better ones now. Whereupon, by acclamation, Abraham Lincoln was declared to be first choice of the Republican Party in Illinois for the presidency. Riding a man in on a rail became of different and honorable meaning from that out. This incident was a prepared theatrical effect. Governor Oglesby arranged with Lincoln's stepbrother, John D. Johnson, to provide two rails, and, with Lincoln's mother's cousin, Dennis Hanks, for the latter to bring in the rails at the telling juncture. 
Lincoln's guarded manner about identifying the rails and sly slap at his ability to make better ones show that he was in the scheme through recognizing that the dodge was of value politically. Confirmed by several present, notably by Missouri Congressman John Davis, who was taking notes, and by the present speaker, Joseph Cannon, also a gentleman from Illinois. He was at this meeting and saw Lincoln standing on the platform, between the rails he split. He thought then that the orator's years of hard work and close study told on him, and that serious illness impended. It may be added, as a link with the past, that on hearing, Lincoln and Douglas in their debates, his courage and hopes as to advance through public speaking fell, yet he was state attorney. End of section 163. This recording is in the public domain. Section 164 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams As a Light Porter One morning when lawyer Lincoln was walking from his house to the State House at Springfield, he spied a child weeping at a gate. The girl had been promised a trip by the railroad cars for the first time. All was arranged for her to meet another little companion and travel with her, but she was detained from getting out for the station as no one was about to carry her trunk. She drew the conclusion that she must lose her train, and she burst into fresh tears. The box in question was a toy casket proportionate to her size. Lincoln smiled, and that almost dismissed her tears, if not her fears. They were immediately dispelled, however, by his cheerily crying out, "'Is that all? Poo poo Dry your eyes and step out!' He reached over the fence and lifted clear across to him the trunk. He raised it on his shoulder with the other hand, crossing as a corn bag is carried. He grabbed her by the hand just as the tooting of the train whistle was heard in the mid-distance. So half-lugging her, the pair hurried along to the depot, reaching it as the cars rolled in and pulled up. He put her on the car, kissed her, and cheered her off with, now have a real good time with your auntie. Always wanting to relieve somebody of a burden, you see. End of section 164. This recording is in the public domain. Section 165 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams whiskered to please the ladies and get votes read for LibriVox.org. as mr lincoln was utterly unknown in the east the engineers of his campaign for president planned to have him make himself liked by a tour of the middle and northern states to lessen the impression from one unprepossessing an aspect some fixing up was compulsory the journalist stephen fisk recites that on arriving at new york mrs lincoln a sort of valet for the trip had handbag of toilet essentials, and that she brushed his hair and arranged that snaky black necktie of his, which would twist up and play the shoestring in five minutes after adjustment. But it was not she, as thought, who coaxed him into making the lower part of his features become cavernous as strong feeling surged upon him. He revealed the source of the improvement. Two young ladies in Buffalo wrote me that they wanted their fathers and sweethearts to vote for me, but I was so homely-looking that the men refused. The lady said that if I would only grow whiskers, what were called weepers, or the Lord Dundreary mode, was popular, it would improve my appearance, and I would get four more votes. I grew the whiskers. In the Lincoln iconology, his pictures before and after the whiskers is a distinction. End of section 165. This recording is in the public domain. Section 166 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams After Votes Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook After Votes Lincoln had become the readiest of public speakers by his long experience, so it was matter for surprise that he, famed for rapid repartee, should have refrained from taking any notice of an interrupter whose shout could have been turned on him. So thought a friend on the platform. Why don't you answer him? I'm after votes, and that man's is as good as any other man's, replied Mr. Lincoln. The Honourable Mr. Palmer says off above, Mr. Lincoln told me this. 
End of section 166. This recording is in the public domain. Section 167 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Highwayman's Non Sicketer. Read for LibriVox.org. But you will not abide the election of a Republican president. In that supposed event, you say you will destroy the Union, and then, you say, the great crime of having destroyed it will be upon us. That is cool. A highwayman holds a pistol to my ear, and mutters through his teeth, Stand and deliver, or I shall kill you, and then you will be a murderer. Speech, New York City, February 27, 1860. End of section 167. This recording is in the public domain. Section 168 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. How to get men to vote. Read for LibriVox.org by Cagliostro. Let them go on with their holdings, political opponents. They will succeed when, by slandering women, you get them to love you, or by slandering men, you get them to vote for you. End of section 161. This recording is in the public domain. Section 170 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Loose a jug, the handle all one side Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Loose a jug, the handle all one side Lincoln's intimates thought it remarkable that he should keep his finger on the political poles and show himself as a fully cognizant of the trend of popular feeling. Oddly enough, the professional politicians themselves would not own that he was a king among them, though Douglas affirmed him to be in his time the most able man in the Republican Party. On clashing returns coming in, he humorously remarked on two reports. If that is the way doubtful districts are coming in, I will not stop to hear from the certain ones, he observed to Alexander H. Rice, then up for Congress in Massachusetts. Your district is a good deal like a jug. The handle is all one side. End of section 170. This recording is in the public domain. Section 171 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Such a sucker as me, President. Read for LibriVox.org When Lincoln's wife, at his prospect of being United States Senator, was on the verge of realization, reminded him of her prophecy, away back in the fifties, that he would attain the highest niche, the inevitable feminine, I told you so, he clasped his knees in keen enjoyment, and laughing a roar, cried out, Think of such a sucker as me, as President. But presently he said with his dry smile, But I do not pretend I do not want to go to the Senate. Henry Villard, then newspaper reporter. End of section 171. This recording is in the public domain. Section 172 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams one happy day to his friend bowen lincoln avowed during the electioneering time that he was sure from the word go to become president though the split of the opposition into three parties was materially helpful douglas bell and breckinridge he thought the reward due him as having gone his whole length for the republican party almost his creation so he frankly said on his success I cannot conceal the fact that I am a very happy man. Who could help being so under such circumstances? To H. C. Bowen of the New York Independent. End of section 172. This recording is in the public domain. Section 173 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Old Abe will look better when his hair is combed. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Old Abe will look better when his hair is combed. Did I ever tell you the joke the Chicago newsboys had on me? To the War Department Telegraph Manager, A.B. Chandler.
a short time before my nomination for president i was at chicago attending to a lawsuit a photographer asked me to sit for a picture and i did so this coarse rough hair of mine was in particularly bad tousle at the time and the picture presented me in all its fright after my nomination this being about the only picture of me there was copies were struck off to show those who had never seen me how i looked the newsboys carried them around to sell and had for their cry here's your old abe he will look better when he gets his hair combed he laughed heartily says mr chandler note mrs lincoln seemed to have perceived this bar to her husband's facial beauty for the journalist fist relating the arrival of the lincolns in new york for the eastern tour in 1860 speaks thus of the toilet to befit him for the reception by mayor fernando wood the train stopped and mrs lincoln opened her handbag and said abraham i must fix you up a bit for these city folks mr lincoln gently lifted her upon the seat before him she was an undersized stout woman she parted combed and brushed his hair do i look nice now mother he affectionately asked well you'll do abraham replied mrs lincoln critically end of section 173 this recording is in the public domain recording by david lawrence in brampton ontario january 2nd 2009section 174 of the lincoln storybook by henry l williams read for LibriVox.org by anise a curious combination when the names of lincoln and hamlin were painted large on the street banners it was immediately noticed that a singular effect appeared as abra hamlin end of section 174 this recording is in the public domain. Section 175 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Abraham Lincoln Read for LibriVox.org One of the anagrams upon the President had, at least, peculiar signification. Abraham Lincoln, oh, bah, and three charm. It was Hamlin who proposed at the Lincoln Club of New York that a day should be set aside as the Lincoln Day. End of section 175. This recording is in the public domain. Section 176 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Snake Simile. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon. If I saw a venomous snake crawling in the road, any man would say I might seize the nearest stick and kill it. But if I found that snake in bed with my children, that would be another question. I might hurt the children more than the snake, and it might bite them. Much more, if I found it a bed with my neighbor's children, and I had bound myself by a solemn contract not to meddle with his children under any circumstances, it would become me to let that particular mode of getting rid of the gentleman alone. But, if there was a bed newly made up, to which the children were to be taken, and it was proposed to take a batch of young snakes and put them there with them, I take it no man would say there was any question how I ought to decide. Speech by Abraham Lincoln at New York Cooper Institute, and repeated through Connecticut, 1860. End of section 176. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 3rd, 2009. Section 177 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. What's in a name? Read for LibriVox.org by Jerusha Renstrom. What's in a name? The Reverend Dr. Moore of Richmond derived Lincoln from two words meaning on the precipice verge and Davis as interpretable as God with us. 
End of section 177. This recording is in the public domain. Section 178 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Paying for whiskey he did not drink. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1858, Mr. Lincoln was campaigning in Ohio and staying in Cincinnati at the Burnett House. It was the meeting place of the party of which he was the looming light. Some of the younger Republicans, says Murat Halstead, there as a newspaper man, had refreshments in his rooms, and from some stupid oversight allowed the whiskey and cigars to be included in his bill. This raised a hot correspondence between them and the guest, ticklish about his lifelong abstinence principles. Mr. Halstead said that the episode rankled in the blunderers after they had elected their pride president. He must have felt like the gentleman at the inn dining-room who, falling asleep at his meal, had the fowl consumed by some merry wags, then, greasing his lips with the drumstick, they left him before the carcass, so that the host naturally charged him with the feast. End of section 178 this recording is in the public domain. Section 179 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Highest Merit to the Soldier This extraordinary war in which we are engaged falls heavily upon all classes of people, but the most heavily upon the soldier, for it has been said, all that a man hath he will give for his life, and while all contribute of their substance, the soldier puts his life at stake, and often yields it up in his country's cause. The highest merit, then, is due to the soldier. End of section 179. This recording is in the public domain. Section 180 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. How Sleep the Brave. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. How Sleep the Brave. If Lincoln did not possess a wide range of reading, he had the habit of committing to memory entire pages of the text he delighted in. The consequence was his invariable ability to not only utter apt quotations at length, but to cap them if need be. Joining a group of visitors to Washington at the soldiers' home during the war, he suddenly, but in an undertone, murmured, How sleep the brave who sink to rest, by all their country's wishes blessed. The women were affected to tears by their susceptible nature, the surroundings of the cemetery with its graves, the evening dusk, and the touching voice with its apposite lines, an effect he redoubled by concluding, And women over the graves will weep, where nameless heroes calmly sleep. End of section 180. This recording is in the public domain. Section 181 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Stokers as Brave as Any. Read for LibriVox.org. The first troops arriving by way of the Potomac River were the volunteers of the first call, Ninety Day Men, the Steamship Daylight, Name of Good Omen. It was torrential rain, but the President and Secretary Seward came out to welcome them on the wharf. As he would give a reception then and there, four sailors held a tarpaulin over his head like a canopy, and he shook hands with all around, including the firemen and stokers out of the coal-hole. Grasping their smutty hands, he declared that they were as brave as any one. By General Veal, present. End of section 181. This recording is in the public domain. Section 182 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Try and go as far as you can Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon On the President, indefatigable in visiting the soldiers anywhere to see how the boys are getting on, telling the head surgeon at City Point Hospital that he had come to shake hands with all of the inmates, the medical authority demurred. There were several thousands in the wards, and any man would be tired before he had gone the grand rounds. "'I think,' protested Lincoln, with his set smile and dogged determination to have his own way, "'I am quite equal to the task. At any rate, 
I can try, and go as far as I can. It was on this, at another time there were many of them, alas, that it being found that the patients in one ward were clamoring because they had been passed over, he insisted on shaking off the fag and going to pay them respect also. The brave boys must not be disappointed in their father Abraham. End of section 182. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 3, 2009. Section 183 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Argument of the Stub-Tailed Cow. Read for LibriVox.org. The President had the knack of illustrating a false syllogism by a story from the front. Soldiers stole a cow from a farmyard. It had but the stump of a tail, and foreseeing that there might be a requisition by the owner, who passed for a union sympathizer, they disguised the creature by attaching a long switch from a dead bovine. Sure enough, the man came to headquarters, and from his patriotic plea of having lost much by adhering to the old cause, his demand was accorded. If he could find his lost animal, he was entitled to it, and the offenders would be punished. It had not been obtained by the regular forage, that he swore. Well, he was brought by the officer seeing him round to the pen where the beeves were secured, which the commissariat duly furnished. Here the rival suppliers had stabled the creature, and she was lashing off the flies with the substitute for the detached tail, with a supreme felicity in the lost enjoyment. The farmer scanned her with a more than merely suspicious eye, so that the lookers-on grew anxious, and the sub-officer with him, and who, thought, and who thought of his own plate of beef, hastened to say, "'Well, you don't see anything here anywheres like your beastie, do you, old father?' "'I don't know. There certainly is one cow, the pitcher of mine, but my lily-white was a stump, had a stub-tail, you know.' Hm, said the corporal firmly, but this here cow has a long tail, ain't it? True, and mine were a stub. Let us seek farther, officer. End of section 183. This recording is in the public domain. Section 184 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Pegged or Sewed. Shoe-making machinery, not having attained the present development which pastes imitation leather uppers upon paper soles, the soldiers of the first Union Army had to trudge in the boots made with wooden pegs to hold the portions together. In wet weather the pegs swelled and held tolerably, but in dryness the assimilation failed, and the upper crust yawned off the base like a crab-shell divided. As for the supposed sewed ones, they went to the sub-officers, but the thread was so poor that parting was as thorough as sudden. Mr. Lincoln wanted, as Walt Whitman says, to repeat this tale when the army contractors were swarming in his room for a bidding. A soldier of the Army of the Potomac was being carried to the rear among the other wounded when he spied one of the women following the army to Vandelicacies. In her basket, no doubt, were the cookies to his fancy, the tarts and pies, open or covered, so he hailed her, Old lady, are them pies sewed or pegged? End of section 184. This recording is in the public domain. Section 185 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Soldiering Apart from Politics. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1864, a soldier at work on the Baltimore defenses an outbreak of southern sympathizers being apprehended attended a democratic meeting and made a speech there in favor of its principles and general mcclellan as the standard-bearer secretary of war stanton fierce like all apostates turned on this democrat and his disgrace as to the army was threatened captain andrews went to the fountainhead with his remonstrance he was right for lincoln said andrews has as good a right to hold on to his democracy if he chooses as stanton had to throw his overboard no, when the military duties of a soldier are fully and faithfully performed, he can manage his politics his own way. End of section 185. This recording is in the public domain. Section 186 of The Lincoln Storybook 
by Henry L. Williams. A time that tried the soul. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine. A time that tried the soul. It was the Pennsylvania governor, Curtin, who brought the bad news from Fredericksburg battlefield, where Burnside was repulsed in December, 1862. It was a terrible slaughter, the scene a veritable slaughter pen. This blunt troop stirred up Lincoln, who had been a pig slaughterer in his day, remember. He groaned, wrung his hands, and took on with terrible agony of spirit. I remember his saying over and over again, says the governor, What has God put me in this place for? End of section 186section 187 of the lincoln storybook by henry l williams cabinet talk read for librivox.org like all persons whose early life was passed in seclusion from the exhibitions common in society eager for anything to animate jaded nerves mr lincoln at washington sought distraction in his brief intervals for them one of the shows he tolerated he called all such sights so was the séances of charles e shockle phoebus what a name this medium came to the capital in 1863, under eminent auspices, and the President and his wife, members of the Cabinet, and other first citizens were induced to patronize the illusions. The spirits were irreverent, pinching Stanton's and plucking Wells's beard. As for the President, a rapping at his feet announced an Indian eager to communicate. "'Well, sir,' said the President, "'happy to hear what His Indian Majesty has to say. We have recently had a deputation of the Red Indians,' and it was the only deputation, black, white, or red, which did not volunteer advice about the conduct of the war. The writing under cover trick was played. A paper covered with Mr. Stanton's handkerchief was found before the President, scrawled with marks interpreted as advice for action by Henry Knox. No one knew him, but the lecturer said he was the first Secretary of War in the Revolution. The recipient said it was not Indian talk. He transferred it to Mr. Stanton as concerning his province. He asked for General Knox's forecast as to when the rebellion would be put down. The reply was a jumble of wild truisms purporting to be from great spirits, from Washington to Wilberforce. "'Well,' exclaimed the President, "'opinions differ as much among the saints as among the, ahem, sinners.' He glanced at the cabinet whence the materialized specters were to emerge, if called upon, and added, "'The Celestial's talk and advice sound very much like the talk of my cabinet.' He called for Stephen A. Douglas as his dearest friend. Footnote. Stephen Arnold Douglas was so patriotic at the rebellion's outbreak that Lincoln forgave him all the politically hostile past. Douglas held his new silk hat, Lincoln's abhorrence, at the first inauguration. Douglas left the field for home, where he assisted in raising the first volunteer levy by his eloquence. To speak, if not appear. The reporter affirms that a voice like the lamented little giant's was heard, and if others thought they recognized it, the President must have been more affected than he allowed. But the eloquent statesman also breathed platitudes in which the illustrious auditor said he believed, whether it comes from spirit or human. Here Mr. Shockle became prostrated, and Mrs. Lincoln compassionately suggested an adjournment. The spiritualist did not see the sarcasm in Mr. Lincoln's remarks, and claimed that he was not only a convert, but that he was himself a medium. Footnote. There is serious evidence for this fact. He was, at all events, a spiritualist. See, Was Lincoln a Spiritualist? by Mrs. Nettie Coburn Maynard, 1891. End of section 187. This recording is in the public domain. Section 188 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams On the Blister Bench Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook On the Blister Bench The taking of Elizabeth City, North Carolina, 1862 The steamer, Valley City, was saved from blowing up by a gunner's mate. This John Davis coolly sat on a powder keg from which the top had been shot off, and was so found by an officer, who hastily censured him for his loafing, 
bumming during recess but on the reason for his taking his seat being pointed out davis was recommended for promotion in countersigning the papers entitling him to the rank of gunner at a thousand a year for life the president mock solemnly observed metaphorically we occupy the same position we are sitting on the powder under fire end of section one hundred and eighty eight this recording is in the public domain Section 189 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Abe, A Thundering Old Glory Ex-Registrar Chittenden tells the following incident. It was the 14th of April, 1865. Captain Robert Lincoln, on General Grant's staff, had brought the details of the victory of Appomattox, and the gratified chief had passed the day with the cabinet revolving those plans of reconstruction which amazed all the world by their exclusion of all bitterness and retaliation. He was coming down the White House stairway to take his accustomed ride in the carriage when he heard a soldier in the waiting crowd say, I would almost give my other hand, he was one-armed, if I could shake Abe Lincoln's hand. Lincoln confronted him. "'You shall do that, and it shall cost you nothing,' interrupted the revivified president, grasping the lone hand, and, while he held it, he asked the man's name, regiment, etc. The happy soldier, in telling of this meeting, would end, "'I tell you, boys, Abe Lincoln is a thundering old glory.'" End of section 189. This recording is in the public domain. Section 190 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Perfect Retaliation. Read for LibriVox.org. The more apparent it was that inconsistency reigned in the Lincolnian cabinet, the more earnestly the Marplets strove to incite them individually against one another and their head. A speculator who had induced the latter to oblige him with a permit to trade in cotton reported with zest how Secretary Staunton had no sooner seen the paper than, instead of countersigning, he tore up the leaf without respect even for the august signature. Staunton was famous for irascibility, and he did not forbear to manifest it toward all, even to the President. But, as the latter observed, hot or cold, Staunton is generally right. This time he was not sorry at heart for the reproof as to allowing a signal favor which might work harm. But, affecting rage, he blurted out, "'Oh, he tore my paper, did he?' Go and tell Staunton that I will tear up a dozen of his papers before Saturday night. End of section 190. This recording is in the public domain. Section 191 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Let down the bars a little. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Let down the bars a little. One of the mischief-makers abounding in Washington, and doing more harm than all the rebel culminators, hastened to repeat to the President that the Secretary of War had plainly called him a d, -d, -d fool You don't say so. This one's looking into, for if Stanton called me that, it must be true, for he is nearly every time right. He took his seat and excused himself, jerking out as he stalked forth, glad to be quit of the pest. I will step over and see him. He was going to have the bars let down a little. End of section 191. This recording is in the public domain. Section 192 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The administration can stand it, if the times can. Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder. Mrs. Hugh McCullough and Mrs. Dole, Indian Commissioner, went to Mrs. Lincoln's reception. The host expressed constant gladness to see the ladies, as they asked no offices. Mrs. McCullough protested that she did want something. "'I want you to suppress the Chicago Times because it does nothing but abuse the administration.' McCullough was in the Treasury. "'Oh, tut, tut! We must not abridge the liberties of the press or the people.' Footnote. The suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act, 1863, was sorely against the President's sentiments, fond of liberty himself and fixed on constitutional rule, but he bowed to the inevitable. Nevertheless, he softened the rod, and many imprisoned under the edict were never brought to trial. 
But never mind the Chicago Times. The administration can stand it, if the Times can. End of section 192. This recording is in the public domain. Section 193 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Bottling That Wasp. Read for LibriVox.org. It was confidently forethought by the numerous admirers of Governor Seward, who escaped being the president by a political combination, and not his want of supreme merit, that he would, in the cabinet, whatever nominally his post, be the ruling spirit. Not a man suspected that the plain man of the prairie would develop into the lord of the manor, and put and keep not only the able and cultured Seward, but the turbulent Staunton and the obstreperous Chase in their places. The pettifogger of the West simply expanded, like its sunflower, in the fierce white light around the chair, and was the lion among the lesser creatures. Seward raised his hand early. Within a month he had the impertinent fatuity to lay before his superior a paper suggesting the policy and moving that the President might commit to him, the secretary, the carrying out of that policy. With gentle courtesy, says General Beale, Lincoln took the paper from the author and popped it into his portfolio. He had no policy, and did not want another's. He had bottled his wasp. Seward was obedient as the spaniel. His powers were recognized by the villains who comprised him in the detestable plot. End of section 193. This recording is in the public domain. Section 194 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. That King Lost His Head. In 1865, the President and his State Secretary received as Peace Commissioners Alexander Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell. They wanted recognition of their President, Davis, as head of the Confederated States, an entity. Without stultification, it was impossible. In the course of the discussion, reference was made to King Charles I of England and his Parliament negotiating. So might the established Washington government treat with the rebel Davis. On Lincoln's features stole that grim smile for telling his shaft ready to shoot, and he interjected. Upon questions of history I must refer you to Mr. Seward, for he is posted on such things, and I do not profess to be. But my only distinct recollection of that matter is that Charles I lost his head. End of section 194. This recording is in the public domain. Section 195 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Swearing like a churchwarden. Read for LibriVox.org. To convey the President from General Hooker's camp to the review of General Reynolds's corps, a ride had to be taken in a six-mule ambulance. Either not knowing the rank of his passenger, or, being a teamster, which in our army replaces the French sapper for rudeness, the driver showered as many oaths of the largest caliber fire and fury signifying nothing, as snaps of the long cowhide. Lincoln, who had known the genius in the clay of the West, kept his eye on him while leaning out of the window. In an interval, when the vociferator had to take breath, he asked quietly, "'Excuse me, my friend, are you an Episcopalian?' "'No, Mr. President,' stammered the astonished Jehu. "'I am a Methodist.' "'Well, I thought you must be an Episcopalian, for you swear, like Secretary Seward, a warden of that church.' Seward was the great man of the Republican Party, next to Lincoln, only in some essentials for political success. While a church member, he was man of the world enough to give a backing to this jest of the President. End of section 195. This recording is in the public domain. Section 196 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. My speeches have originality as their merit. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. My speeches have originality as their merit. Instead of believing that Lincoln's extraordinary experiences in the multifarious West produced a factotum, his revelers asserted that he looked to one minister for financial instructions, to another for military guidance, etc. 
but it is true that by tradition as the premier in fact the secretary of state is supposed to write the first drafts at least of the presidential speeches to foreign ministers and as the secretary was seaward a man of letters pre-eminently he had lincoln's addresses even to home delegations fathered upon him the president was chatting in his own study when a messenger ran in with a paper explaining his haste with the words compliments of the secretary with the speech your excellency is to make to the swiss minister anybody else would have been abashed by the seeming exposure but the executive merely cried aloud as if to publish the facts to the auditory oh this is a speech mr seward has written for me i guess i will try it before these gentlemen and see how it goes he read it in the burlesque manner with which he parodied circuit preachers in his boyhood and public speakers in his prime and added at the close there i like that it has a merit of originality end of section one hundred ninety six this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and ninety seven of the lincoln storybook by henry l williams writing wrong hurts but does good read for LibriVox .org. in may eighteen sixty one all looked with anxiety to the letter by which the united states of america should reply to great britain furnishing the confederated states with its first encouragement the rights of belligerence without them their privateers were useless as they could have gone into no ports and sold their prizes nowhere mr seward was in touch with the new england school it clamoured for war with any friend to the revolting states but lincoln corrected what was provocative in the original advice to our minister adams at st james's the english were no longer held to have issued a proclamation without due grounds in usage or the law of nations it became by the modification no more a proceeding about which we could warrantably go to war for instance the president changed the words wrongful into hurtful according to webster wrongful means unjust injurious dishonest while hurtful implies that the course will cause injury the original has vanished in that odd but certain way in which state documents disappear when casting odium on public men they are mayhap filed away in the stove end of section one ninety seven this recording is in the public domain Section 198 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Stanton's service was worth his sauce. Among the President's minor worries was the assiduity by which his generosity was cultivated by his relatives, not only those by his marriage, but by his father's second marriage. He was like the eldest son of the family to whom all looked for sustenance there came to the seat of government that dennis hanks his cousin who stood to reach for boons on the platform of rails which they had cut long ago in cohort dennis was seeking the pardon of some copperheads that is southern sympathizers of the north veiled in their enmity but dangerous the secretary of war had pronounced against any leniency toward what were dubbed glaring traitors all the chief could do for he bared his head like Lear to let the Stanton tempest blow upon him and so spare others, was to say he would look at the cases the next day. Hanks was muttering, Why, Dennis, what would you do were you president? He asked the raw backwoodsman, turning badly into suppliant. Do? Why, Abe, if I were as big and ugly, aggressively combative, as you are, I would take your Mr. Stanton over my knee and spank him this caused a laugh but the other replied severely no stanton is an able and valuable man for this nation in his station and i am glad to have his service in spite of his sauce end of section one ninety eight this recording is in the public domain recorded by david lawrence in brampton ontario january the second two thousand and nine Section 199 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Secret of the Interior Lincoln the Junior, Tad, had the run of the executive mansion, and like all spoiled children, abused the license. 
he burst into the heart of a company listening to his father's talk with the exclamation, Ma says, come to supper. It was impossible for the most diplomatic to pretend that he had not heard, and all looked from the intruder to the host. Never at a loss, Mr. Lincoln rose from the sofa and blandly said as to married folks together, You have heard, gentlemen, the announcement concerning the seductive state of things in the dining room. I had intended to train up this young man in his father's footsteps, but, if I am elected, I must forego any intention of making him a member of my cabinet as he manifestly cannot be trusted with secrets of the interior. End of section 199. This recording is in the public domain. Section 200 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. All Staff and No Army. Read for LibriVox.org. Many of the volunteer officers developed a liking for the new profession, and to secure a permanency obtained entrance into the established army. Among these was one Lieutenant Ben Tappan. Secretary Staunton, being his uncle, no difficulty offered but this autocrat ought to remove. But, unfortunately, Staunton was a stickler for forms, and the relationship looked like nepotism to the world. Tappan particularly wished to stay on the staff on account of the privileges— his stepfather, Frank Wright, induced their congressman, Judge Shellebarger, to accompany him to the presidential mansion to obtain the boon. Lincoln was lukewarm, and told a story about the army being all staff and no strength, saying that if one rolled a stone in front of Willard's Hotel, the military rendezvous for those officers off duty and on dress parade, it must knock over a brigadier or two, but suddenly wrote a paper to this novel effect. Lieutenant Ben Tappan, of etc., desires to transfer to regiment, regular service, and is assigned to staff duty with present rank. If the only obligation of this transfer is Lieutenant Tappan's relationship to the Secretary of War, that objection is hereby overruled. A. Lincoln. This threw the responsibility upon the Secretary. End of section 200. This recording is in the public domain. Section 201 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams No Man is Indispensable Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook No Man is Indispensable One of the Cabinet Ministers disagreed with the majority on a vital question, and rose with a threat to resign. One of his friends advised the Chairman to do anything to recover his aid, whereupon he sagely said, Our Secretary and National Necessity how mistaken you are! Yet, it is not strange, I used to have similar notions. No, if we should all be turned out to-morrow, and could come back here in a week, we should find our places filled by a lot of fellows doing just as well as we did, and in many instances better. It was the truth that the Irishman uttered when he answered the speaker, Is not one man as good as another? With, He is, sure, and a deal better. No, sir, this government does not depend on the life of any man. End of section 201. This recording is in the public domain. Section 202 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Sleeping on post cancels a commission. Nobody who met Secretary Stanton, the Carnot of the war, would give him credit for joking, but Mr. Lincoln's example that way was infectious. The eldest son, Robert, was at college, but a captaincy was waiting him when he could enter the army. So the war secretary, for a pleasantry, issued a mock commission to Tad, ranking him as a regular lieutenant. As long as he confined his supposed duties to arming the underservants and drilling the more or less fantastically, as well as he remembered, evolutions on the parade grounds, where he accompanied his father, all was amusing. But he terminated his first steps in the school of Hardy's tactics, the standard textbook of the period, by bringing his awkward squad from the servants' hall, and, relieving the sentries, replaced the genuine with these tyros. For the sake of the vacation, they, the regulars, bowed to the commission with its potent Stanton and Lincoln and United States Army seal. His brother, startled, intervened, but the cadet vowed he would put him in the black hole, presumably the coal-shed. 
the president laughed and when he went to check the usurpation he found the little lieutenant overpowered by his brief authority asleep so he removed him from the service put aside his commission and when he woke to the situation made it plain that being a real soldier and officer he had forfeited his title by falling asleep on post he went then and formally discharged the sham sentinels placed by the boy's orders and replaced them by the simon peers end of section 202 this recording is in the public domain Section 203 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. My Question. Read for LibriVox.org. A recent volume has undertaken the superfluous vindication of President Lincoln from being the mere ornamental figurehead of the Republic during the Civil War. In fact, there are many instances of his incurring the reproach of interfering with the chiefs of departments, but it is testified to by a leading minister that he paid much less attention to details than was popularly supposed, and invidiously asserted in the capital. He brought up with a round turn, to use river language, both General Fremont and other military commanders who tried to steal the finishing weapon he kept in store, to wit, the emancipation of the southern slaves. Senator Cameron, as War Secretary, advised in a report that the slaves should be armed to enable them, successfully, to rise against their masters. The President scratched out this recommendation, which would have spiked his gun, and perverted a great statesmanlike action into a fostered insurrection, saying, "'This will never do. Secretary Cameron must take no such responsibility. This question belongs exclusively to me.'" End of section 200. This recording is in the public domain. Section 204 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams If good, he's got it. If taint good, he ain't got it. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon A revenue cutter conveyed a presidential party from Washington to Fortress Monroe, consisting of the chief, his secretaries of war and of treasury, and General Egbert L. Veeley, who preserved this tale. On the way, Secretary Stanton stated that he had telegraphed to General Mitchell in Alabama, All right, go ahead. Though he did not know what emergency was thus to meet, he wished the executive to take the responsibility in case his ignorance erred. I will have to get you to countermand the order, so he hinted. Well, exclaimed the good humor superior, that is very much like a certain horse sale in Kentucky when I was a boy. Lincoln was only eight when leaving Kentucky for Indiana. A particularly fine horse was to be sold, and the people gathered together. They had a small boy ride the horse up and down while the spectators examined it for points. At last, one man whispered to the boy as he went by, Look here, boy. Ain't that hoss got the splints? The boy replied, Master, I don't know what the splints is, but if it is good for him... He has got it. If it ain't good for him, he ain't got it. Now finished the advisor. If this was good for Mitchell, it was all right. But if it was not, I have to countermand, eh? Noted by General V. Lee. End of section 204. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 3, 2009. Section 205 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln Guessed the First Time. Read for LibriVox.org. Postmaster General James reflects a dialogue between Lincoln and one of his cabinet officers, evincing how the iron hand in the velvet glove squeezed persons into his own mold. Mr. President, Secretary Staunton speaking, I cannot carry out that order. It is improper, and I don't believe it is right. Well, I reckon, Mr. Secretary— very gently, that you will have to carry it out. But I won't do it. It's all wrong. I guess you will have to do it. He guessed right the first time. End of section 205. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 206 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Phantom Chase Despite Chase's political enmity to him, President Lincoln said of Salmon Portland Chase, I consider him one of the best, a blessed, and most reliable men in the country. But he had to let him slide off upon the Supreme Court bench to have knee room at the council table. He explained, He wants to be president, and, if he does not give that up, it will be a great injury to him and a great injury to me. He can never be president. Ex-Secretary Boutwell, The Authority End of Section 206 This recording is in the public domain. Section 207 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Word Flies, But the Writ Remains Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel The Word Flies, But the Writ Remains Mr. Chase, bemoaning that in leaving home he had in the hurry forgot to write a letter, Lincoln sagely consoled, Chase, never regret what you don't write. It is what you do write that you are often called upon to feel sorry for. Heard by General Veal. End of Section 207 this recording is in the public domain. Section 208 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Warlord Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra Lincoln states that the community among whom he was brought up would have hailed him as a wizard who spoke the dead tongues, and— Granting his legal studies made him familiar with Latin as lawyers use it, he carefully avoided those hurdles of the classic orator Latin quotations. Nevertheless, we have an exception to what would have pleased Lord Byron. The poet thought we have had enough of the classics. The President, spying Secretary Stanton of the War Department, inadvertently striking an imposing attitude in the doorway of the telegraph office in the executive house, without knowing the President was here, at the desk, suddenly was aroused by hearing the jocose hail, "'Good evening, Mars,' certified by Mr. A. B. Chandler, manager of the Postal Telegraph, War Department. End of Section 208. This recording is in the public domain. Section 211 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams More Shin Plasters to Heal the Sore Read for LibriVox.org. In 1863, President Lincoln went out to condole with the beaten Unionists, whom General Hooker had led fatally against Lee at Chancellorsville. Lincoln took his little son, Tad, with him. Amid the cheering, one of the soldiers plainly voiced a terrible grievance. Just when the sufferers were mostly in need of necessaries, the pay was behindhand. So one cried, "'Send along more greenbacks, Father Abraham!' The boy was puzzled, but his companion explained that the soldiers wanted their money due. The hearer thought this over for a moment, and then pertly said, "'Why don't Governor Chase print some more?' End of section 211. This recording is in the public domain. Section 212 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams there is much in an if and a but. Mr. Tinkler, telegraph operator of the cipher telegrams at Washington, in the executive residence, took the dispatch announcing the nomination of Andrew Jackson of Tennessee to the vice presidency with Lincoln for the second term. The latter read it carefully, and thought aloud, Well, I thought possibly that he might be the man, but... He passed out of the office, leaving the hearer impressed, Indeed, it was a prophecy of the future. Poor inebriate Andy, not the handy Andy, but the merry Andrew of the fag end of the lamentably sundered second term. Charles A. Dana, editing the New York Sun, printed this drop line, and said it was a proof that Lincoln had no hand in his vice being proposed or nominated. End of section 212. This recording is in the public domain. Section 213 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Don't Waste the Plug, But Use It Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Don't Waste the Plug, But Use It 
Treasurer Chase conducted the financial course of the war on the principle of each day taking care of itself, but still he resisted plans for relief not of his own conception. So he threw cold water on the Walker suggestion that the currency should bear interest with a view that holders would hoard it. Walker said Taylor of Ohio ran to the President for a higher hearing. But though the President now espoused the scheme, the Secretary still was counter on the ground that the Constitution was against it. Taylor, said Lincoln, with his frankness, which resembled impiety now, go back and tell Chase not to bother about the Constitution. I have the sacred instrument here, and am guarding it with great care. But a personal discussion with Chase was compulsory, during which the granite man stood on the Constitution. Chase, finally said the decisive factor, this reminds me of a little sea yarn. A little coaster on the Mediterranean was in stress of storm. The Italian seamen have their own ideas of behaviour under disaster, and fell on their knees to invoke the interposition of the usual stronghold, the Madonna, of which there was a statue in wood. But many and genuine as were the invocations, all were unanswered. The gale continued, and more and more damage was done the upper works. Whereupon, in a rage, the skipper ordered the image to be hurled overboard. Strange to say, almost instanter the tempest lulled, and in a short time the bark rode steadily on the Pacific waters. Come to examine the leak in the side, they found the wooden effigy thrown over, sucked into it, and so plugged up the cavity. The ship was saved by the castaway notion. Now we're all aboard to save the ship, by any plug. Footnote plug in western speech any substitute worthless otherwise an old horse a leaden counter a makeshift the plug hat however comes from the shape a cylinder of tobacco being so called End of footnote. that is offered since prayers don't seem to do it let us try find a mass of walker's proposition end of section two hundred and thirteen this recording is in the public domain Section 214 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Running Fever. Read for LibriVox.org. There is a malady of vulnerable heels, a species of running fever, which operates on sound-headed and honest-hearted creatures, very much like the cork-leg in the song did on its owner. When he had once got started on it, the more he tried to stop it, the more it would run away. A witty Irish soldier always boasting of his bravery when no danger was nigh, but who invariably retreated without orders at the first charge of his engagement, being asked by his captain why he did so, replied, "'Captain, I have as brave a heart as Julius Caesar ever had, but somehow or other, whenever danger approaches, my cowardly legs will run away with me.'" Debate. Lincoln. Springfield, Illinois, December, 1839. End of section 214. This recording is in the public domain. Section 215 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams One and a half times bigger than other men Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case Most conspicuous among the host of seeming friends, consistently and constantly plotting against their chief to replace him, if not actually displace him, was Salmon P. Chase. His whole career was that of the office-seeker incarnate, schoolteacher, lawyer, governor of his state of adoption, Ohio, for he was a New Hampshire man. He tried from 1856 all parties to nominate him for the presidency, at all openings. His inability to inspire trust forbade him having a personal following of any strength. Lincoln easily saw through him, but he had a fellow feeling for an indubitably honest treasurer. To think of the countless opportunities he had to enrich himself out of the public coffers, like another incorruptible statesman, he might have said, I wonder at my qualms when I had but to stretch out my hand to pocket thousands. But he truthfully said, when a hack impudently hinted that he could have had the nomination dearest to his heart, if he would but use to his private ends the vast patronage at his command, I should despise myself if capable of appointing or removing a man for the sake of the presidency. In February, 1861, 
the Peace Congress, Massachusetts, delegation called on the President to recommend Salmon P. Chase for the Treasury Department. Lincoln was already favorable, for he said, From what I know and hear, I think Mr. Chase is about a hundred and fifty to any other man's hundred for that place. This is why Lincoln, when compelled to remove the underminer, solaced him with the bed to fall upon of the Supreme Court judgeship. He said of him, Chase is about one and a half times bigger than any one I ever knew. End of section 215. This recording is in the public domain. Section 216 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. So slow a hearse ran over him. By treachery of those in charge of our navy yards, arsenals, and treasury, the South began the bloody strife better provided than the simple North. But adverse fate seemed bent on keeping the disparity for long in favor of the weaker contestant. By one of those wicked dispensations tripping up our early march, the Secretary of the Navy was selected in Gideon Wells, an estimable gentleman in person, but woefully unsuited to the birth, if from age alone. Patriarchal in appearance, with a long face and longer beard, white and sere, it became proverbial without appearing much of a far-fetched joke that he was the naval constructor to Noah of archaic fame. Unfortunately his set were antiques as well, yet Lincoln clung to him, or he clung to the President, like the old man of the sea, under which aspect he was presented by the caricaturists. One day, however, said the gossips of the White House, Mr. Lincoln dropped the newspaper in reading and exclaimed, Listen, said he to his secretary, a man has been run over by a hearse. As I saw Wells not so long ago, it must be one of Gideon's band. A song entitled Gideon's Band, introduced by the Negro minstrels in New York, was popular on the streets and in the camps. End of section 216. This recording is in the public domain. Section 217 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Bloodshedding remits sins. Read for LibriVox.org. Judge Kellogg, having an application for condoning a death sentence against a soldier, urged that he had served well hitherto, having been badly wounded under fire. Kellogg, remarked Lincoln quickly, is there not something in the Bible about the shedding of blood for the remission of sins? As the judge was not familiar with ecclesiastical law, he merely bowed. In fact, the blood offerings of the ancients was of animals, and it was deemed profane to offer one's own. Still, the offering of blood is a dedication to a friend or to the country. Lincoln had the idea correctly. That's a good point, he brightly said, and there is no going behind it. So saying, he wrote the pardon, which Kellogg transmitted to the gladdened father of the culprit. Mr. Lincoln had no need to go back to Scripture for his defense. It is martial law, unwritten but valid, that if a delinquent soldier, fugitive from justice, or breaking prison, reaches the battlefield and takes his place gallantly, no more would be said about the hanging charge, even though it were literally a hanging one. End of section 217. This recording is in the public domain. Section 218 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams His Leg Cases Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon The Judge Advocate General Holt, as well as the military chiefs, were in despair at their superior trifling with the laws of war by suspending mortal decrees, and in short, in hunting up excuses for delaying the blow of justice. Once the judge brought to the president a case so flagrant that he did not doubt that for a rarity the chief would sign without any cavil and hesitation. A soldier had demoralized his regiment in the nick of a battle by dashing down his rifle and hiding behind a tree. He had not a friend or relative to sue for him. Despite all this, the executive laid down the pen, quivering between his long fingers, and said, Holt! I think I must, after all, file this away with my leg cases, and thrust the paper in one of a series of pigeonholes already crammed with the like. 
The judge was taken off his guard by the inconsistent levity and demanded the meaning of the term with acerbity. Holt, were you ever in a battle? he counter-queried. The man of law was a man of peace. He had seen lead, but in seals, not bullets. Secretary of War Stanton was spurring the military justice on, as often before. Did Stanton ever march in the first line to be shot at like this man? Holt answered for his colleague in the negative. Well, I tried it in the Black Hawk War, proceeded the Illinoisian. And I remember one time I grew awful weak in the legs when I heard the bullets whistle around me and saw the enemy in front of me. How my legs carried me forward I cannot tell, for I thought every minute that I should sink to the ground. I am opposed to having soldiers shot for not facing danger when it is not known that their legs would carry them into danger. Well, Judge, you see, the papers crowded in there, you call them cases of cowardice in the face of the enemy, a long title, but I call them my leg cases, for short. And I put it to you, Holt, and leave it to you to decide for yourself. If Almighty God gives a man a cowardly pair of legs, how can he help them running away with him? End of section 218. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico. January 3rd, 2009. Section 219 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. How the Delinquent Soldier Paid His Debt. Read for LibriVox.org by Bill Elliott. Find me at www.vocability.com. That's V O C A L B I L L I T Y.com. How the Delinquent Soldier Paid His Debt There is a great similarity in the many stories of Lincoln's leniency to soldiers incurring the death penalty according to the Code of War, and no wonder, when they were so numerous that he often had four and twenty sentences to sign or ignore in a day. A member of a Vermont regiment was so sentenced for sleeping at his post. The more than usual intercession made for him induced Lincoln to visit the culprit in his cell. He found him a simple country lad, impressing him as a reminder of himself at that age. In the like plain and rustic vein he discoursed with him. I have been put to a deal of bother on your account, Scott, he said paternally. What I want to know is how are you going to pay my bill? From a lawyer turned sword of state, this was reasonable enough. So the young man responded, I hope I am as grateful to you, Mr. Lincoln, as any man can be for his life but this came so sudden that I did not lay out for it. But I have my bounty money in the savings bank, and I guess we could raise some money by a mortgage on the farm, and if we wait till payday for the regiment, I guess the boys will help some, and we can make it up, if it isn't more nor five or six hundred, eh? With the same gravity, the intermediary reckoned the cost would be more. My son, he said, the bill is a large one. Your friends cannot pay it, nor your comrades, nor the farm, nor the pay. If from this day William Scott does his duty so that, if I were there when he came to die, he could look me in the face as now and say, I have kept my promise and have done my duty as a soldier, then my debt will be paid. The boy made the promise and was immediately restored to the regiment. He earned promotion, but refused it. At Lee's Mills, on the Warwick River, he was wounded while distinguishing himself in a grand assault. Mortally wounded in saving three lives, he was enabled with his dying breath to send a message to the president to the effect that he had redeemed his pledge. On his breast was found one of the likenesses of Lincoln with the motto, God bless our president, which the Grand Army men were given. He thanked the benefactor for having let him fall like a soldier in battle and not like a coward by his comrade's rifles. End of section 219. This recording is in the public domain. Section 220 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The swearing had to be done then, or not at all. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The swearing had to be done then, or not at all. An old man came from Tennessee to beg the life of his son, death doomed under the military code. 
General Fitz procured him admittance to the President, who took the petition and promised to attend to the matter. But the applicant, in anguish, insisted that a life was at stake, that tomorrow would not do, and that the decision must be made on the instant. Lincoln assumed his mollifying air, and in a soothing tone brought out his universal soothing syrup, the little story. It was General Fisk who introduced you, who told me this. The general began his career as a colonel, and raised his regiment in Missouri. Having good principles, he made the boys promise then not to be profane, but let him do all the swearing for the regiment. For months no violation of the agreement was reported. But one day a teamster, with a foul tongue associated with their calling and mule driving, as he drove his team through a longer and deeper series of mud puddles than ever before, unable to restrain himself, turned himself inside out as a vocal Vesuvius. It happened, too, that this torrent was heard surging by the colonel, who called him to account. Well, yes, colonel, he acknowledged. I did vow to let you do all the swearing of the regiment, but the cold fact is that the swearing had to be done there and then, or not at all, to do the Cation justice. And you were not there. Now summed up Mr. Lincoln to the engrossed and semi-consoled parent, I may not be there, so do you take this and do the swearing him off? He furnished him with a release autograph, and sent another mourner on his way rejoicing. End of section 220. This recording is in the public domain. Section 221 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Displace the Thistles by Flowers. Read for LibriVox.org. Two ladies called upon the President at the end of 1864, one the wife, the other the mother, of Western Pennsylvanians imprisoned for resisting the military draft. A number of other men were fellows in their durance on precisely the same grounds. Finding it meet to grant this dual relief sought, Lincoln directed the whole to be liberated, and signed the paper with one signature to cover the entire act of humanity. His old friend, Speed, was witness of this scene, and knowing only too well the sensitive nature of the President, he spoke his wonder that such ordeals were not killing. Lincoln mused, and agreed, that such scenes were not to be wantonly undergone. But they do not hurt me. That is the only thing to-day to make me forget my condition, or give me any pleasure. He was unwell, then. His feet and hands were always cold, and often, when about, he ought to have been abed. I have in that order made two persons happy, and alleviated the distress of many a poor soul, whom I never expect to see. It is more than one can often say that, in doing right, one has made two happy in one day. Speed, die when I may, I want it said of me by those who knew me best, that I always plucked a thistle and planted a flower, when I thought a flower would grow. Vouched for by Joshua R. Speed, the first to be friend to Lincoln when he set out to become a lawyer, at Springfield in 1837. End of section 221. This recording is in the public domain. Section 222 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. You have one and I have one. That is right. An elderly woman was among the suitors of the president when the commander-in-chief by virtue of office was besought to release her eldest son of three her husband and two younger sons having been slain in action certainly returned the chief if you have given us all and your prop has been taken away you are justly entitled to one of your boys the woman took the discharge and gratefully went away but she was compelled to return more grieved than before as she found the son she sought dying in a hospital at the front the surgeon made a note of the fatality with which unable to speak she presented herself to the president he knew what she wished this time and proceeded to write out the release of the second son on handing her the paper he said a new judgment of a kinder judge than solomon now you have one and i the other of the two left that is no more than right End of section 222. This recording is in the public domain. Section 223 
of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Shooting a man does him no good. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine. Shooting a man does him no good. Judge Kellogg of New York begged off the son of a voter in his district, condemned for military infraction. In fact, the judge did not know much of the case, but his insistence prevailed over the rectifier of the law and articles of war. Lincoln dryly remarked, as he appended his signature to the pardon, I do not believe that shooting a man does him any good. End of section 223《ヘンリー・エル・ウィリアムズ》《Benevolence is Beautiful》read for LibriVox.org Thaddeus Stevens accompanied a lady of his constituents to beg a pardon of the President, her son being under death sentence of a court-martial. The senator backing up the petition, it was granted. The grateful woman was choking and was led away by her escort, without speaking in thankfulness. But at the exit she found her voice and burst forth feelingly, Mr. Stevens, they told me that the President was homely-looking. It is a lie. He is the handsomest man I ever saw. End of section 224. This recording is in the public domain. Section 225 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It was the baby that did it. Read for LibriVox.org by Megan Kunkel. It was the baby that did it. A young mother came to Washington to sue for the life of her husband, a deserter, condemned to die. Such was the crowd of besiegers for grace, offices, and simple greeting by the host of the White House, that she was kept out in the hall. But one day, the master passing through the corridor to hold the show, heard a baby's pitiful wail. He halted, listened again to make sure, and on entering his reception parlor asked his favorite usher if he had not heard that odd thing there, an infant's cry. The attendant promptly related that a woman with a babe was without, who had been losing her time three days. "'Go at once and send her to me,' he ordered, expressing regret that she should have been overlooked. As there were several extenuating points in her plea, or the benign official leaned that way, he wrote his pardon and gave it to the woman, whose still plaintive smile shone through her tears of gratitude. "'Take that, my poor woman, and it will bring you back your husband,' he said, going so far as to direct her to what authority to apply for the action. In showing her forth, the old usher, who knew his employer's tender heart where children were concerned, whispered, "'It was the baby that did it.'" Told by Old Daniel, the good-natured Irish usher. End of section 225 Section 226 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It rests me to save a life. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. It rests me to save a life. Scholar Colfax, then Speaker of the House, pleaded with Lincoln for the life of an elector's son, sentenced to be shot. Though he intruded on the arbiter very late, after a long spell of official duties, Lincoln accorded the boon. Colfax, explained he, it makes me rested after a hard day's work if I can find some good excuse for saving a man's life. And I go to bed happy as I think how joyous the signing of my name will make him and his family and his friends. End of section 226. This recording is in the public domain. Section 227 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A family man wants to see his family. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case. Superintendent Tinker of the Western Union Telegraph Company vouches for the following. A woman came to the Honorable Francis Kernan, member of Congress, with a pitiful tale, with which he went to the President. Her husband was a soldier who had been away from home a year. He deserted in order to have a glance at the family, and was captured on his way back to the front. But the rules of war are imperative and without compassion. The President was interested, as in all such cases where a deserving life and a sorrowing woman were at stake. He said, Of course this man wanted to see his family. They ought not to shoot him for that. 
He telegraphed for action in the matter to cease, and finally pardoned the deserter. A fellow feeling, for all his thoughts reverted to his family life at Springfield. End of section 227. This recording is in the public domain. Section 228 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Rule Without Exception Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon Lincoln's Amnesty Proclamation, issued in December 1863, exemplifies the perpetual attempt to infuse mercy into the intestine warfare which always grows more fierce by oil thrown on the flames, and only once, in our case, terminated in the brothers becoming brothers again. He replied thus to a public criticizer of the document. When a man is sincerely penitent for his misdeeds and gives satisfactory evidence of the same, he can safely be pardoned, and there is no exception to the rule. End of section 228. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico. January 4, 2009. Section 229 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Even Rebels Might Be Saved. Read for LibriVox.org. A Mr. Shrigley of Philadelphia, having been appointed hospital chaplain, the President sent in his name to the Senate, and his confirmation was eminent. A deputation came on to protest on the grounds that he was a universalist, a large-minded man, who did not believe in endless punishment. Logically, he believed that even the rebels will be saved, concluded the opposition, horrified. Well, gentlemen, determined the President gravely, if that be so, and if there is any way under heaven whereby the rebels can be saved, then for God's sake and for their sakes let the man be appointed. End of section 229. This recording is in the public domain. Section 230 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Whipping Around the Stump On New Year's morning, 1864, President Lincoln entered the War Department building. His sensitive nature, more than ever strained to the utmost tension, was irritated by hearing a woman wailing over a child in her arms at an office door. Major Eckert requested to ascertain the cause of the grief brought back the painful but not unexampled explanation. A soldier's wife had come to Washington with her babe, expecting to have no difficulty in going on under the pass to the camp where her husband was under the colors. But she learned, to her dismay, that, while an officer's wife has few obstacles to meet in communing with her husband under like circumstances, the private's is dissimilarly situated. This poor soul, with little money anyway, was perplexed how to wait in the expensive city till her wish was granted. "'Come, Eckert,' blurted out the chief in his frank manner. "'Let's send the woman down there.' It was recited that the war office had strengthened the orders against women in camp. Hm coughed the other in his dry way, ominous of an alternative. "'Let us whip the devil around the stump, since he will not step right over. Send this woman's husband leave of absence to report here to see his wife and baby.' So the officer on duty wrote the order, and the couple were happily reunited. By A. B. Chandler manager of postal telegraphs attached to the War Department in the war. End of section 230. This recording is in the public domain. Section 231 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Life Too Precious to be Lost. Read for LibriVox.org by Steve Eberhardt. Benjamin Owen, a young Vermont volunteer, was sentenced to the extremity for being asleep on post. Lincoln was especially lenient in these cases, as he held that a farm boy, used to going to bed early, was apt to maintain the habit in later life. It came out that the youth had taken the place of a comrade the night before as extra duty, and this overwork had fatigued him so that his succumbing was at least explicable. 
this clue being in a letter he wrote home, his sister journeyed to the capital with it and showed it to the president. Oh, that fatal sleep, he exclaimed. Thousands of lives might have been lost through that fatal sleep. He wrote out the pardon and said to the girl, Go home, my child, and tell that father of yours, who could approve of his country's sentence, even when it took the life of a youth like that, that Abraham Lincoln thinks the life too precious to be lost. He went in his carriage to deliver the pardon to the proper authorities for its execution, and not the soldiers. Then, making out a furlough for the released volunteer, he saw him and the sister off on the homeward journey, pinning a badge on the former's arm with the words, The shoulder which should bear a comrade's burden, and die for it so uncomplainingly, must wear that strap. End of section 231. This recording is in the public domain. Section 232 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Mercy has precedence over the rigid. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Mercy has precedence over the rigid. On the 9th of April, 1865, Lee accepted Grant's easy conditions, and practically everything was completed but the formal signing of the capitulation. The wide rejoicing covered the earth, the eyewitnesses may say, with one smile of relief and gladness. Washington looked gay with bunting, like New York City on the day of show your flag. Above all, the president whose words at Springfield in 1860 to the Illinois school superintendent, Newton Bateman, were justified. I may not see the end, but it will come, and I shall be vindicated, in condemning slavery. It was, therefore, in a receptive mood that he was found by Senator J. B. Henderson of Missouri. This gentleman came for the third time on an errand of pity. At the close of the war, one Colonel Green, brother to United States Senator James S. Green, crossed into Mississippi with his friends and brother-in-arms, George E. Vaughan. He gave Vaughan letters for home and started him to carry news to his family. Captured within the federal lines, he was held as a spy. Mr. Henderson succeeded in getting a retrial, and even a third hearing, but still the man was under sentence of death. On the afternoon of April 14, he called at the White House and insisted that the pardon should be granted now, if ever, in the interest of peace and consideration. The gladsome chief agreed with him and directed him to go to Secretary Stanton and have the prisoner released. But the inflexible official, on whom the general glee had no softening, refused and the man had but two days to live. When the intermediary hurried back to the executive mansion, the president was dressed to go to Ford's theatre with his wife, his son and a young couple of friends. Nevertheless, he stopped, went into the study, and wrote an unconditional release and pardon for Vaughan, saying, I think this will have precedence over Stanton. It was his last official act, one of mercy and forgiveness. End of section 232. This recording is in the public domain. Section 233 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Taken from Rebellion and Given to Loyalty Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case A lady out of Tennessee, which was early to join secession, came to Washington in search of her son, a youth enlisted in the Confederate Army. She found him in the Fort Henry Hospital, where, allowed to see him as she was loyal, in spite of regulations about prisoners of war, she learned that he would recover. She induced him to recant and offer his parole if he were allowed freedom. She called on Secretary Stanton, but he was in one of his boorish moods, was he ever out of them, and repulsed her with rudeness. She finally appealed to the President, who seemed very often balm to Stanton, a fretful corrosive applied to a deathly wound, and he gave her an order to receive the young man if he swore off his pledge to the wrong side. To take the young man from the ranks of the rebellion, he said to her, and give him to a loyal mother is a better investment to this government 
than to give him up to its deadly enemies. The young man was unable to resume his studies, but in a northern college. End of section 233. This recording is in the public domain. Section 234 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Suspension is not execution. Read for LibriVox.org. Among those generals, amateurs like the President themselves, who disapproved of any leniency in discipline, was Major General Benjamin F. Butler. He wrote to his commander in chief so impudent an epistle as the annexed Mr. President, I pray you not to interfere with the court martial of this army. His, of course, his skill was discoursed upon by General Grant, who said that Butler had corked himself up. "'You will destroy all discipline among the soldiers.' But in the teeth of this embargo, moved by the entreaties of an old father whose son was under death sentence by this despot, he said, "'Butler or no butler, here goes,' and seizing his pen, wrote that the soldier in prison was not to be shot until further orders." The affected parent eagerly took the precious paper, but his jaw fell on seeing the text. He had looked for a full pardon, but the comforter hastened to explain, "'Well, my friend, I see you are not very well acquainted with me. If your son never looks upon death till further orders for me to shoot him, he will live to be a great deal older than Methuselah.'" End of section 234. This recording is in the public domain. Section 235 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Discontented, About 400. In 1856, Mr. Lincoln had figured prominently in the Fremont-Dayton presidential campaign, and ever since he had been partial to the Pathfinder, though he clearly saw that he would be a rival for the chair at Washington, his long-cherished ambition. He gave, at the outset of the war, the most important military command, that of the Mountain, or Western Department, to Fremont. The latter attempted to steal his thunder by issuing a forerunner of the Emancipation Act, and was removed, but Lincoln reinstated him till he had to repeat the removal. He was repaid by the incorrigible Marplot setting up as candidate for the chief magistracy after it was settled that the retiring officer should be re-elected. Nevertheless, the competitor's party was so small that, in allusion to it, Lincoln read from Samuel, Book I. And every one who was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one who was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became captain over them, and there were with him about four hundred men. End of section 235. This recording is in the public domain. Section 236 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not much of a head, but his only one. Read for LibriVox.org. Although the life of a soldier sleeping on post was at stake, the pleader wished to forbear on finding that the supreme decider, the President, meant to make a personal matter of it. He suspended the execution while looking into it, but it was objected that this was a burden not intended to impose. Never mind, Lincoln answered. This soldier's life is as valuable to him as any person's in the land. It reminds me of the old Scotchwoman's saying about her lard going to be beheaded for participation in a Jacobite rebellion. It war na mickle of a head, but it is the only head the poor body had got. Assured in substance by L. E. Chittenden. End of section 236. This recording is in the public domain. Section 237 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Guess a Good Conceit Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon A place hunter hastened to his old acquaintance, Lincoln, when he was seated, of course to secure a trough. But he aimed high, in contrast to Lincoln's adage that a novice should aim low. The least he named was the birth of Master of the Mint. "'Good gracious!' ejaculated the chief. "'Why did he not ask to be the Secretary of Treasury and have done with it?' Reflecting, he observed, 
Well, now, I never thought that Link had anything more than average ability when we were youngsters together. But then I suppose he thought the same thing about me, and yet here I am. End of section 237. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 4th, 2009. Section 238 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. They went away, sick or still. Read for LibriVox.org. A party were pressing the claims of a solicitor for a consulship. His particular plea that his health would be benefited by residence on these fortunate islands. The Lord Bountiful terminated the interview by lightly saying, Gentlemen, I am sorry to say that there are eight other applicants for the place, and all of them are sicker than your client. End of section 238. This recording is in the public domain. Section 239 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Of Twenty Applicants Read for LibriVox.org by Morgan Dantrick Of twenty applicants, nineteen are made enemies. Hampered, harassed, and hounded by office-seekers, the President once opened his confidence on this irritating point to a conscientious public officer. He wished the Senators and others would start and stimulate public sentiment towards change in public offices being made on good and sufficient cause, that is, plainly, never on party considerations. The ideal civil service, in a word. Nine-tenths of his vexations were due to seekers of sinecures. It seems to me that such visitors dart at me with finger and thumb, carry off a portion of my vitality, he was saying. His hearer laughed at the image, but the other pursued earnestly. I have made up my mind to make very few changes in office in my gift from a second term. I think now that I shall not move a single man except for delinquency. To remove a man is very easy, but when I go to fill his place there are twenty applicants, and of those I must make nineteen enemies. Authenticated by Senator Clark of New Hampshire, to whom this confidence was imparted. Footnote. Secretary Blaine, out of his similar experience, reiterated the sentiment thus. When I choose, out of ten applicants to fill an office, I find that nine have become enemies, and one is an ingrate. End of section 239. This recording is in a public domain. Section 240 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams rid of an office seeker there was an ignorant man said a senator who once applied to lincoln for the post of doorkeeper to the house this man had no right to ask lincoln for anything it was necessary to repulse him but lincoln repulsed him gently and whimsically without hurting his feelings in this way so you want to be doorkeeper to the house eh yes mr president well have you ever been a doorkeeper have you ever had any experience of doorkeeping well no no actual experience sir any theoretical experience any instructions in the duties and ethics of doorkeeping um no have you ever attended lectures on doorkeeping no sir have you ever read any textbook on the subject no have you conversed with any one who has read such a book no sir i'm afraid not sir well then my friend don't you see that you haven't a single qualification for this important post said lincoln in a reproachful tone yes i do said the applicant and he took leave humbly almost gratefully chicago record herald end of section two hundred forty this recording is in the public domain Section 241 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Not Good Offices, But a Good Story Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon When Washington and its chief guardians were more sorely besieged by office-seekers than by the Confederates, a politician locally important and generally opportunate was sent as a committee of one to headquarters to secure the loaves and fishes for his conjuries. But in about a fortnight, this forager came home full of emptiness. Asked if he had not seen the president, accounted commonly as only too accessible, and why he did not get the places, he replied glumly, yet with a tinge of brightening. 
Yes, I saw the old man. He heard me state my errand. The president did. He heard me patiently all right enough, and then he said, I am sorry not to have any good offices for you, but I can give you something, a good story. And he went on with, Once there was a certain king who kept an astrologer to forewarn him of coming events, and especially to tell him whether it was going to rain when he wished to go on hunting expeditions. One day he had started for the forest with his train of lords and ladies when he met a farmer. "'Good morning, farmer,' said the king. "'Good morning, king,' said the farmer. "'Where are you folks going?' "'Hunting,' said the king. "'Hunting? You'll all get wet,' said the farmer. The king trusted his astrologer and kept on, but at midday there came up a tremendous rain that drenched the king and all his party. On getting back to the palace, the king had the astrologer decapitated and sent for the farmer to take his place. "'Law's sake,' said the farmer when he arrived. "'It ain't me that knows when it's going to rain. "'It's my donkey. "'When it's going to be fair weather, "'he always carries his ears forward. "'So. "'When it's going to rain, "'he puts them backward. "'So. "'Make the donkey the court astrologer,' "'shouted the king. "'It was done. "'But the king always declared "'that that appointment was the greatest mistake "'he'd ever made in his life. "'Mr. Lincoln stopped there,' "'said the office seeker. Why did he call it a mistake? we asked him. Didn't the donkey do his duty? Yes, said the president, but after that, every donkey in the country wanted an office. End of section 241. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 4th, 2009. Section 242 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Encourage Longing for Work. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1861, the badgered president had so novel an application that he wrote the annexed note to facilitate its harvest. To Major Ramsey. The lady, bearer of this, says she has two sons who want to work. Set them at it, if possible. Wanting to work is so rare a merit that it should be encouraged. End of section 242. This recording is in the public domain. Section 243 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams But Aaron Got His Commission Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook But Aaron Got His Commission to an animadversion on the President appointing to oppose one who had zealously opposed his re-election, he replied, Well, I allow that Judge E, having been disappointed before, did behave pretty ugly, but that would not make him any less fit for the place, and I think I have scriptural authority for appointing him. You remember when the Lord was on Mount Sinai getting out a commission for Aaron? Said Aaron was at the foot of the mountain making a false god for the people to worship. Yet Aaron got his commission, you know. End of section 243. This recording is in the public domain. Section 244 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Something Lincolnian all could take. Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon. When the president had an attack of spotted fever and was told he must be immured as it was catching, he smiled and said, It is a pity to shut the public off, as while every act of mine is not taken to, now I have something everybody might take. End of section 244. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 4, 2009. Section 245 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not many such boys outside of Sunday schools. A Boston business house was deceived in an errand boy. Fresh from the country, he succumbed to temptation and robbed the mails. His father tried to get him off the penalty as the United States government took up the case. He went to Washington and prevailed on his representative, Alexander H. Rice, to intercede for him. Rice and the President were on familiar terms. 
as soon as the pleader presented himself mr lincoln assumed an easy attitude legs stretched leaning back and read the petition well said he did you meet a man going out as you came in his errand was to get a man out of the penitentiary and now you come to get a boy out of jail i am bothered to death about these pardon cases but i am a little encouraged by your visit they are after me on the men but appear to be roping you in on the boys what shall we do the trouble appears to come from the courts let us abolish the courts and i think that will end the difficulty and it seems to me that the courts ought to be abolished anyway for they appear to pick out the very best men in the community and send them to the penitentiary and now they are after the same kind of boys i don't know much about boys in massachusetts but according to this petition there are not many such boys as this one outside the sunday schools in other parts it was settled that if a majority of the massachusetts delegates signed the paper a pardon would be given testified to by hon alexander h rice former governor of massachusetts end of section two hundred forty five this recording is in the public domain Section 246 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Good Boy Gets On. Read for LibriVox.org by Jerusha Renstrom. The Good Boy Gets On. According to White House etiquette, as a congressman and a senator, Wilson and Rice, called together on the president, they were admitted in company. As they were readmitted from the anteroom, a boy of about twelve on the lookout slipped in with them. After the salutations, the host became absorbed in the intruder, as he was always interested in the young. But the two gentlemen were unable to answer the natural question, Who is this little boy? But the boy could speak for himself, and instantly said that he was a good boy come to Washington in the hope of becoming a page in the House of Representatives. The President began to say that Captain Goodnow, head doorkeeper there, was the proper person to make that application to, as he had nothing to do with such appointments. But the good little boy pulled out his credentials from his folks, the squire, and the parson and schoolmaster, and they stated not only that he was good, but good to his widow mother, and wanted to help the needy family. The president called the boy up to him, studied him, and wrote on his petition, If Captain Goodnow can give this good boy a place, it will oblige A. Lincoln. Vouched for by Alexander H. Rice, Member of Congress and Ex-Governor of Massachusetts. End of Section 246 this recording is in the public domain. Section 247 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams How McCullough Was Constrained to Serve Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon For two arduous years, Hugh McCullough, banker of Indianapolis, served in organizing the currency control. He was looking forward to release and repose at the second administration when the renewed incumbent begged him to become Secretary of the Treasury. He remonstrated. But I could not help myself, he confessed to Janet Jennings. Mr. Lincoln looked at me with his sad, weary eyes, and throwing his arm over my shoulder, said, You must. The country needs you. That was a gesture worth all the elegant tones in the elocution books. End of section 247 this recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, January 4th, 2009. Section 248 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. All Mouth and No Hands Class. Read for LibriVox.org. I hold if the Almighty had ever made a set of men that should do all the eating and none of the work, he would have made them with mouths only and no hands, and if he had ever made another class that he had intended should do all the work and none of the eating, he would have made them without mouths and with all hands. End of section 248. This recording is in the public domain. Section 
Section 249 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hot and cold, the same breath. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case. Underlying the innate frankness, there was a deep shrewdness in President Lincoln, which fitted him to cope with the most expert politicians, albeit their vanity would not let them always or promptly acknowledge it. When Chief Justice Taney died, the President had already planned to fill up the vacancy and at the same time shelve that thorn in his side, Salmon P. Chase. But always keeping his own counsel, he was mute on that head, when an important deputation attended to recommend Chase. After hearing the address, the President asked for the engrossed memorial to be left with him. I want it, in order, if I appoint Mr. Chase, I may show the friends of the other persons for whom the office is solicited, by how powerful an influence and what strong recommendations I was obliged to disregard in appointing him. This was heard with great satisfaction, and the committee were about to depart, thinking their man sure of the mark, when they perceived that the chief had not finished all he had to say. And, he continued, I want the paper also, in order that, if I should appoint any other person, I may show his friends how powerful an influence and what strong recommendations I was obliged to disregard in appointing him. The committee departed mystified. End of section 249. This recording is in the public domain. Section 250 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Wanted the Jail Earnings a western senator bothered the president about a client of his for back pay of a dubious nature lincoln responded with one of his evasive answers that is a little story years ago when imprisonment for debt was legal a poor fellow was sent to jail by his creditor and compelled to serve out his debt at a rate of a dollar and a half a day when the sentence had expired he informed the jailer of the fact and asked to be released the jailer insisted on keeping him four days longer. Upon making up his statement, however, he found that the man was right. The prisoner then demanded not only a receipt in full for his debt, but also payment for four days' extra service, amounting to six dollars, which he declared the county owed him. Now, continued Lincoln, I think that county would be about as likely to pay this man's claim as this government will be to pay your friend's claim for back pay told before Colonel Noteware of Colorado, a Western Senator and a Congressman. End of section 250. This recording is in the public domain. Section 251 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A title, no hindrance. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case. A German noble and military officer wished to serve as volunteer under our colors. After being welcome, he thought it expedient to unfold his family role, so to say, but the ultra-democratic ruler gently interpolated as if he saw an apology in the recital, and soothingly observed, Oh, never mind that. You will find that no hindrance to your advance. You will be treated as fairly in spite of that. End of section 251. This recording is in the public domain. Section 252 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A Talker with Nothing to Say. Read for LibriVox.org. A reverend gentleman of prominence, Mr. F., of was presented to the President, who resignedly had a chair placed for him, and with patient awaiting said, my dear sir, I am now ready to hear what you have to say. Why, bless you, Mr. President, stammered the other, with more apprehension than his host. I have nothing to say. I only came to pay my respects. Is that all? exclaimed the escaped victim, springing up to take the minister's hands with gladness. It is a relief to find a clergyman, or any other man, for that matter, who has nothing to say. I thought you had come to preach to me. Footnote. Any other man— from this frequent expression of Mr. Lincoln's, a true comedian, the negro entertainer, Unsworth, conceived a burlesque lecture, or any other man, with which he went around the world. 
The editor, passing through London, remembers his attention being called to Mr. Gladstone and other cabinet ministers, who came to the Oxford Music Hall nightly between Parliament business, to hear Unsworth, who on such chances introduced personal and pat allusions to the subjects debated that night. End of section 252. This recording is in the public domain. Section 253 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Stick to your business. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Stick to your business. Among the Boers who assailed the President was a Western stranger who had another plan to end the war. Lincoln listened to him all the way, and then obliged him and the crowd with a story. You may have heard of Mr. Bounce of Chicago. No? Well, he was a gentleman of so much leisure that he had no time to do anything. This superb loafer went to a capitalist at the time of a wheat flurry, when speculators reckoned to make fortunes, and he informed Mr. Blankcheck how his project would make them both terribly rich. The reply came sharp as a bear trap. My advice is that you stick to your business. But I have no business. I'm a gentleman. Whatever that is, I advise you to stick to that. And now, my friend, proceeded the President, I mean nothing offensive, for I know you mean well, but I think you had better stick to your business and leave the war threshing to those who have the responsibility. End of section 253. This recording is in the public domain. Section 254 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Marrying a Man Without His Consent Read for LibriVox.org Major Hopsley, Excelsior, New York Brigade, wounded in the fighting, Joe Hooker Division, could not accept a commission in the army, but wished to be put upon the staff of the volunteers as he could not walk. He was upheld in his desire by Adjutant General Hamlin, who accompanied him to the President. They were both asked to sit while the authority consulted the congressional laws. Staff appointments could not be heard by the President unless the general commanding the desired rank was approving. "'I have no more power to appoint you without that request,' said the President, "'than I would have to marry a woman to any man she might desire for a husband without his consent.' By General Charles Hamlin. End of section 254. This recording is in the public domain. Section 255 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Luxury to See One Who Wants Nothing Senator DePew was Secretary of New York State in 1864 under Governor Seymour. He had to wait upon President Lincoln, re-elected, to harmonize the calls for men as his state was split on the accusation that the draft favored one party above the other. His official business finished, Secretary DePew called to bid farewell. Lincoln was not holding a reception, but sitting in that study accessible to the public that never was a public man's sanctum before or after. He was intruded upon all the time, as he let the door remain wide open. Old New Yorkers may recall P. T. Barnum, the showman's similar habit. Every now and then some petitioners would make a desperate rush in and, on seeing they were not repelled by order or by the usher's own initiative, others would be emboldened to do the same. The New Yorker no sooner took his cue than the besieged man perceived him. "'Hello, Depew, what do you want?' was his hail. "'Nothing, Mr. President, save to pay my respects to you as I am going home. Stay, it is such a luxury to see any one who does not want anything.' He had the room cleared and discussed the war, interspersing the dialogue with opposite stories. Told by Senator C. M. Depew. End of section 255. This recording is in the public domain. Section 256 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Accuse not the servant. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. As the possibilities of rapid advancement were redoubled during the war, the President, in his first term of office, was stormed by the office-seekers, 
he thought it the best plan to have occupiers of posts outed to give them an opening. So they maligned and even accused chief officials with a freedom unknown in other countries where the bureaucracy is a sacred institution, as, within a generation, it has become here. Lincoln rebuked one of those covetous vexers by saying gravely to him, Friend, go home, and attentively read Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 10. The rebuffed applicant found at that page in the book, Accuse not a servant to his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. Attested by Shiloh Colflax End of section 256 This recording is in the public domain. Section 257 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A wolf in a trap must sacrifice his tail to be free. Read for LibriVox.org by Capnallegra. The presidential private secretary, Stoddard, maintains that his chief sorely astonished and baffled the tribe of acquaintances who flocked in upon him as soon as he was elevated, and went back home with empty haversacks, wondering that he ignored them with heartless ingratitude. He did not make even his own father a brigadier, nor invite cousin Dennis Hanks to a seat in his cabinet. End of section 257. This recording is in the public domain. Section 258 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Somewhat of a Newsman Read for LibriVox.org by Todd Lennon Innately attached to letters and precocious, Abraham Lincoln soon learned his letters and drank in all the learning that his few books could supply. Hence, at an early age, he became the oracle on the rude frontier, where even a smattering made him handy and valuable to the illiterate backwoodsman. Besides, as working at any place and at any work, he rarely abided long in any one spot, and had not what might be called a home in his teens. Dennis Hanks, his cousin, said of Abraham, at fourteen to eighteen, Abe was a good talker, a good reader, and a kind of newsboy. Hence he was a sort of volunteer coal porter, distributing gossip, as a notion peddler, before he was a store clerk where centered all the local news. It was on this experience that he would mingle with the newspaper reporters and telegraph men fraternally, saying with his winning smile and undeniable push, Let me in, boys, for I am somewhat of a news-gatherer myself. And then he would fix his footing by one of his stories, always, well often, uttered with a view to publication. End of section 258. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico. January 4th, 2009. Section 259 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A little more light and a little less noise. Read for LibriVox.org. As the President was a diligent devourer of the newspaper in the vexatious times, as at all others, he met many a torrent of criticism, incitement, and counsels, which left him stunned rather than alleviated. To a special correspondent who hampered him, he said, "'Your papers remind me of a little story. There was a gentleman travelling on horseback in the West, where the roads were few and bad and no settlements. He lost his way. To make matters worse, as night came on, a terrible thunderstorm arose.' Lightning dazzled the eye, or thunder shook the earth. Frightened, he got off and led his horse, seeking to guide himself by the spasmodic and flickering electric light. All of a sudden, a tremendous crash brought the man in terror to his knees, when he stammered, "'O oh Lord, if it be the same to thee, give us a little more light and a little less noise.'" End of section 259. This recording is in the public domain. Section 260 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams My part of the ship is anchored. Among the first men called out was a young Massachusetts man, Burridge, who went as a private. Grievously wounded, he was sent into the hospital and then to his home. 
recuperated, he joined his old regiment at the front. He was unaware that strict orders were out against the soldiers exchanging newspapers, and so performed the daily courtesy of giving a paper to the rebels. They had two, and he promised to give them the one due next time. This was held as keeping up correspondence with the Johnnies, and the authorities reduced him to the ranks as he was then a captain. Worse and worse, the enemy seized him when he went out to redeem his promise about the news, and he was imprisoned on their side. This regaled his wounds, and he was a great sufferer. The Massachusetts member of Congress, Alexander Rice, pleaded with the President for his native citizen. The complication was that Burridge was a captain when captured, but a private again soon after, and the rebels would probably hold him at the higher rate if an exchange was allowed, while the Union War Department stood for his being but a common soldier. If General Wadsworth raises that point, replied the President, who had allowed this pathetic case to break his rule to deal with classes and not individual offenses, tell him if he could take care of the exchange part, I guess I can take care of the rank part. It is clear that the President saw in this punctilio about a humane act whose offense was rancor. It reminded one of the story of the New England skipper who, with his mate and crew of a small fisher, owned the vessel. They having quarreled, and the captain bidding the other mind his part of the ship, the latter did so, and presently came to the stern to report, Captain, I have anchored my part of the ship. Take care of your own. End of section 260 this recording is in the public domain. Section 261 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Angels Swearing Make No Difference Read for LibriVox.org by Rick Rodstrom On the President being urged to answer some virulent newspaper assault, his reply was, Oh no, if I were to try to read, much less answer, all the attacks made on me, this shop might as well be closed for any other business. I do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep doing so until the end. If the end brings me out all right, what is said against me won't amount to anything. If the end brings me out wrong, ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference. End of section 261. This recording is in the public domain. Section 262 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Washington's Difficult Task. Read for LibriVox.org. Shortly after Lincoln's inauguration, a senator said to him, You have as difficult a task as Washington's, when he took command of the American army, and as little to do with it. That is true, but I have larger resources. The three thousand millions spent on the war vividly contrasts with the colonies fighting rich England with an empty treasury and barefoot, ragged soldiers. End of section 262. This recording is in the public domain. Section 263 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Steel and Steel. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case. President Lincoln asked a friend, a senator, immediately on his taking office, upon an embarrassed condition of affairs. Have you seen that prophecy about my administration in the papers? A prophet foretells that my rule will be one of steel. To which the wags retort, well, Buchanan's was one of steel. The Georgian slaveholder, late Secretary of the Treasury, was accused of diverting some millions to the South, as that for the war office similarly diverted ordnance and munitions to the same quarter. The head of the navy, with what looked like collusion, had scattered the war vessels so as to be long delayed in concentrating. End of section 263. This recording is in the public domain. Section 
Section 264 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. That's what's the matter. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. That's what's the matter. In a spiritualist performance at the White House, which seemed to have been edited by the President himself, as often royalty revises plays for his special entertainment, the cabinet being invited, after a rigmarole of stilted phrases purporting to be by Washington, Franklin, Napoleon, and other past celebrities, Mr. Wells, Secretary of the Navy, remarked, I will think this matter over and see what conclusion to arrive at. This was his set phrase. There was a smile at this, as the aged minister's prolonged meditations were the laughing stock of the country, he being the clog on the wheels of the car of state. Instantly raps were heard in the spirit cabinet, and the alphabet being consulted, the result was spelled out as, That's what's the matter. This hit at Mr. Wells' stereotyped fault aroused more mirth, and the crowd at the back of the room, domestics, petty officials, and sub-officers laughed prodigiously, while the secretary stroked his long white beard musingly. To this cant term hangs a tale, propus of the president. Its origin was low, but humorous. A benevolent gentleman pierced a crowd to its centre to see there, on the pavement under a lamp-post, a poor woman, curled in a heap, with a satisfied grin on her flushed face, breathing brokenly. "'What's the matter?' eagerly inquired the compassionate man. A bystander removed his pipe from his mouth, and with it pointed to a flattened pocket flask sticking out of her smashed reticule, half under her, and sententiously explained. "'That's what's the matter with Hannah.' The sentence took growth and spread all over the Union. It has settled down, as we know, to a fixed form at political meetings, where the audience beguiled the waiting time with demanding, What is the matter? with this or that favourite demagogue. In the sixties it patly answered any problem. At the presidential election time of Lincoln's success, a negro minstrel, Unsworth, was the star at 444 Broadway dressing up the daily news drolly under his title, that is, ending each paragraph with that line. On the 22nd of February, 1861, Abraham Lincoln scheduled to pass on from Harrisburg, where he had made a speech as arranged, instead of waiting to depart by the morning train. Sped to Philadelphia, and thence by a special train, detained for a military messenger with a parcel, to Washington, by the regular midnight train. The news of his arrival at the capital by this unexpected and clandestine route, and in disguise, this was denied, of a Scotch cap and plaid shawl, startled everybody. Rumours of an attempt to make mischief, as he called it, were rife. But the public still took things as quake-proof, and Mr. Lincoln assured his audiences, as he spoke at every city on his way, that the crisis was artificial. On the evening of the 23rd, the writer dropped into the Broadway Negro Minstrel Hall. Newspaper men knew that Unsworth introduced the latest skimming off the press into his burlesque lecture, and liked to hear his funny versions and perversions. The comic sheet of the Metropolis, Vanity Fair, enframing the witty scintillations of Artemis Ward, George Arnold, and a brilliant band, complained that this nigger comedian used or anticipated their best effusions. On the whole, the public saw in the surreptitious flight of the ruler into his due seat only a farce, in keeping with his jesting humour. He was regarded as Don Quixote, in figure, but a Sancho Panza for his philosophical proverbs, widely retailed and considered opportune. So the indignation proper toward the forced escapade was absent. Everybody still mocked at the terrible plots, as so much stale quail and when the blackened-faced orator, coming to a pause after enunciation of his, that's what's the matter, looked around wistfully, the audience were agog. Suddenly out of the wing an attendant darted with an alarmed manner and face. He carried on his arm a shawl, grey and travel-stained, and in one shaking hand a scotch bonnet. Unsworth snatched him in hot haste and fright, clapped on the cap, and draping himself in the plate, rushed off at the side, forgetting his own high silk hat. This was the black suit. The orthodox lecturers now gave him a resemblance to Mr. Lincoln, not previously perceived, for they were men of opposite shapes. The eclipse brought home to the spectators the ludicrousness of the president entering his capital in secret. But, 
I repeat, no one felt any shame, and the audience went forth to relate the excellent finish to the parrot, at home or in the saloons, to hearers as obtuse as themselves, to the seriousness of the episode. Somehow, so far, the elect from Illinois was ever the western buffoon, but when in his inaugural address Lincoln thundered the new keynote, the veil fell. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, is the momentous issue of the Civil War. War? The crisis was no longer artificial. He admitted that. What impended? What had fallen? Jest and Ernest were still coupled, but Ernest took the lead from that hour. So the Chief Magistrate, in his first official speech, Physically speaking, we cannot separate. That's what's the matter. End of section 264 this recording is in the public domain. Section 265 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Ship of State Simile On the morning of Lincoln's arrival in Washington, General Logan and Mr. Lovejoy called on him at Willard's Hotel to urge a firm and vigorous policy. He replied, as the country has placed me at the helm of the ship, I'll try to steer her through. The Sagamon River pilot spoke there. I understand the ship to be made for the carrying and preservation of the cargo, and so long as the ship can be saved with the cargo it should never be abandoned, unless it fails in the probability of its preservation, and shall cease to exist, except at the risk of throwing overboard both freight and passengers. Speech, New York Reception, 1861. I trust that I may have the assistance of the members of this legislature in piloting the ship of state through this voyage, surrounded by perils as it is, for if it should suffer shipwreck now, there will be no pilot ever needed for another voyage. Speech, Trenton, New Jersey, 1861. End of section 265. This recording is in the public domain. Section 266 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A Pill for the Public Printer. Read for LibriVox.org. In Lincoln's first message to Congress, special session, July 4, 1861, is seen this passage. With rebellion thus sugar-coated, they have been drugging the public mind, etc. Mr. DeFries, public printer, with the proofreader's sublime spurning of plain speech, objected to this sweet word, and said, Mr. President, you are using an undignified expression. I would alter the construction if I were you. Defreeze, was the crushing reply, that word expresses precisely my idea, and I am not going to change it. The time will never come in this country when the people won't know exactly what sugar-coated means. I jinx, I can beat you both. One day the public printer wanted to correct a Lincolnism in one of the presidential documents. Go home, Defreeze, and see if you can better it. The next day, DeFries took him his amendment. It happened that Secretary Seward had spied the same fault as the printer, and Lincoln confronted the two improvements. I jinx, by jingo, Seward has been rewriting the same paragraph. I believe that you have beat Seward, but I think I can beat you both. And he wrote, with his firm hand, Stet, so let it stand, on the proof sheet. End of section 266. This recording is in the public domain. Section 267 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Let the grass grow where it may. Read for LibriVox.org by Kidder. Up to the dread day when the news of the flag of our Union being fired upon in Charleston Harbor, the country resembled the sea in one of those calms preceding a storm. When the placidity betrays hidden and mighty currents, and overhead in the clear sky, one divines the coursers of the tempest gathering to race and strife like that beneath. Up to Lincoln's arrival in Washington, the nest of sedition, the pro-slavery peace-at-any-price party slackened in no efforts to retain the status quo. Or worse, a new state of the southern states branching off as suckers strike from the main stem. William E. Dodge had the courage to face the wrought-up chief magistrate, chafed with his narrow escape from the assassins of the railroad journey from Baltimore. Said Mr. Dodge, It is for you, Mr. President, 
to say whether the whole nation shall be plunged into bankruptcy. The slaves were valued as property at two thousand million dollars. Whether the grass shall grow in the streets of our commercial cities. The balance of trade against the South to the manufacturing and supplying North was stupendous. Then I say it shall not, replied Lincoln. If it depends on me, the grass will not grow anywhere, save in the fields and meadows. Mr. Dodge persisted in his sordid and businesslike errand. Then you will not go to war on account of slavery? I do not know what my acts may be in the future, beyond this. The Constitution will not be preserved and defended until it is enforced and obeyed in every part of every one of the United States. It must be so respected, obeyed, enforced and defended. Let the grass grow where it will. End of section 267. This recording is in the public domain. Section 268 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Peace at Any Price Party. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. The Peace at Any Price Party. If there were a class of men who, having no choice of sides in the contest, were anxious to have only quiet and comfort for themselves while it rages, and to fall in with the victorious side at the end of it, without loss to themselves, their advice as to the mode of conducting the contest would be precisely such as his his being Mr. Thomas Durant, who in 1862 wrote a letter on behalf of the Conservatives asking to be let alone. He speaks of no duty, apparently thinks of none, resting upon Union men. He even thinks it injurious to the Union cause that they should be restrained in trade and passage without taking sides. They are to touch neither a sail nor a pump, live merely as passengers, deadheads at that, to be carried snug and dry through the storm and safely landed right side up. Nay, more, even a mutineer is to go untouched lest these sacred passengers receive an accidental wound. The letter was to C. Bullet, July 28, 1862. End of section 268. This recording is in the public domain. Section 269 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Things were topsy-turvy aloft, too. Read for LibriVox.org. One evening, when Mr. Hall, astronomer, was working in the Naval Observatory, Washington, on the great equatorial telescope, he was startled to have his sanctum invaded by the gaunt, extenuated figure of the President. He was made welcome, of course, and the varied mechanism explained to him. As the crowning treat, he was given a peer through the celebrated instrument. It was levelled at the moon, or rather arranged to have that orb in its focus at the time. The visitor was appalled, as well as wondering at the view, and slowly withdrew by the trap-door. But when the astronomer resumed his observations and calculations, he was interrupted by the same sedate and absorbed caller. He returned, perplexed, as on glancing up at the moon with the unhindered vision, he saw it in another position to that presented in the spy-glass. Mr. Hall made it clear to him, as the telescope was pointed, not at the satellite, but at its image in a mirror, he saw its reflection, and consequently the reverse of the face we observe. The President went away with the satisfaction of a man wanting every novelty demonstrated. End of section 269. This recording is in the public domain. Section 270 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Hitching to the Moon Lincoln came to Washington to view the situation, and found the world all upside down, a rumpus in the nation. Topical Song, 1860 End of Section 270 This recording is in the public domain. Section 271 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Red Flag to Him Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook A Red Flag to Him 
A most remarkable prelude to the war was the performance through the northern states of the Chicago Zouaves. The name came from the irregular regiment in the French Algerian service, composed of men worthy of being drummed out of the regular corps. They dressed like the Arabs in the small bolero jacket and baggy red trousers familiar since. They drilled gymnastically, not to say theatrically. Ellsworth, a clerk in the Lincoln and Herndon law office, had a martial turn, and hearing daily in that quasi-political vortex of the impending crisis, determined to be forearmed in case of the differences coming to blows. He raised, uniformed, a la Zuzu, a score of young men like himself, and proceeded to give exhibitions at home and then in the East. The writer retains a vivid memory of the odd and fantastic show, which, however, was regarded as not war, though magnificent. But Captain Ellsworth was in earnest. Mustered in with his company, he started the Zouaf movement, which led to two or more regiments being formed. His being the first volunteers at the fore, he claimed the right of the reconnoitring force sent out in May against Alexandria to break up railroads held by the rebels. Seeing a rebel flag on a hotel top, he entered the building and was shot by the landlord in coming down from cutting it away. He was slain instantly, and the like fate befell the murderer, the host from Ellsworth's guard. Apart from four men killed at Sumter, and two in Baltimore riots, the Chicago Zouave was the first victim of the rebellion. But the position was regained by the secessionist, and the rebel flag replaced the removed one, to the grief of President Lincoln. He could see it from his resident, and Murat Holstead, without knowing the melancholy association of the young officer, being a familiar in his office, reports seeing him dwell with spyglass bent on the flag for hours. Elmer Ellsworth, in his last speech made to the men he was leading out to the front, proves that he imbibed Lincoln's humanity with legal precepts in the office. Show the enemy that I want to kill them with kindness. End of section 271 this recording is in the public domain. Section 272 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Fly Away Jack Read for LibriVox.org by Tricia G. Fly Away Jack At the end of 1860, South Carolina took the lead in seceding, and in the opening of the next year six other southern states allied themselves with her. The timid feared hasty acting would precipitate the marshalling of the waverers under the same flag. To a committee urging a pause to see how the cats would jump, the president observed, If there be three pigeons on the fence, and you fire and kill one, how many will there be left? The voices said, Two. Oh, no, he corrected, there would be none left for the other two, frightened by the shot, would have flown away. As a truth, the firing on Fort Sumter welded the seceders into their union, at the same time as it likewise fused the northerners into consistency. The president said to General Veal, We want to keep all that we have of the border states, those that have not seceded, and the portions we have occupied. End of section 272. This recording is in the public domain. Section 273 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. His pen wanted to keep their hogs safe. Read for LibriVox.org. Just after the call for 75,000 90-day men to subdue the outbreak after Sumter was cannonaded, a deputation of loyal Virginians waited upon the President. They expounded on this levy that the fair fields of the South would be overrun by the ragamuffins of the northern cities, and the hen roosts and pig houses ravished. "'But what would you have me do?' asked Lincoln, who did not then foresee his having to conduct the military movements. "'Mr. President, if you would only lend us your pen a moment,' meaning, of course, that he should write a line to calm the rising storm. But the other pretended to misunderstand him, saying, "'Lend my pen! My pen! What would you do with that? Keep your hog safe with that?' End of section 273. This recording is in the public domain. Section 274 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hurrah for you. Read for LibriVox.org 
by Andrew Hoots. At the Chicago reception, a little boy came into the room with his father. No doubt he had been instructed to behave with decorum in the august presence, but he no sooner saw the tall, prominent figure than he shouted, Hurrah for Miss Lincoln! The crowd laughed, and still the more, as the object of the ovation caught up the little fellow, gave him a toss to the ceiling, and while he was in the air, shouted out lustily, Hurrah for Mr. You! And catching him, lowered him red and panting to the floor. End of section 274. This recording is in the public domain. Section 276 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Get their graves ready. Read for LibriVox.org. In April 1861, a deputation of sympathizers with secession had the boldness to call on President Lincoln and demand a cessation of hostilities until convening of Congress, threatening that 75,000 Marylanders would contest the passage of troops over their soil. I presume, quietly replied Mr. Lincoln, that there is room enough in her soil for seventy-five thousand graves? Peterson's Life of Lincoln End of section 276 This recording is in the public domain. Section 277 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Mr. Lincoln's Opinion of General McClellan Read for LibriVox.org by Steve Eberhardt. In the first stage of the war, when the President was Commander-in-Chief of the Forces by virtue of his office, he played the part of the elevated boy in the King of the Castle. Every one of his colleagues, who ought to have been his loyal supporters, until some firm stand was attained under the batteries of Richmond, civil and military, warred against him, underhandedly and happily openly, all aimed, in cabinet and on the staff, to be ruler. The understrappers of aged General Scott upheld all that concurred with warfare, set and obsolete, of the European strategists, overthrown by the great Napoleon. The principal practiser of these tactics, the summum bonum, or good thing, of the West Pointers was General McClellan, the little Mac of his worshippers, and the little Napoleon of the dazzled crowd. He was, like Cassio, a great arithmetician, who had never set a squadron in the field, or the division of a battle new, etc., seeming utterly to ignore that the enemy was composed of men trained by their life in genteel occupations to shoot true, to ride like Comanches or revolutionary Harry Lee's light horse, used to lying outdoors under skies genial to them and subsisting on game and corn cake as Marion on sweet potatoes. He expected to foil such guerrillas as Jeb Stuart, Mosby, and Quantrell by earthworks which they probably would have leaped their horse over if they wanted to reach their spoil in that way. It was in allusion to this adherence to Vauban that the president, who eyed the aspiring Hotspur as Henry V, his heir, the sixth Henry, trying on his crown, observed shrewdly when the general kept silence, he is entrenching. End of section 277. This recording is in the public domain. Section 278 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A Stationary Engine. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. A Stationary Engine. Lincoln said of the much promising General McClellan. He is an admirable engineer, but he seems to have a special talent for a stationary engine. He also cited him as a scholar and a gentleman. Nevertheless, as the education lavished on the army of the Potomac to make it earn foreign military critics' praise at reviews was not thrown away, but made sound soldiers which in time were invaluable to General Grant. 
Lincoln did him justice by quaintly but earnestly saying, I would like to borrow his arm if he has no further use for it. General Franklin heard this, but Little Mac had no design on the dictatorship being surely a lover of the Union too. End of section 278. This recording is in the public domain. Section 279 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Shoveling Fleas. Read for LibriVox.org. On account of the looseness and corruption attending the raising of soldiers at the first, the President, noting the difference between the number of men forwarded to General McClellan for the Army of the Potomac, and the number reported arrived, said, "'Sending men to that army is like shoveling fleas across a barnyard. Half of them never get there.'" End of section 279. This recording is in the public domain. Section 280 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Georgia Colonel's Costume. On account of this sectional warfare, Senator Mason of Virginia announced his resolve to wear homespun and dispense with Yankee manufactures altogether. That made Lincoln laugh and say, to carry out his idea, he ought to go barefoot. If that's the plan, they should begin at the foundation and adopt the well-known Georgian colonel's uniform, a shirt-collar, and a pair of spurs. In Speech, New England Tour, 1860. End of section 280. This recording is in the public domain. Section 281 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Course Feed First Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots Secretary Whitney wrote, In July 1861 I was in Washington, where I merely said to President Lincoln, Everything is drifting into the war, and I guess you will have to put me in the Army. He was in the Indian service at the time. The President looked up from his work and said good-humoredly, I'm making generals now. In a few days I will be making quartermasters, and then I'll fix you. End of section 281. This recording is in the public domain. Section 282 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Ain't I glad to get out of the wilderness? Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Ain't I glad to get out of the wilderness? In the summer of 1862, just when the North was lulled to repose by the note from General McClellan's newsmongers, that the people would have a great surprise on the 4th of July, Colonel J. E. B. Stewart, Confederate cavalrist, took about 2,000 picked riders and performed a dash within the hostile lines which achieved a world-wide admiration. It is necessary to premise that the country was inimical to the defenders of Washington, and the farmers kept secession as clearly informed on the federal movements. Besides, the first duty of keeping Washington engrossed all the Union commanders. If by any unexpected movement the rebels occupied the capital long enough to set up their government, Europe would have recognized the stars and bars, and raised the blockade on the cotton ports. Washington was stupefied and terror-stricken when the news came in from the north that the rebel cavalry were cavorting within McClellan's lines. Communication was cut off with him, and the president was heard to say in the general dumbness of consternation, There is no news from the army of the Potomac. I do not even know that we have an army. He was himself filled with a universal alarm. His hope was that a bright morning would follow the dark hour, but his faith and belief that God would safely lead them out of the wilderness was not widely shared. The allusion was to the popular army song, taken from the Negro camp meeting repertoire, Ain't I Glad to Get Out of the Wilderness, which a clergyman had encouragingly chanted a while before. This wilderness was metaphorically spiritual, but all applied the figure to the wilderness of Virginia where the battles were fought. End of section 282. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 283 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams With Two Guns, Hold Off an Army Read for LibriVox.org One Irish artilleryman was left behind, with one gun of his battery, on the wrong bank of the Potomac, when the Union Army retreated before Lee. This gunner actually telegraphed direct to the President as his commander-in-chief that, I have the whole rebel army in my front. Send me another gun, and I assure your honor that they shall not come over. This pleased the President greatly, who answered that the new Horatius was to take counsel with his officer, if he could find him. End of section 283. This recording is in the public domain. Section 284 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Breaking Up the Little Game Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Breaking Up the Little Game In 1862 Washington was full of talk and no hard cider. There was the laugh of the gossips who would chatter under fire, the chaff talk of pressmen taking things farcically, and the staff talk of the officers envying one another and scheming for places. Too many were still carrying water on both shoulders, and would have welcomed a speedy reconciliation. The President heard that some of the latter voiced the petulant complaint of those weary of the gainless military movements, that the intention was to shift the two armies about till both were exhausted, and, like the peace at any price men, and the still sympathizing pro-slavery tale, a compromise could be effected and slavery saved. He summoned the parties in this public unbosoming before him. Major Turner said that Major John J. K., staff officer to General McClellan, was asked why the Unionists had not bagged the rebel army soon after the Battle of Sharpsburg, whereupon he replied, That was not the game. We should tire ourselves and the rebels out. That was the only way that the Union could be preserved. Then we would come together fraternally, and slavery will be saved. Major Key did not deny the words, but stoutly maintained his loyalty. As McClellan's staff officer, he must have known his leader's policy. No confiscation, and no Emancipation Act. For McClellan hoped, like thousands of conservatives, to bring about reaction in the South. But the President sharply said with some of his sempiternal humour, Gentlemen, if there is a game even among Union men to have our army not take any advantage of the enemy it can, it is my object to break up that game. End of section 284. This recording is in the public domain. Section 285 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Bottom Will Fall Out. General McClellan's delayed advance being, in 1862, not upon Manassas, but upon Yorktown, filled the less enthusiastic of his henchmen with consternation. To the general eye he seemed to have pitched on the very point where the enemy wanted to meet with all the gain in their favor. This direct route to Richmond they had tried to make impregnable. The President, whom McClellan openly thwarted with unconcealed scorn for the civilian, was in profound distress. He called General Franklin into his council and inquired his opinion of the slowness of movements. If something is not soon done in this dry rot, the bottom will fall out of the whole affair. This was his very saying. The Confederates evacuated Yorktown, but a series of actions ensued, culminating in the massacre at Fair Oaks, where both sides claimed the victory. Soon after, Lincoln took matters in hand, relegating McClellan to one army and, as commander-in-chief, ordering a general advance. The bottom had fallen out with a vengeance. End of section 285. This recording is in the public domain. Section 286 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Master of them both. Read for LibriVox.org. General McClellan's attitude is such that in the very selfishness of his nature he cannot but wish to be successful, and I hope he will. And the Secretary of War, Stanton, is in precisely the same situation. If the military commanders in the field cannot be successful, not only the Secretary of War, but myself, for the time being master of both, cannot but be failures. Speech, 
August 6, 1862, at Washington. End of section 286. This recording is in the public domain. Section 287 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Skeered Virginian. Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots. A reviewing party, of which the president was the center, was stopped at a railroad by Harper's Ferry to let a locomotive pass and look at the old engine house where John Brown, the raider, was penned in and captured. The little switching engine ran past with much noise and bustle the engineer blowing the ludicrous whistle in salute to the distinguished visitors. Lincoln referred to the recollections of the scene where old Potawatomi thrilled the natives with panic lest he raise the negroes to revolt, and remarked as the engine flew away, You call that the Flying Dutchman, do you? They ought to call that thing the Scared Virginian. By General O. O. Howard, a hearer. End of section 287. This recording is in the public domain. Section 288 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. He who fights and runs away. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. He who fights and runs away. Shortly after the scandalous rout of Bull Run, the participants in the panic began to try to palliate the disgrace. The President, listening with revived sarcasm to the new perversion, remarked, So it is your notion now that we licked the rebels and then ran away. End of section 288. This recording is in the public domain. Section 289 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No Sunday Fighting. Read for LibriVox.org. As the first battle of Bull Run, a sanguinary defeat to the Unionists, was fought on the Sabbath day, the President forbade in the future important movements on the day desecrated. But with singular inconsistency in a sage so clear-headed, he did not see that the Southerners chuckled, the better the day, the better the deed, in their victory. End of section 289. This recording is in the public domain. Section 290 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Let a good man alone. General Howard, in taking command before Washington, incurred the hostility of certain officers of the convivial, plundering, squashbuckling order who objected to his piety and orderliness. They tramped off to badger the president with their censure. But he who had appreciated the new leader in a glance reproved them, saying, Howard is a good man. Let him alone. In time he will bring things straight. That was what caused the general to reverence him and love him. End of section 290. This recording is in the public domain. Section 291 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Blondin Simile Read for LibriVox.org by Harold Stewart One of the universal topics of the early sixties was the feats of the acrobat Blondin. This daring rope-walker crossed the waters by Niagara Falls on a slack wire. On one occasion he carried a man on his back, to whom he imparted the caution, grappling as with hooks of steel. If you upset me with trembling, I shall drop you. I shall catch the rope and be safe. As for you, inexperienced one, foot the chain of defeats and flashes in the pan, attending the opening of the campaign, beginning as a march upon Richmond. Footnote. Some northern newspapers kept a standing head on to Richmond, but eventuating in a defense of Washington, humiliating as was this reverse, promoted all sorts and conditions of men, moneyed, well-grounded, and investing in the new government securities, fluctuating like wildcat stock, to pester the president with Jeremiads and counsel. 
to one deputation from his home parts, he administered this caustic rebuke in such illustration as was habitual to him. Gentlemen, suppose all the property you were worth was in gold, and you had put it in the hands of Blondin to carry it across the Niagara River on a rope. Would you shake the cable or keep shouting out to him, Blondin, stand up straighter. Blondin, stoop a little more. Go a little faster. Lean a little more to the north. To the south? No. You would hold your breath as well as your tongue and keep your hands off all until he was safe over. The government, footnote, Lincoln always used government and U.S. as nouns carrying a plural verb, are carrying an immense weight. Untold treasures are in their hands. They are doing the very best they can. Don't pester them. Keep silence, and we will get you safe across. End of section 291. This recording is in the public domain. Section 292 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Pioneer's Land Title Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Pioneer's Land Title Judge Weldon was appointed United States Attorney, acting in Illinois. Being at Washington, some speculators, knowing he was an old friend of the President, engaged him for their side. They wanted to get cotton permits from the Treasury, which was feasible, but made sure that the military would recognize these passes. No doubt, if the President would countersign them. Otherwise, the Army officers acted often without regard to trade desires. On broaching the subject to the potentate, on whose lips so much hung at the epoch, the latter brightened up and in his branching off manner said, By the way, what has become of your friend Robert Lewis? Lewis was the clerk of court in Illinois, and at home, well and thrifty. Do you remember, continued the President, his story about his going to Missouri to look up some Mormon lands belonging to his father? Whereupon, as Weldon said that he had forgot some details, the storyteller related with unction. This Robert Lewis, on coming of age, found papers in his father's muniments, entitling him as heir to lands in northeastern Missouri, where the Mormons had attempted settling before their enforced exodus. There was no railroad, so Lewis rode out to that part and thought he had located the land. For the night he stopped at a solitary log house. A gruff voice bade him come in, not very hospitably. The owner was a long, lanky man about eleven feet high, Bob thought. He had a rifle hanging on its hooks over the fireplace, also about eleven feet long, Bob also reckoned. He was interrupted in necking bullets, for they were cast in a mould, and left the little protuberance where the run left off. The first comer had been there some time, and seemed to know the section, but was rather indifferent to the stranger's inquiries about this sight of his lands. Teased at this unconcern, so opposite to the usual feeling of settlers who like a neighbour in the lonesomeness, Lewis hastened to lay down the law. He was looking up the paternal purchase. Here were the titles, spreading out the papers. That is my title, to this section. You are on it. What is yours? The other had shown some slight interest in the topic by this time. He paused in his occupation and pointed with his long arm to the long rifle, saying, Young man, do you see that gun? That is my title. And if you do not get out of here pretty quick, you will feel the force of it. Lewis crammed his papers into his saddlebags and rushed out to bestride his pony but said that the man snapped his gun at him twice before he was out of range. Now, resume Mr. Lincoln, the military authorities have the same title against the civil ones, the guns. The gentlemen themselves may judge what the result is likely to be. Mr. Weldon reported to his employers at Willard's Hotel, and they laughed heartily at the illustration, but they did not proceed with a cotton speck, understanding that would be the administration's policy as well as if a proclamation were issued. By Judge Weldon End of section 292 This recording is in the public domain.
Section 293 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Hoots Cheers not military, but I like them. After the disarray of the first Bull Run battle, the President drove out to the camps to rally the boys in the blues. General Sherman was only a colonel, and he had the rudeness of a military man to hint to the visitor that he hoped the orator would not speak so as to encourage cheering and confusion. The President stood up in his carriage and prefaced his speech with this exordium. "'Don't cheer, boys. I confess that I rather like it myself. But Colonel Sherman here says it isn't military, and I guess we had better defer to his opinion.' With his inimitable wink, which it would have been an independent fortune to a stage comedian. End of section 293. This recording is in the public domain. Section 294 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Numbering the hairs of his tail? Read for LibriVox.org. A Congressional Committee, selected to examine and report upon a new canon, produced so voluminous a tome that Lincoln, reviewing it, dropped it in disgust, and commented, "'I should want a new lease of life to read this through. Why can't a committee of this kind occasionally exhibit a grain of common sense? If I send a man to buy a horse for me, I expect him to tell me his points, not how many hairs there are in his tail.' Authenticated by Mr. Hubbard, Member of Congress of Connecticut, to whom this remark was addressed." End of section 294. This recording is in the public domain. Section 295 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. An Unconventional Order. On going over the minor orders, riders, and corrections of the President, it will be seen that he never succumbed to conforming with the stale and set phrases of the civil service documents for an instance of his unquenchable humor read the following discharge two brothers smiths of boston had been arrested held and persecuted for a long period by a military tribunal the charge was defrauding the government the hue and cry about the cheating contractors called for a victim but the chief executive on perusing the testimony concluded that the defendants were guiltless he wrote the subsequent release whereas franklin w and j c smith had transactions with the navy department to the amount of one and a quarter millions of dollars and whereas they had the chance to steal a million and were charged with stealing twenty two hundred dollars and the question now is stealing a hundred i don't believe they stole anything at all Therefore, the record and findings are disapproved, declared null and void, and the defendants are fully discharged. End of section 295. This recording is in the public domain. Section 296 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. It occurs to me that I am commander. Read for LibriVox.org by Morgan Dowtrick. It occurs to me that I am commander. To the prairie man the climate of Washington would be almost tropical. Nevertheless, it participates of American meteorological variability, as old probability would admit. One night, Lincoln, coming out of his rooms at the executive mansion to make his nocturnal round, finishing with the call of the latest dispatches at garrison headquarters, noticed, as a fierce gale shook and scourged him with sleet, that a soldier was contending with the storm just outside the outer door. "'Young man,' said he, turning sharply to him, "'you have got a cold job to-night. Step inside and guard there.' The soldier stoutly contended, for the colloquy became an argument by Lincoln's delight in debate. He persisted that he was posted there by order and must not bulge save by superior countermand. "'Hold on there,' cried Lincoln, pleased at the arguer supplying him with a decisive weapon. "'It occurs to me that I am commander-in-chief, and so I order you to go inside.'" End of section 296. This recording is in the public domain. Section 297 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. 
compliments is all they do pay. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case. A paymaster introduced to the President by the United States District Marshal remarked with independence noticeable in the sect, I have no official business with you, sir. I only call to pay my compliments. I understand, was the retort, and from the soldiers' complaints, I think that is all you gentlemen do pay. End of section 297. This recording is in the public domain. Section 298 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Bail the Potomac with a Spoon. Read for LibriVox.org. There is as pathetic a picture as the old sated Marquis of Queensbury, Thackeray's Staines, and History's Old Q, murmuring as he gazed from his window on the unsurpassed view of the Thames Valley, Oh, this cursed river running on all the day, in President Lincoln watching the broad Potomac, where all was so quiet, and yet the hidden and watchful enemy lined the other bank. A petitioner hemmed him in a corner of the room with this sight, and poured on him the bucket of his woes. The at last irritated worm turned on him and cried, "'My poor man, go away, do go away. I cannot meddle in your case. I could as easily bail the Potomac with a teaspoon as attend to all the details of the army.'" End of section 298. This recording is in the public domain. Section 299 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. We Shall Beat Them, My Son. Read for LibriVox.org by Bill Elliott. Find me at www.vocability.com. That's V-O-C-A-L-B-I-L-L-I-T-Y.com. We Shall Beat Them, My Son. George W. Curtis, New York editor, called on the president in the first winter of the war with the Illinoisian's friend, Judge Arnold. He said that the official wore a sad, weary, and anxious look, and spoke with a softened, touching voice. But he added to his goodbye at the door in shaking hands, with paternal kindness and profound conviction, We shall beat them, my son. We shall beat them. End of section 299. This recording is in the public domain. Section 300 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Little for so big a business. Before the war, the museums of the eastern states were regaled by an infant drummer. This lad, Henry W. Stoneman, at the age of seven or eight, was a proficient on the drum. He was seen by this editor, executing solos of great difficulty, and accompanying the orchestra with variations on his unpromising instrument, which musicians praised and in which he avoided monotony with precocious talent. Grown up, still a rare drummer, he was attached to the Germantown Hospital as a post drummer. At the first inauguration he was with the band and noticed by the president. With his habit of applauding the young, the latter spoke to him, commended his playing, and remarked, You are a very little man to be in this big business. He took him up, kissed him, and paternally set him down, drum and all. Mr. Stoneman lived to the age of forty with this pretty memory. End of section 300. This recording is in the public domain. Section 301 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not shoulder straps, but hardtack. Read for LibriVox.org. At a military function, when Lincoln presented a new commander to a legion, one of the soldiers burst out with that irreverence distinguishing the American volunteer, It is not shoulder straps, the officer's insignia, but hardtack that we want. Hardtack was the nickname for the disused shipbread turned over to the army by remorseless contractors. End of section 301. This recording is in the public domain. Section 302 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Maryland, a good state to move from. Read for LibriVox.org by Captain Allegra. Thurlow Weed, prominent wire-puller, 
presented as a preferable puppet to montgomery blair his choice henry winter davis upon which the president said davis judge david davis put you up to this he has davis on the brain a maryland man who wants to get out maryland must be a good state to move from weed did you ever hear in this connection of the witness in court asked to state his age he said sixty as he was on the face of it much older but persisted the court admonished him saying the court knows you to be older than sixty oh i understand now owned up the old fellow you're thinking of the ten years i spent in maryland that was so much time lost and did not count end of section three hundred and two this recording is in the public domain Section 303 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Don't Swap Horses Crossing a Stream Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Schnell Don't Swap Horses Crossing a Stream The setting up and the bowling over of the generals commanding the army defending Washington from McDowell at Bull Run to Meade at Gettysburg resembles a grim game at tenpins. The president, who tried to find a professional captain to relieve him of his responsibility as nominally war chief of the national forces, therefore smiled sarcastically when the ninety-ninth deputation came to suggest still another aspirant to be the new Napoleon, and said to it, Gentlemen, your request and proposition remind me of two gentlemen in Kentucky. The flatlands there bordering on the rivers are subject to inundations, so the fordable creek becomes in an instant a broad lake deep and rapidly running. These two riders were talking the common topic, in that famous bluegrass region, where fillies and fille, as the voyageur from Canada said in his broken English, are unsurpassable for grace and beauty. Each fell to expatiating upon the good qualities of his steed, and this dialogue was so animated and engrossing they approached a ford without being conscious of outer matters. There was heavy rain in the highlands and an ominous sound in the dampening air. They entered the water still arguing. Then, at midway, while they came to the agreement to exchange horses with no boot, since each conceded the value of the animals, the river rose. In a twinkling the two horses were floundering, and the riders, taken for once off their balance, lost stirrup and seat, and the four creatures separated were struggling for a footing in the boiling stream. Away streaked the horses, buried in foam three or four miles down, while the men scrambled out upon the new edge. Gentlemen, concluded the President, drawing his morale with his provoking imperturbability, those men looked at each other as they dripped and said with one voice, Ain't this a lesson? Don't swap horses crossing a stream. Heard by Superintendent Tinker, War Telegrapher End of section 303 this recording is in the public domain. Section 304 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No placing thorns in the side of my worst enemy. Read for LibriVox.org. The free constitution of Maryland was the work of Lincoln. His and its supporters made a party to go to Washington and congratulate the President on the victory. They had a band, and serenaded him in the White House until he came forth. But he said, to the dampening of their ardor, when the cheering had subsided, "'My friends, I appreciate this honor very highly, but I am very sorry to see you rejoice over the defeat of those opposed to us. It is furthest from my desire to place a thorn in any one's side, though he be my worst enemy.' Recited by Mr. High G. Willis, Baltimore, in the son of that city. End of section 304 this recording is in the public domain. Section 305 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Lincoln Plan of Campaign This historical document promised at one time to be a problem like the Sibylline Leaves or Tsar Peter's Will but Secretary H. C. Whitney declares that it existed as he had it laid before him by the strategist. Running his long finger down the map of Virginia, he said, We must drive them away from here, Manassas Gap, where indeed were fights over the keystone, 
and clear them out of this part of the state, so that they cannot threaten them here, Washington, and get to Maryland. Unfortunately, the rebels did threaten Washington right on, and entered Maryland and Pennsylvania as late as July 1863, and by a cavalry raid a year later. We must keep up a good and thorough blockade of their ports. We must march an army into East Tennessee and liberate the Union sentiment there. This was not finally done till the end of 1864. Finally, we must rely on the southern people growing tired and saying to their leaders, We have had enough of this thing and will bear it no longer. In 1862, a year after, Lincoln says to McClellan, We have distinct and different plans for a movement of the Army of the Potomac yours to be down the Chesapeake, etc., mine to move directly to the point on the railroad southwest of Manassas. He hugs his original idea. In case of disaster, would not a retreat be more difficult by your plan than mine? You see the prudence in him esteemed ignorant and consequently blindly rash. All this amounted to nothing when the President trusted fully to Grant as his lieutenant. End of section 305 this recording is in the public domain. Section 306 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Commander Should Obey Orders. Read for LibriVox.org. The President at Fort Stevens was the mark for a rebel battery. A colonel in command was diffident about ordering the superior about, but he was averse to letting the dare bring on a fatality, as the sharpshooters had an easy butt in the Lincoln exceptionable figure. So he took the advice of Mr. Registrar Chittenden, on the staff, and bade the President retire, or he would move him by a file of men. "'And you would do quite right, my boy,' acquiesced the chief. "'I should be the last man to set an example of disobedience.'" End of section 306 this recording is in the public domain. Section 307 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Idlers Equaled the Effectives Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook The Idlers Equaled the Effectives During a review of General Howard's corpse on the Rappahannock in April 1863, President Lincoln noticed, whether his eyes were unmilitary or not, that a very numerous mass of men were spectators. Though wearing semi-soldiery look and clothes, they were in fact the inevitable hangers-on of an army, the more in number as the escaped slaves were welcomed by the soldiers, as they made them do their dirty work. The commanding general explained that they were the cooks, the bottle-washers, and the nigger-waiters. They had come out to see the President. That review yonder, returned Lincoln gently as he smiled, is about as big as ours. By General O. O. Howard. End of section 307. This recording is in the public domain. Section 308 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Rest. Read for LibriVox.org. Sitting before his desk in his office, at the White House, Lincoln quaintly uttered, I wish George Washington or some of these old patriots were here in my place, so I could have a little rest. Heard by General Beale. End of section 308. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 309 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. I can bear censure but not insult. I can bear censure but not insult. An army officer appeared before the president with a statement of his defense against a sentence of cashiering. He was told that his own paper did not warrant the superior interference, but he showed up twice more, repeating the plea and the version of his own preparation. At the continued repulse, he blurted out, I see, Mr. President, that you are not disposed to do me justice. If Lincoln was the embodiment of any one virtue, it was justice to all. At this slur he sprang up, and put the fellow out of the door by a lift of his collar, saying, Never show yourself in this room again. 
I can bear censure, but not insult. End of chapter 309 This recording is in the public domain. Section 310 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Battle of Roses At every reverse to the Unionists, the more or less secret sympathizers with the seceders reiterated the cry that gentler measures should be used against our erring brothers. To one such pleader the President severely but humorously responded in writing, Would you have me drop the war where it is, or would you prosecute it in future with elder stock squirts charged with rose water? Mr. Lincoln may or may not have said this and thus, but he certainly wrote it, for which we see his letter to C. Bullet, July 28, 1862. Guns of elder squirts are mentioned by his dear Shakespeare. End of section 310. This recording is in the public domain. Section 311 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Help Me Let Go Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Help Me Let Go The year 1862 had its gold in the victories of Murfreesboro and Perryville in the west, but in the neighbourhood of the capital General Burnside's defeat at Fredericksburg, while his supporters counted on his justifying his superseding McClellan, clouded all Washington. The staff officer, footnote, an account says it was Governor Curtin in person, who brought the painful news, saw that the President was so saddened that he faltered an apology for the nature of his mission. I wish, Mr. President, that I might be the bearer of good instead of bad news. I wish I brought the intelligence by which you could conquer or get rid of these rebellious states. His hearer smiled at the essay to cheer him who believed he would never sleep again, and related with a view to enliven him also the story of Help Me Let Go. The version circulating viva voce ran as follows. That reminds me of the camp where a bear suddenly made his appearance and scattered the party, all save one shinned up trees or got behind rocks, and that one meeting the animal head on before he could turn, seized Brune by the ears and held on like grim death to a dead nigger. Recovering from their fright, the hunters came out of ambush and were unable to do anything but laugh at the fix their friend was in. "'You ain't mastered, are you?' asked they. "'Not licked, but I want you to help me let go.' Mr. Lincoln expressed himself when he said he was so slow to learn and slow to forget. The two qualities are redeemed by his wonderful ease and quickness in remembering. To quote well is good, but to quote fitly is better. His intimates noticed that he would re-echo a story, a smile or a tag, and so neatly apply it that it seemed fresh on the second use. He was an admirable actor, though not appreciated in that light, for he could reappear in the same part without palling. Hence one often meets his stories, as for instance this one. His life-law partner, Herndon, tells it as used toward a petty judge in Illinois, of inferior ability to Lincoln's. It was a murder case, and this bully on the bench kept ruling against Herndon and Lincoln. A material point was ruled adversely just at the refreshment recess. Lincoln withdrew sore, as he believed that the judge was personally controverting his positions. He avowed his own feelings and announced... I have determined to crowd the court to the wall and regain my position before night. As Judge Herndon was a bystander, his account of the further proceedings must be as faithful as veracious. At the resembling of court, Mr. Lincoln rose to read a few authorities in support of his position, keeping within the bounds of propriety just far enough to avoid reprimand. He characterized the continuous rulings against him as not only unjust but foolish, and figuratively speaking, peeled the court from head to foot. Lincoln was alternately furious and eloquent, and after pursuing the court with broad facts and pointed inquiries in rapid succession, he made use of this homely incident to clinch his argument. The tale is given as about a wild boar. In either phrase, the point is that the judge was attached to his tartar and wanted to be let go. 
The prosecution tried in vain to break Lincoln down, concludes Mr. Herndon, and the judge, badgered effectually by Lincoln's masterly arraignment of law and fact, pretended to see the error of his former position, and finally reversed his decision in his tormentor's favour. Lincoln saw his triumph and surveyed a situation of which he was master. End of section 311. This recording is in the public domain. Section 312 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Splitting the Difference. Read for LibriVox.org. Upon the Western Virginia State Ship Bill passing in Congress, an opponent, Mr. Carlyle, ran to the President. He urged him to veto the bill. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll split the difference and say nothing about it. Frank Moore. End of section 312. This recording is in the public domain. Section 313 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams In the Inca's Position Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook In the Inca's Position Long after the President reconsidered his hasty surmise that the impending war was artificial crisis, Congress continued to waver, and no one put forward a definite or working policy for the head who avowed that he never had one. In his despondency and lonesomeness, he welcomed an old friend from his state, who, however, like the rest, had his frets and rubs to seek solace for. You know better than any man living that from boyhood up my ambition was to be president. I am, at least, president of one part of the divided country. But look at me. With a fire in my front, and one in my rear to contend with, and not receiving that cordial cooperative support from Congress, reasonably expected, with an active and formidable enemy in the field threatening the very lifeblood of the government. My position is anything but on a bed of roses. End of section 313. This recording is in the public domain. Section 314 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Blind Fortune Read for LibriVox.org by Harold Stewart A soldier, shot in the head so as to be deprived of sight in both eyes, left the Carver Hospital, Washington, and blundered in crossing the avenue. At that very moment the President's carriage was coming along to the soldier's home from the mansion. The coach alone would probably have not brought any casualty upon the unfortunate young invalid, but it was again surrounded by one of the cavalry detachments, which Lincoln insisted on being withdrawn, but it was replaced for the time. The soldier, hearing this double clatter of hoofs, became bewildered, and stood still in the mid-road, or, if anything, inclined toward the thundering danger the cavalry chargers, trained to avoid hurting men, for a rider might be thrown, eluded contact, and the coachman neatly pulled aside. In the next moment, in a cloud of dust, the president, leaning out of the window to ascertain the cause of the abrupt stop, saw the poor young soldier by his side. Lincoln threw out a hand to seize him by the arm and reassure him of safety by the vibrating clutch. Then, Perceiving the nature of the affair, he asked, in a voice trembling with emotion, about the man's regiment and disablement. The man was from the northwest, Michigan. Lumbermen, and they are of the woods woody out there, and Lincoln believed in the axe as the enlarger of our borders, are brotherly. The next day the soldier was commissioned lieutenant with perpetual leave, but full pay. By the veteran reservist, H. W. Knight of the Escort. End of section 314. This recording is in the public domain. Section 316 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Lincoln's Cheese Box on a Raft. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. 
Lincoln's Cheese Box on a Raft There is a chapter yet to be published upon ironclad warships, as introduced practically in the Civil War. To the Southerners is due the innovation on a fair scale, though the experiments were not at all profitably demonstrative. Upon rumours that the enemy were building the novelties of iron case vessels, the Federal Government responded by voting money, and throwing it away upon a fiasco. Meanwhile, the others had raised the frigate, the Merrimack, and upon an angular roof laid railroad iron to make her shot-proof. Stories of her likelihood to be a terror, especially as she was stated by spies to be seaworthy, inspired the Americanized Swedish naval engineer Ericsson to build a turret ship. The Naval Construction Board unanimously rebuffed the innovator. Luckily, President Lincoln became interested as a flat boat builder in his youth. He took up the inventor and the design. He scoffed at the idea that the man had not planned thoroughly, saying, as to weight of the armour sinking the hull, Out west, in boat building, we figured out the carrying power to a nicety. His championship earned the monitor, the name of Lincoln's cheese box on a raft. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy, knowing all the facts, observes, I withhold no credit from Captain John Erickson, her inventor, but I know the country is principally indebted to President Lincoln for the construction of this vessel, and for the success of the trial to Captain Worden. Captain Fox, Erickson's adviser, confirms this credit. End of section 316. This recording is in the public domain. Section 317 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No Dutch Courage. Read for LibriVox.org. After the miraculous intervention of the Ericsson Monitor, the President took a party aboard to inspect the little champion which had saved the fleet, and perhaps the capital, where the captain received them. He apologized for the limited accommodation, and for the lack of the traditional lemon and necessary attributes for a presidential visit. But the teetotaler chief merrily replied, some uncharitable persons say that old bourbon valour inspires our generals in the field, but it is plain that Dutch courage was not needed on board of the monitor. End of section 317. This recording is in the public domain. Section 318 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams if I had as much money and was as badly scared. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. If I had as much money and was as badly scared. In March 1862, after her terrifying exploits, the Merrimack ram was reported to have escaped to sea and was seeking fresh prey to devour. The eastern seaports were in a panic. A deputation of New York's merchant princes, bullion barons, and plutocrats generally, representing a hundred millions, was the rumour heralding their rush visit to the capital, arrived at the White House. The spokesman faltered that the great metropolis was in peril, that treasures were involved by the apprehension, and that in brief the government ought to take measures to defend the Empire City from the spite of this irresistible ocean terror. At the conclusion, the patient hearer responded, Well, gentlemen, the government has at present no vessel which can sink the Merrimack. They were not, for state reasons, to know what the sly fox had up his sleeve. The government is pretty poor, its credit is not good, its legal tender notes are worth only forty cents on your Wall Street, and we have to pay you a high rate of interest on our loans. Now, if I were in your place, and had as much money as you represent, and was as badly scared as you say you are, I'd go right back to New York and build some war vessels and present them to the government authenticated by Charlotte Colfax, afterward vice-president under General Grant, and by Judge Davis, who presented the delegation. End of section 318. This recording is in the public domain. Section 319 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams it pleases her, and it don't hurt me. Read for LibriVox.org by Jerusha Renstrom. It pleases her, and it don't hurt me. April 1862, 
closed brilliantly for the Union, as New Orleans was captured. General Porter Phelps issued a proclamation which freed the slaves. As on previous occasions, when this bomb was brought out, the President had directed its being stifled and reserved for his occasion. There was wonder that he took no official notice of the premature flash. Taken to task by a friendly critic for his odd omission, he deigned to reply, Well, I feel about it a good deal like that big, burly, good-natured canal laborer who had a little waspy bit of a wife in the habit of beating him. One day she put him out of the house and switched him up and down the street. A friend met him a day or two after and rebuked him with the words, Tom, as you know, I have always stood up for you, but I am not going to do it any longer. Any man may stand for a bully ragging by his wife, but when he takes a switching from her right out on the public highway, he deserves to be horsewhipped. Tom looked up with a wink on his broad face and slapped the interferer on the back with a leg of mutton fist, rejoined, Why, drop it! It pleases her! and it don't hurt me. End of section 319 This recording is in the public domain. Section 320 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Let Him Squeal If He Works one of the northern war governors was admirably loyal and devoted to the reunion, but he was set on doing things his own way and protested every time he was called on for men or material. Lincoln saw that he was willing and was only like the lady who, methinks, protests too much. So he told Secretary Stanton, who laid before him the objections, Never mind, these dispatches do not mean anything. Go right ahead. The governor reminds me of a boy I knew at a launching. He was a small boy chosen to fit the hollow in the midst of the ways where he should lie down, after knocking out the king dog which holds the ship on the stocks when all other checks are removed. The boy did everything right but yelled as if he was being murdered every time the keel rushed over him in the channel. I thought the hide was being peeled from his back, but he wasn't hurt a mite. The shipyard master told me that the boy was always chosen for the job, doing his work well and never being hurt, but that he always squealed in that way. Now that's the way with our governor. Make up your mind that he is not hurt and that he is doing the work all right, and pay no attention to his squealing. To his confidant, General Veal, the president said, we cannot afford to quarrel with the governors of the loyal states about collateral issues. We want their soldiers. End of section 320. This recording is in the public domain. Section 321 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Brigadiers cheap, chargers costly. Read for LibriVox.org. The news was transmitted to the executive that a brigadier general and his escort of cavalry had been gobbled up the current and expressive term, by rebel raiders near Fairfax Courthouse, close enough to resound the echoes of the affray. "'I am sorry of the loss of the horses,' deplored the President. "'I mean that I can make a brigadier general any day, but those horses cost the government a hundred and twenty-five to fifty dollars a head.'" End of section 321. This recording is in the public domain. Section 322 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams To Cure Singing in the Head Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case The key to the trammels which bore upon the several generals of the Army of the Potomac is found in the fears of the inhabitants of the capital that at the least weakness in its defenders there would be a shifting of the two governments, and the Richmond one would replace that at Washington. Footnote this seems unlikely now, but General Lee and many competent judges clung to the belief that, had his General Early held his position at Gettysburg, 
Jefferson Davis, and not Abraham Lincoln, would have occupied Washington's seat, for a time anyway. But if, the story of the Civil War is studded with ifs. But the Navy was not considered in this relation. Hence, there was a proposition to draw the rebel forces from the north by threatening the southern seaports with naval attacks and descents of the Tars and Marines. A deputation visited the President with this project. He listened to its unfolding with his proverbial patient attention and rejoined, This reminds me of the case of a girl out our way, troubled with a singing in the head. All the remedies having been uselessly tried, a plain common horse sense sort of fellow, he bowed to the deputation, was called in. The cure is simple, he said. What is called by sympathy, make a plaster of psalm tunes and apply to the feet. It will draw the singing down and out. Repeated by Frank Carpenter's Recollections. End of section 322. This recording is in the public domain. Section 323 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Bowing to the Boy of Battles Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Bowing to the Boy of Battles Congressman W. D. Kelly wished to procure the admittance of a youth into the naval school. Though a lad he had shown the mettle of a man on two serious occasions while belonging to the gunboat Ottawa, the President has the right to send three candidates to the school yearly, who have served a year in the naval service. Thrilled by the recital of the youth's heroic conduct, the President wrote to the Secretary of the Navy to have the boy put on the list of his appointees. But the subject was found short of the age required. He would not be fourteen until September of that year, and it was but July. Lincoln had the hero appear before him. He admired him frankly and altered the order so as to suit the later date. He bade the boy go home and have a good time during the two months as about the last holiday he would get. The President had reconsidered his first impression that the disturbance was but an artificial excitement. And that's the boy who did so gallantly in those two great battles, he mused. Why, I feel that I should bow to him and not he to me. Authority by Congressman W. D. Kelly. The person was Willie Bladen, USN. End of section 323. This recording is in the public domain. Section 324 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. When Washington was all one tavern. Read for LibriVox.org. As men winning with Mars expect to sup with Pluto, the drinking at the Capitol during the war was horrifying. The bars were overflowing with officers, and while, as Orpheus C. Kerr was saying of the Civil Service Corps, that spilling red ink was very different from spilling red blood, the novices in uniform were staining their new coats with port. Coming out of the West with the unique recommendation, this gentleman from Kentucky never drinks, President Lincoln had only the American standby, the ice-water pitcher, on his sideboard. And up to the last, even when the jubilation upon the war's close made many a stopper fly out of the tabooed bottle, he could say, My example never belied the position I took when I was a young man. So he could reply to a New England woman's temperance deputation, probably believing the caricaturist who pictured old Abe mint juleping with the eagle. They would be rejoiced if they only knew how much I have tried to remedy this great evil. Indeed, he was still meddling when he wrote and spoke against drunken habits in the army, especially among the officers. End of section 324. This recording is in the public domain. Section 325 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Break the Critter, Wear Slim. Lincoln's letters to his generals would be a revelation of character if it were not already famed. He warns Fighting Joe Hooker in June 1863 not to get entangled in the Rappahannock like an ox jumped half over a fence and liable to be torn by dogs, front and rear, without a fair chance to give one way or kick the other. Later, Fight Lee, too, when opportunity offers 
if he stays where he is, fret him, and fret him. Finally, if the head of Lee's army is at Martinsburg, and the tail on the plank road between Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, the critter must be slim somewhere. Could you not break him there? End of section 325. This recording is in the public domain. Section 326 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. How Get Him Out. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. How Get Him Out. During the avalanche of plans to conduct the suppression of the rebellion, a genius proposed what afterwards seemed a forecast for Sherman's march to the sea. But at the time, Lincoln saw in it merely a desperate venture which would detail a rescue party much more important. That reminds me, he said with his whimsical smile, of a cooper out my way, new at the trade and much annoyed by the head falling in as he was hooping in the staves around it. But the bright idea occurred to him to put his boy in to hold up the cover. Only when the job was completed by this inner support, the new problem rose. How to get the boy out? Your plan is feasible, sir. But how are you to get the boy out? The story was originally credited to a Chinese cooper, to whom modern cask making was a mystery. End of section 326. This recording is in the public domain. Section 327 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Pleasure to Preside at Last Read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripling On the 4th of March, 1863, when Congress was closing the session, President Lincoln gave away the bride at a marriage ceremony held by his invitation in the House of Representatives' chamber, this seems a singular and high honor to the couple. Their preeminence and the function being acclaimed by all the notables connected with the field and the forum in the capital was a characteristic testimonial to the comforters whose service to the soldier was inestimable. The pair were John A. Fowle and Elida Rumsey, the man from Boston, the lady from New York. They were both attendants on the hospitals at the front when their acquaintance verged into community and this eventful matrimony. Lincoln had met both in his continuous calls at the hospitals and offered the west wing of the Capitol building for the wedding. He gave away the bride, and in the records figure his name and those of the illustrious witnesses. He gave a huge basket of the finest flowers from the White House Conservatory, he stayed to witness the dedication of the soldier's library founded by Mr. Fowle, who had seen the errant want of reading matter by our soldiers, so few being illiterate. At the President's hint, Congress granted the ground for the library, but the pension office now occupies the site. Sixty-three was a dark year, and the President might well say on this typical incident, during a time there was little marrying, it is for once a pleasure to preside. End of section 327. This recording is in the public domain. Section 328 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. On the Lord's Side. Read for LibriVox.org. On a pastor assuring the President that the Lord is on our side, he replied, I am not at all concerned about that, for I know that the Lord is always on the side of right. But it is my constant anxiety and prayer that I and this nation should be on the Lord's side. End of section 328. This recording is in the public domain. Section 329 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Going to Canaan Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook Going to Canaan Although the South is a poetic country, no bard wrote any Marcellus hymn on that side. One of the few effusions bidding tolerably for public was Lincoln going to Canaan. A parody on the numerous Negro camp meeting lays in which Lincoln was hailed as the coming Moses. 
This burlesque was laid before Mr. Lincoln, he taking the grim relish in hits at him. Caricatures and sallies which great men never spun. Going to Canaan, he is reported to have said, going to Canaan, I expect. End of section 329. This recording is in the public domain. Section 330 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Going to Canaan. Although the South is a poetic country, no bard ever wrote any Marseillais hymn on that side. One of the few effusions bidding tolerably for publicity was Lincoln Going to Canaan, a parody on the numerous Negro camp meeting lays in which Lincoln was hailed as the coming Moses. This burlesque was laid before Mr. Lincoln, he taking the grim relish in hits at him, caricatures and sallies, which great men never spurn. Going to Canaan, he is reported to have said, going to Canaan, I expect. End of section 330. This recording is in the public domain. Section 331 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Fox Appointed Paymaster Read for LibriVox.org by Andy from Invernon, Scotland The President came into the telegraph office of the White House laughing. He had picked up a child's book in his son Tad's room and looked at it. It was a story of a motherly hen, struggling to raise her brood to live honest and useful lives, but in her efforts she was greatly annoyed by a mischievous fox. She had given him many lectures on his wicked ways, and, said the President, I thought I would turn over to see the finny, to see how they came out. This is what it said, and the fox became a good fox and was appointed paymaster in the army. I think it very funny that I should have appointed him a paymaster. I wonder who he is. Such inability to distinguish one officer as good does not speak highly for the eradication of the soldier's prejudice for the gentry. Superintendent Tinker End of section 331. This recording is in the public domain. Section 332 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Risking the Dictatorship. Read for LibriVox.org. Every one of the generals leading the Army of the Potomac was accused of the longing for the presidency, which placed the occupant in a peculiar predicament. Of General Joe Hooker, it was said in the press and in the Washington hotels that he was the man on horseback, and would, at the final success of clearing out the rebel beleaguers, set up as dictator. Hence the letter which Lincoln wrote to him. I have heard in such a way as to believe it, of your recently saying that both the army and the government needed a dictator. Of course, it was not for this, but in spite of it, that I have given you the command of the Army of the Potomac. What I ask of you is military success, and I will risk the dictatorship. It was April, 1863. Hooker issued the stereotyped address, full of confidence on taking command, advanced and withdrew his army after the repulse by Lee. All he scored was the death of Stonewall Jackson, Lee's right hand, and that was an accident. As Lee invaded Maryland, all hopes of Hooker's dictatorship were dispersed in the battle smoke penetrating too far north to be pleasant incense to fallen heroes. End of section 332. This recording is in the public domain. Section 333 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Stage in the Ceaseless March Onward to Victory Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook A Stage in the Ceaseless March Onward to Victory Veterans will remember the peculiar effort on a forced march of the younger or less enduring comrade falling asleep as to all but his eyes and the muscles employed. 
but stepping out and apparently sustained only by the touching of elbows in the lurching from the ruts in the obliterated road. On the night of the stunning news of the last conflict at Chancellorsville, Lincoln could derive no comfort from later intelligence. Late at night, General Halleck, commanding the capital, and Secretary Stanton left him unconsoled. Then his secretary, as long as he stayed, heard the man on whom rested the national hopes, her very future, pace his room without pause save to turn. It was like the fisher on the banks who must keep wake for a chance at a grab of the chains of the ship that may burst through the fog and crush his smack like a coconut shell. At midnight the chief may have stopped to write, for there was a pause, but a breathing spell. Then the pacing again till the attaché left at 3 a.m., when he came in in the morning, not unanxious himself, he found his chief eating breakfast alone in the unquitted room. On the table lay a sheet of written paper, instructions for General Hooker to renew fighting, although it only brought the slap on the other cheek, at Winchester. And still Lee pressed on into Pennsylvania till Harrisburg was menaced. But Meade supplanted fighting Joe, and the Gettysburg wiped out the shame of the later repulses. The private secretary was W. O. Stoddard. End of section 333. This recording is in the public domain. Section 334 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Working for a living makes one practical. Read for LibriVox.org by Rebecca Case. The year 1863 was black-lettered in the North by disaster. General Hooker had been badly beaten by General Lee. The Confederate advance into Pennsylvania shook the strongest faith in the triumph of the Federal arms, and the victory of Gettysburg was attained at a bloody cost. The draft riots in New York excited a fear that the discontent with the colossal strife was deep-rooted. General Thomas at Chickamauga, saved the Union Army from destruction, but the call for 300,000 three-years men denoted that the end was not even glimpsed. Nevertheless, this latter feat of arms gladdened tremulous Washington, and among the exploits was cited to the President the desperate victualling of General Thomas' exhausted troops by General Garfield. He performed a dangerous ride from Rosencrantz to the beleaguered victor and brought him craved-for provisions. "'How is it?' inquired President Lincoln of an officer, courier of the details, "'that Garfield did in two weeks what would have taken one of your West Pointers two months to accomplish.' The recollection was perfectly well understood by the regular, who thought the amateur commander meddled too much with the operations of the field. Because he was not educated at West Point, was the reply, but half in jest. No, that was not the reason, corrected the questioner. It was because, when a boy, he had to work for a living. He rewarded the purveyor general with the rank of major general. End of section 334. This recording is in the public domain. Section 335 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hold on and cha. While in July 1863, General Grant was held at Vicksburg by a siege which he successfully prosecuted, the New York draft riots broke out. Without knowing from experience that a riot, however pretentious, must cease when the mob are drunk or spent, the inevitable contingencies, in his alarm, General Halleck, at Washington, begged General Grant to send reinforcements that he might not weaken the capital defenses to any extent. The commander of the West declined and referred to the President. General Horace Porter was on Grant's staff and saw his smiles as he read the dispatch from headquarters. "'The President has more nerve than any of his advisers,' observed he to his officers, for Lincoln did not agree with his cabinet, as to the revolution in the rear, and the message was sent by the staff. I have seen your dispatch expressing your unwillingness to break your hold. Neither am I willing. 
hold on with a bulldog grip and chaw and choke as much as possible. End of section 335. This recording is in the public domain. Section 336 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Great National Job. Read for LibriVox.org. The signs look better. The father of waters again goes unvexed to the sea. The job was a great national one, and let none be banned who bore an honorable part in it. And while those who cleared the great river may well be proud, even that is not all. It is hard to say that anything has been more bravely and well done than at Antietam, Murfreesboro, Gettysburg, and on many fields of lesser note. Nor must Uncle Sam's web feet be forgotten. Not only on the deep sea, the broad bay, and the rapid river, but also up the narrow, muddy bay, and wherever the ground was a little damp, they have been and made their tracks. Thanks to all for the great republic. Letter by President Lincoln, regretting inability to attend a meeting of unconditional union men at Springfield, Illinois, dated August 26, 1863, to J. C. Conkling. End of section 336. This recording is in the public domain. Section 337 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams for Flying a Man Alive. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. For Flying a Man Alive. A representative of Ohio, Alexander Long, proposed in the House a recognition of the Southern Confederacy. It must be borne in mind that before the firing on the supply steamer at Charleston, which was dispatched surreptitiously, not to offend the sympathizer's susceptibilities, many good citizens, dwelling on the silence of the Constitution as to succession, said openly that they did not see why the state chafing under the partnership all the original thirteen made, should not withdraw peacefully. Long was not solitary in his unseemly proposition, which, however, could never have been otherwise than untimely after the first shot. General Garfield met the issue with indignation. He called the act treason, and denounced the author as a second Benedict Arnold. He entreated loyal representatives to not believe that another such growth on the soil of Ohio deformed the face of nature and darkened the light of God's day. When this speech met the President's eye, he hastened to thank General Garfield for having flayed long alive. End of section 337. This recording is in the public domain. Section 338 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. One on em not dead yet. Read for LibriVox.org by Carol Stripling. As communications were cut off with the North, intense anxiety was occasioned there by the situation in November 1863 of General Burnside, packed in Knoxville, Tennessee, by Longstreet's dreaded veterans. At last, a telegram reached the War Department, vaguely telling a firing heard in the direction of Knoxville. The President reading expressed gladness in spite of the remaining uncertainty. Why, said he to the group of officers and officials, it reminds me of a neighbor of ours in Indiana, in the brush, who had a numerous family of young ones. They were all the time wandering off into the scrub, but she was relieved as to their being lost by a squall every now and then. She would say, Thank the laws, there is one still alive. That is, I hope one of our generals is in the thicket, but still alive and kicking. Indeed, Burnside resisted a night-storming party, and Longstreet was not a lane that knew no turning, but turned and retreated. End of section 338. This recording is in the public domain. Section 339 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The South Like an Ash Cake. Read for LibriVox.org. At the end of 1864, the Confederacy was scotched, if not quite killed. Sherman had halved it by striking into Savannah. East Tennessee and southwest Virginia were cut by stonemen. Alabama and Mississippi were traversed by Grierson and Wilson. In sum, the new map resembled that of a territory charted off into sections. 
President Lincoln said that its face put him in mind of a weary traveller in the West, who came at night to a small log cabin. The homesteader and his wife said they would put him up, but had not a bite of victuals to offer him. He accepted the truss of litter and was soon asleep. But he was awakened by whispers letting out that in the fire ashes a hoe-cake was baking. The woman and her mate were merry over how they had defrauded the stranger of the food. Feeling mad at having been sent to bed supperless, uncommon mean in that part, he pretended to wake up and came forth to sit at the dying fire. He pretended, too, that he was ill from worry. The fact is, my father, when he died, left me a large farm. But I had no sooner taken possession of it than mortgages began to appear. My farm was situated like this. He took up the loggerhead poker to illustrate, drawing lines in the ashes so as to enclose the ash-cake. First one man got so much of it at one side. He cut off a side of the hidden dough. Then another brought in a mortgage and took off another piece there. Then another here, and another there, and here, and there, drawing the poker through the ashes to make the figure plain, until, he said, there was nothing of the farm left for anybody, which I presume is the case with your cake. And I reckon, concluded Mr. Lincoln, that the prospect is now very good of the South being as cut up as the ash cake. Telegraph Manager A. Chandler. End of section 339. This recording is in the public domain. Section 340 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. I count for something. The true lovers of the South were sorely wrung in 1864 by the Emperor Napoleon taking advantage of the lock-up of the United States to set a puppet in the Austrian Archduke Maximilian on the imperial throne, so called, of Mexico. It was said that the cabinet of Lincoln were divided on the subject, whereon the Marquis of Chambrun, having the ear of the executive, called on him and inquired on the real state, would the United States intervene, if only by winking at a filibustering expedition from the south, with northern volunteers accessory, to assist the natives against the usurper. There has been war enough, was his rejoinder, with that sadness which Secretary Boutwell declares inseparable from him, but not due to the depression of public affairs. I know what the American people want, but, thank God, I count for something, and during my second term there will be no more fighting." It was left for his successor, with the two armies disbanded but still wedded for slaughter, to expel the French by the mere threat of their union to restore the Republic. End of section 340. This recording is in the public domain. Section 341 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Read for LibriVox.org by Ruins. Passes no good for Richmond. A person solicited the President for a pass to Richmond, but the other replied caustically, I should be happy to oblige you if my passes thither were respected, but I have issued two hundred and fifty thousand to go to Richmond, and not one man has gone there yet. End of section 341. This recording is in the public domain. Section 342 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Mare is the Better Horse. Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. The Mare is the Better Horse. The Lowell Citizen Editor participated in a presidential reception in 1864, just before the fall of Richmond. The usher giving intimation that the President would see his audience at once, all were ushered into the inner room. Abraham Lincoln's countenance bore that open, benignant outline expected, but what struck us especially was its cheerful, wide-awake expressiveness, never met with in the pictures of our beloved chief. The secret may have been that the Secretary Stanton, middle-aged, well-built, stern-visaged man, had brought in his budget good news from Grant. After saluting his little circle of callers, they were seated and attended to in turn. First in order was a citizen of Washington praying for pardon in the case of a deserter. Well, said the President, after carefully reading the petition, it is only natural for one to want to pardon, but I must in that case have a responsible name that I know. I don't know you. Do you live in the city? Yes. 
Do you know him, the mare? Yes. Well, the mare is the better horse. Bring me his name, and I will let the boy off. The soldier was pardoned. End of section 342. This recording is in the public domain. Section 343 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Real Superior Thing to the Sham Battle Read for LibriVox.org On the 25th of March, 1864, in honor of the President's renewal of office, a grand review had been fixed at City Point, outside the Capitol. Whatever the opinion of the old military, the volunteers gave the civilian commander the soldier's vote. In imitation of the French soldiers dubbing Bonaparte the little corporal, after his Italian victories, the Americans promoted Lincoln to be their captain, as Walt Whitman worded it, after his repeated reinstatement. He was rapturously greeted by his boys in blue. But the arrangements made at Washington in the undisturbed council were upset by General Lee. On that very morning he had attacked and had taken Fort Stedman. To drive him out required a veritable action, not terminating for several hours. Lincoln visited the scene of the restoration after the carnage, and on hearing regrets that the review, the chief recreation of the Washingtonians, he checked the light-souled attendants with, This victory is better than any review. End of section 343. This recording is in the public domain. Section 344 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Tool Turned on the Handle Read for LibriVox.org by Harold Stewart The scales having fallen from our sight, and the figure of the greatest American, standing out colossal and clean-cut for posterity to worship is without a blemish. It is hard to measure the conceit of the clique of politicians, pettifoggers, and office-seekers, certainly assisting in the advancement of Abraham Lincoln, from confined obscurity in the West to the choice of the Northern nation. That was not enough, but still gauging him with their tape, they withheld justice from him, after he displayed his worth in meeting the impending crisis. When on the heels of the call for 300,000 men in 1863, came in spring, 1864, another for 500,000, to fortify General Grant in his finishing maneuvers, a murmur was heard. Chicago, gallantly having done her part, thought it was pumping at a void. A deputation from Cook County, headed by Lincolnites, departed for the capital to object to the summons. It was thought by his friends and long supporters that their own elect could not resist their plea or turn it off with a joke. This deputation fined down to three persons, as it was not a patriotic quest. One of them also wished to balk, being Joseph Medill, editor of the Chicago Tribune. As a matter of course, Secretary of War Stanton refused the indulgence, obdurate as he was. The President was likewise averse, but he did consent to go over the matter with Stanton. The result was the same. All was left solely to Lincoln, since the personal argument was implied by the mediums selected. I, said Medill to Miss Tarbell, I shall never forget how Mr. Lincoln suddenly lifted his head and turned on us a black and frowning face. Gentlemen, said he, in a voice full of bitterness, after Boston, Chicago has been the chief instrument in bringing this war on the country. The Northwest has opposed the South, as New England opposed the South. It was you who were largely responsible for causing the blood to flow as it has. You called for war until we had it. You called for emancipation, and I have given it to you. Whatever you have asked, you have had. Now you come here, begging to be let off from the call for men which I have made to carry out the war you demanded. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves. I have a right to expect better things of you. Go home and raise your 6,000 extra men, the Cook County rate. And you, Medill, you are acting like a coward. 
you and your tribune have had more influence than any paper in the Northwest in making this war. Go home and send us those men. They went home, and they raised and sent those men. End of section 344. This recording is in the public domain. Section 345 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Sooner the fowl by hatching the egg than smashing it. Still the question is not whether the Louisiana government, as it stands, is quite all that is desirable. The question is, will it be wiser to take it as it is and help to improve it, or to reject and disperse? Concede that the new government is to what it should be as the egg to the fowl, we shall sooner have the fowl by hatching the egg than by smashing it. Laughter. Speech by A. Lincoln, his last, in answer to a serenade at the White House, 11th April, 1865, amid illuminations for the victories. End of section 345. This recording is in the public domain. Section 346 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Too busy to go into another business. Read for LibriVox.org. There came into the presidential hearing a man of French accent from New Orleans. He was evidently a diffident person, not knowing how precisely to state his case. But the burden of it was that he was a real estate holder in New Orleans, and since the advent of military rulers there, he could not collect his rents, his living. "'Your case, my friend,' said the President, "'may be a hard one, but it might be worse. "'If with your musket you had taken your chances "'with the boys before Richmond, "'you might have found your bed and board before now. "'But the point is, what would you have me do for you? "'I have much to do, and the courts have been open "'to relieve me in this regard.' "'The applicant, still embarrassed, said, "'I am not in the habit of appearing before big men. "'And for that matter,' it was quickly responded, "'you have no need to change your habit.' for you are not before very big men now, playfully adding, I am too busy to go into the rent collection business. End of 346. This recording is in the public domain. Section 347 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Scale of Rebels. Read for LibriVox.org by Capnallegra. When, at the finale, Lincoln reproved his own wife for using the hackneyed expression of rebels, suggesting confederates, as officially accepted on both sides, a wit commented, The Southerners will be like the Jews. As a poor one is simply a Jew, a rich one a Hebrew, and a Rothschild an Israelite, so it will be rebels, confederates, and our Southern brothers anew. End of section 347. This recording is in the public domain. Section 348 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams One War at a Time Read for LibriVox.org by Jerusha Renstrom One War at a Time When the Austrian Archduke, Maximilian, was foisted upon Mexico as its emperor by Napoleon III, the Southerners, who did not have their belly full of fighting by 1864, more than hinted that they would range shoulder to shoulder with the Federals to try to expel him and the mercenary Marshal Bazaine. But the President returned sagaciously, one war at a time. It was under his successor, Johnson, that the expulsion was effected and the upstart executed by the exasperated Mexicans themselves. Note, this was undoubtedly said, but Mr. Henry Watcherson, in his lecture on Lincoln, dates it as at the commencement of the war, when Secretary Seward, to forestall possible European alliances in favor of the Confederate States, proposed waging war against France and Spain, already allied, and challenging Russia and England to follow. End of section 348. This recording is in the public domain.
section 349 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Again the Government. Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew from Invernon, Scotland. In the summer of 1864, the Governor General of Canada paid the President a visit with a numerous escort. During the late unpleasantness, as much comfort as possible under the Neutrality Act was believed to have been given the raiders in the border towns, as witness the St. Albans bank steel and the outfitting of blockade runners. But they were treated at Washington with perfect courtesy. The head of the British party, at the conclusion, said with some sarcasm in his genial tone, I understand, Mr. President, that everybody is entitled to a vote in this country. If we remain until November, can we vote? You would have to make a longer residence, which I could desire, politely replied the host. Only I fear we should not gain much by that. For there was a countryman of your excellency from the sister kingdom of Ireland, though who came here and on landing wanted to exercise the privilege you seek, to vote early and often. But the officials at Castle Garden landing stage laughed at him, saying that he knew nothing about parties, to which he replied, Bothered the parties. It is the same here with me as in the old country. I am again the government. You see, he wanted to vote on the side of the rebellion, your Excellency would then be no more at a loss to decide on which side. End of section 349. This recording is in the public domain. Section 350 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Plowing around a log. A state governor came to Washington, furious at the number of troops headquarters commanded of him and the mode of collecting them. Irate as he was, General Fry saw him bidding good bye to the capital with a placid, even pleased mien. The general inquired of Lincoln himself how he had been so miraculously mollified. I suppose you had to make large concessions to him as he returns from you entirely satisfied, suggested the general. Oh, no, replied the president. I did not concede anything. You know how that Illinois farmer managed the big log that lay in the middle of his field? To the inquiries of his neighbors, he announced he had gotten rid of it. How did you do it? they asked. It was too big to haul away, too knotty to split, too wet and soggy to burn. Whatever did you do? Well, now, boys, if you won't tell the secret, I'll tell you how. I just plowed round it. Now, Fry, don't tell anybody, but I just plowed around the governor. On the authority of General James B. Fry. End of section 350. This recording is in the public domain. Section 351 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not the Right Clay to Cement a Union. Read for LibriVox.org. In 1864, Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, and a great authority among the farming class and the extremists, consented to attend an abortive peace consultation with Southern representatives, George N. Sanders, Beverly Tucker, and Clement C. Clay, at Niagara Falls. Clay was so set upon Jefferson Davis being still left as a ruler in some high degree, which would condone his action as president of the succeeded states, the project, like others, was a fizzle, as Lincoln would have said. To our president, Henry Clay was the beau ideal of a statesman, but it was clear that his namesake was not of the clay to cement a new union. End of section 351. This recording is in the public domain. Section 352 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams the man down south read by andy from inverarnon scotland 
In August 1864, a painful absorption was noticed in the President's manner, growing more and more strained and depressed. The ancient smile was fainter when it flitted over the long-drawn features, and the eyes seemed to bury themselves out of light in the cavernous sockets, too dry for tears. These withdrawing fits were not uncommon, but they had become frequent this summer, and at the reception he had mechanically passed the welcome and given the handshake. But then the abstraction became so dense that he let an old friend stand before him without a glance, much less the usual hearty greeting expected. The newcomer, alarmed, ventured to arouse him, he shook off his absence of mind, seized the hand proffered him, and, while grasping it, exclaimed as though no others were by, also staring and pained. Excuse me, I was thinking, thinking of a man down south. He was thinking of Sherman, that military genius who burned his ships and penetrated a hostile country, like Cortes and from whom no reliable news had been received while he was investing Savannah. Lincoln had in his mind been accompanying his captain on that forlorn march, smashing things to the sea. End of section 352 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andy M E L Y S W S. Section three hundred and fifty three of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Dismembered Yellow Dog. Read for LibriVox .org by Magdalena Cook. The Dismembered Yellow Dog. Toward the end of December, 1864, the news trickled in of the utter discomfiture of Confederate General Hood's army at Nashville, by General Thomas. An enthusiastic friend of the President said to him, There is not enough left of Hood to make a dish-rag, is there? Well, no, Medill. I think Hood's army is in about the identical fix of Bill Sykes' dog. The application from Dickens is noticeably as showing Lincoln's eclectic reading. Down in Sangamon County. Did you never hear it? As a Chicago man, Mr. Medill might be allowed to be ignorant of Sangamon Valley incidents. Well, this Bill Sykes had a long, hungry yellow dog, forever getting into the neighbors' meat smokehouses and chicken coops and the like. They had tried to kill it a hundred odd times, but the dog was always too smart for them. Finally, one of them got a coon's innards and filled it up with gunpowder and tied a piece of punk in the nozzle. When he sees this dog a coming around, he fired this punk, split open a corn cake and squoze the intestine inside all nice and slab, and threw out the lot. The dog was always ravenous, and swallowed the heap. Ka-chunk! Pretty soon, along came an explosion, so the man said. The head of the animal lit on the stoop. The forelegs caught a straddle off the fence. The hind legs kicked in the ditch, and the rest of the critter lay around loose. Pretty soon, who should come along but Bill, and he was looking for his dog when he heard the supposed gun go off. The neighbour said innocent-like, William, I guess that there is not much of that dog left to catch anybody's fowls. Well, no, admitted Sykes. I see plenty of pieces, but I guess that dog, as a dog, ain't of much account. Just so, Medill, there may be fragments of Hood's army around, but I guess that army, as an army, ain't of much more account. Joseph Medill was editor of the Chicago Tribune, who was one of the Coteri who claimed to have discovered Abraham Lincoln and surely added propulsion to the wave carrying him to Washington. Another version of this anecdote is applied to the breaking up of General Early's rashly advanced army in July, but it would seem, by Mr. Medill's name, that this is the genuine. The other is not told in the Western vernacular of Mr. William Sykes. End of section 353. This recording is in the public domain. Section 354 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Meteorological Omen. Read for LibriVox.org. 
The second inauguration day was amid the usual March weather in the District of Columbia, like the fickle April in unkinder latitudes, smile and scowl. But as the President kissed the book, there was a sudden parting of the clouds, and a sunburst broke in all its splendor. This is testified to by the newspaper correspondents, Frank Moore, Noah Brooks, and others. The President said next day, Did you notice the sunburst? It made me jump. End of section 354. This recording is in the public domain. Section 355 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Did she take the wink to herself? Miss Anna Dickinson, lecturing by invitation in the House of Representatives Hall, alluded to the sunburst which came upon the President on Inauguration Day, just as he took the oath of office. The illustrious auditor sat directly in front of the lady, so that he also faced the reporter's gallery behind her. Lincoln amiably glanced over her head, caught sight of an acquaintance among the newspaper men, and winked to him as she made the reference to the so esteemed omen. Next day he said to this gentleman, Noah Brooks, I wonder if Miss Dickinson saw me wink at you. End of section 355. This recording is in the public domain. Section 356 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Going Down with Collars Flying Read for LibriVox.org by Cagliostro All the wire pulling of the many contestants for the presidential chair failed to get a prize upon it. It was held that there must be, in excelsis, no swapping of horses in crossing the stream, still turbid and dangerous. So the National Convention, held at Baltimore, perched by this time of its former treasonable activity, and the soldiers' fair held there, the President had alluded to the time when he had to be whisked through as past a bed of vipers, and said, Blessings on the men who have wrought these changes. All the states voted for their incumbents save Missouri, which stood for the general grant, but the votes transferred to Lincoln. The opinion was unanimous. Within two months he was driven by circumstances to call out 500,000 men. His partisans regretted the necessity and, on the old story that the people were tired of the war, declared it would prove injurious to his re-election. But it is undisputed that about half of the levies never reached their mustering point. The art sand wells of the marplots were equalled only by the prodigality and persistency of the parents to save their sons from the evils of camp life. It is but fair that to the Puritans to accept their plea that the loss of them fighting the country's battle did not so distress them. Lincoln replied to the political argument nobly. Gentlemen, it is not necessity that I should be re-elected, but it is necessary that our brave boys in the front should be supported and the country saved. The hackneyed phrase had led to his party being nicknamed the Union Saver. I shall call out the 500,000 more men, and if I go down under the measure, I will go down like the Cumberland, with my colours flying. On the 8th of March, 1862, the Confederate ironclad ram Merrimack ran into and sank the Union sloop of war, Cumberland, nearly half of the latter's company perishing. Acting Captain Morris refused to strike his flag. End of section 356. This recording is in the public domain. Section 357 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. There must be the bell mule. Read for LibriVox.org. President Lincoln formally disavowed the desire erroneously attributed to him by military critics that he wished to die with soldiers' harness on his back. To quote General Grant, to whom he said in their first interview, when the victor of the West was summoned to Washington to be made lieutenant general, and given full command over all the national forces, Mr. Lincoln stated to me that he had never professed to be a military man, or to know how campaigns should be conducted. 
and never wanted to interfere with them, but that procrastination on the part of his commanders, and the pressure of people at the North and of Congress, had forced him into issuing the executive orders. He did not know but that they were all wrong, and did not know that some of them were. End of section 357. This recording is in the public domain. Section 358 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Root Hog or Die. Read for LibriVox.org by Jennifer 13, Chicago, Illinois. Root Hog or Die. In February 1865, permission was requested from the national government for three appointees on a peace commission to confer with the executive. It was granted, but the parties were not allowed to enter Washington as they wanted to do, to give more luster to the course. The interview of the President, Mr. Seward the bottle-holder, as it was facetiously said about this sparring match for breath, was with Alexander Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell, of Alabama, on board of the River Queen, off Fort Monroe. The discussion lasted four hours, but, though on friendly terms as between gentlemen, resulted in nothing, for the President held that the first step which must be taken was the recognition of the Union. As was his habit, he rounded off the parley with one of his stories apropos. Mr. Hunter, a Virginian, had assumed that, if the South consented to peace on the basis of the Emancipation Proclamation, the slaves would precipitate ruin on not only themselves but the entire Southern society. Mr. Lincoln said to Henry J. Raymond of the Times, New York, that, I waited for Seward to answer that argument, but, as he was silent, I at length said, Mr. Hunter, you ought to know a great deal better about that than I, for you have always lived under the slave system. I can only say, in reply to your statement of the case, that it reminds me of a man out in Illinois by the name of Case, who undertook to raise a very large herd of hogs. It was a great trouble to feed them, and how to get around this was a puzzle to him. At length he hit upon a plan of planting a great field of potatoes, and, when they were sufficiently grown, turned the whole herd into the field, and let them have full swing, thus saving not only the labor of feeding the hogs, but also that of digging the potatoes. Charmed with his sagacity, he stood one day leaning against the fence, counting his hogs, when a neighbor came along. "'Well, well,' said he, "'this is all very fine, Mr. Case. Your hogs are doing very well just now. But, you know, out here in Illinois, the frost comes early, and the ground freezes for a foot deep. Then what are you going to do?' This was a view of the matter Mr. Case had not taken into account. Butchering time for hogs was way on in December or January. He scratched his head, and at length stammered, "'Well, it may come pretty hard on their snouts, but I don't see but it will be root hog or die.'" The speaker had no need to draw this moral as to the fate of the South after the war, for black or white, from a case in Illinois. The Negro minstrel song was current then, which supplied the apt allusion, and was called Root Hog or Die. It may well be that the sailors conveying the baffled commissioners to Richmond, or the soldiers about the other government, were chanting the instructive and prophetic chorus, It don't make a bit of difference to either you or I, but big pig or little pig, it is Root Hog or Die. Mr. Raymond, in chronicling this anecdote, tells of the New York Herald giving the story in a mangled and pointless copy, but it was current in conversation. Mr. Lincoln was in hopes that it would not leak out lest some oversensitive people should imagine there was a degree of levity in the intercourse between us. Quite otherwise, for the majority thought the illustration as good as any argument— and would have deemed the speaker prophet if they could have foreseen that the South would have to buckle down to hard work to redeem the losses. End of section 358. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jennifer 13, Chicago, Illinois.
Section 357 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Grant Brand of Whiskey. Read for LibriVox.org. Although a Kentuckian, orthodox jest, Lincoln was so known for his rare temperance convictions that no one carped at the buffet at his official house, being clear of the decanters characterizing it in previous administrations. The total abstinence societies therefore hailed him as an apostle of their creed. Consequently, they had been pleased, on certain occasions, at his espousing and cheering their counsel. When General Grant was elevating himself by his string of solid victories in the West, it was an object of cavilling, by the adherence of the generals eclipsed and foreseeing his becoming lieutenant-general, and the slander circulated that Philip Sober got the credit of Philip Drunk, perpetrating his plans with the dram-bottle at his elbow. Lincoln heard out this spiteful diatribe with his habitual patience, when, calmly looking at the chairman, he responded, "'Gentlemen, since you are so familiar with the general's habits, would you oblige me with the name of General Grant's favorite brand of whiskey? I want so to send some barrels of it to my other generals.' The deputation withdrew in poor order. Major Eckert says that Mr. Lincoln told him he had heard this story. It was good, and would be very good if he had told it, but he had not. He supposed it was charged to him to give it currency. He went on to say, "'The original is back in King George's time. Bitter complaints were made against General Wolfe that he was mad. The king, who could be more justly accused of that, replied, "'I wish he would bite some of my other generals.' End of section 359. This recording is in the public domain. Section 360 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A General at Last. Without disparaging the Lincoln generals, it may be said that they will never occupy a niche in Walhalla besides Napoleon's marshals and Washington's commanders but Washington society liked them one with another for affording opportunities of outings to the grand reviews and parades. One, that to Bull Run, turned out a failure, and the Southerners chasing the fugitives had the pickings of the iced wines, game pies, and cold chicken, which Brick Pomeroy saw strewing the road back. Grant's negligent and war-worn uniform did not remind anyone of the gay and brilliant period of Old Fuss and Feathers, the veteran Scott. But Grant and the other Westerner, Lincoln, mutually pleased at their first meeting, the latter emerged from the interview exclaiming with joy, At last we have a general. End of section 360. This recording is in the public domain. Section 361 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams A Fizzle Anyhow Read for LibriVox.org by Cagliostro American Dash was, in military matters as in others, opposed to the engineering schemes dear to the scientific officers fresh from West Point Academy. Among their projects was the Dutch Gap Canal at City Point. When Grant as his lieutenant general was conducted by the president to see the forces and their positions, the guide made known his opinion of the undertaking in his frank manner, consonant with the new commander's bluntness. Grant, do you know what this reminds me of? In the outskirts of our Springfield, there was a blacksmith of an ingenious turn who could make something of pretty nigh anything in his line but he got hold of a bit of iron one day that he attempted to make into a corn knife. But the stuff would not hold an edge, so he reasoned it would be a claw hammer. But that would be a loss of overplus, and he tried to make an axe head. That did not come out a five-pounder, and, getting disgusted, he blew the fire to a white heat around a metal mass, when, yanking it out with his tongs, he flung it into the water tub hard by, and cried out, Well, if I can't make anything of you, I'll make a fizzle anyhow. Well, General, I am afraid that that's what we'll make of the Dutch Cap Canal. End of section 361. This recording is in the public domain. Section 362 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. 
Forget Over a Grave, read for LibriVox.org. When the Chronicle of Washington had the noble courage to speak well of Stonewall Jackson, accidentally shot as a brave soldier, however mistaken as an American, Lincoln wrote to the editor, I honor you for your generosity to one who, though contending against us in a guilty cause, was nevertheless a gallant man. Let us forget his sins over a fresh-made grave. End of section 362. This recording is in the public domain. Section 363 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. If he felt that way, start. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. If he felt that way, start. Although Colonel Dana of the private branch of the War Office Intelligence Department might have claimed exemption from active service, he never spared himself, though such a messenger ran not only the common military dangers, but of the Johnnies treating him as a spy. During the battles of the wilderness, acute was a trepidation in Washington, where no news had come since a couple of days, Grant having cut loose and buried himself in the midst of the foes. Nevertheless, Dana had a train at Maryland Avenue to take him to the front, and a horse and escort to see him farther. He came to take the President's last orders but the other had been reflecting on the perils into which he would be sending his favorite dispatch-bearer. You can't tell where Lee is or what he is doing. Jeb Stewart is on the rampage pretty lively between the Rappahannock and the Rapidan. It is considerable risk, and I do not like to expose you to it. But I am ready, and we are equipped, if it comes to the worst, to run. Well now, if you feel that way, Start. E. P. Mitchell from Dana. End of section 363. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence. December 29, 2008, in Brampton, Ontario. Section 364 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Figures will prove anything. Read for LibriVox.org by Morgan Dowtrick. Figures will prove anything. Towards the finish of the rebellion, Lincoln was asked to what number the enemy might amount. He replied with singular readiness, The Confederates have 1,200,000 men in the field. Astonishment being manifested at the precision, he went on, smiling. Every time a Union commander gets licked, he says the enemy outnumbered him three or four times. We have three or four hundred thousand, so logic is logic. They are three times that, say, one million two hundred thousand. As a fact, at the Grand Review before President Johnson, the two armies of Grant and Sherman, May 1865, two hundred thousand veterans filed past. Lincoln should have lived to see that glorious march past. End of section 364. This recording is in the public domain. Section 365 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. I don't want to, but that's it if I must die. In the ferment, as the term of Lincoln's first office holding was terminating, the old war fever returned by which little Mac McClellan, idol of the army, was hailed as the hope of the country. Only this time the presage was that General Grant had only to secure that phantasm the capture of Richmond, to be nominated and elected. This reached the President's ears through the hanged good-natured friend, as Sheridan, the wit, not the general, calls the stinging tongue. Well, drawled Mr. Lincoln, I feel very much like the man who said he did not particularly want to die, but if he had got to die, it was precisely the disease he wanted to die of. End of section 365 this recording is in the public domain. Section 366 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Best Let an Elephant Go Read for LibriVox.org 
by David Lawrence. Best Let an Elephant Go A rebel emissary, the notorious Jacob Thompson, was reported by the Secret Service as slipping through the North and trying to get passage to Europe on the Allen steamship out of Portland, Maine, or Canada. Brevet General Dana, confidential officer to the War Department and the President, inquired if the fugitive was to be detained at Portland, where the Provost Marshal thought he could capture him. Secretary Stanton wanted him apprehended. Hmm, said Lincoln, who was being shaved. I don't know as I have any apprehension in that quarter. When you have an elephant on your hands and he wants to run away, better let him run. Note, the unbeknownst story has been applied to this tolerated escape. End of section 366. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, December 29th, 2008. Section 367 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. History repeats. Read for LibriVox.org. There is a double echo in the Lincolnian saying, No surrender, though at the end of one or a hundred defeats. From General President Taylor's reply at Buena Vista, General Taylor never surrenders. To its antecedent, not so well authenticated, of General Cambron at Waterloo, the old guard dies but does not surrender. End of section 367. This recording is in the public domain. Section 368 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not the President, but the Old Friend. Read for LibriVox.org by Cagliostro. In February 1865, General Grant's plans were so well shaped that, with the reinforcement of General Sherman, returned from his march to Savannah, he could count on crushing up Richmond as an egg under trip hammers. Before this, the doom was registered, for the southerners were at the end of their men, as before they had been at that of their means. Bridges burned or blown up, the rebel army was pouring out of their capital with the fear that their one or two ways of flight were already blocked by Sheridan or Sherman. The desperate attempt to arm slaves against their coming deliverer was the last kick. Lee clung to Richmond in hope that his lieutenant, Johnston, would check the oncomer, but he was compelled to notify his president and colleagues that flies were their only resource when he could no longer fight. Lincoln was at Petersburg at Grant's headquarters when, a few miles off, Davis received fatal intelligence that Lee was being deserted so freely that there would not be a bodyguard left him. He fled to be ignominiously captured in female disguise. His lair was hot when Lincoln entered it and made it his closet, whence he issued his orders. Soon after this occupation, the victor heard the name of Pickett announced to him. The southern general, George Pickett, was a protégé of his, as he smoothed his entry upon the West Point Military Academy book when he was a congressman. Without either knowing it, the hero was lying dead on a hard-fought field close by. But Lincoln ordered her admittance. She was accompanied by her little son. This alone would have prevailed over the president, but, as she formally addressed him as the authority, he interrupted. Not the president, but George's old friend. And beckoning the wandering boy to him, with the irresistible attraction of men who love the young, and are intuitively loved by them, he said, Tell your father, rascal, that I forgive him for the sake of your mother's smile and your own bright eyes. This reconciliation on the fall of this word was a token of the forgivingness of the North toward the Charleston foes. End of section 368. This recording is in the public domain. Section 369 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Close your eyes. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Magdalena Cook. Close your eyes. The Marquis of Chambrun, a French volunteer who entered the Lincoln Circle, relates in a more elegant strain the above incident. He states that Thompson and Sanders were informed upon, and Stanton repeated the information to the President with a view of having them intercepted. But the other in his tender voice responded, Let us close our eyes and leave them pass unnoticed. End of section 369. This recording is in the public domain. Section 370 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Don't judge by appearances. The President's recklessness seems incredible as to going about the capital, as far as he knew and wished, without escort, but his browsing, to use his word, about the perilous front while the concluding actions were enveloping Petersburg preliminarily to the rush at Richmond, partake of the nature of a fanatic's daring. This is the support to the otherwise taxing story told by Dr. J. E. Burris of New York, then a volunteer soldier at the place. He states that Lincoln, so shabbily dressed as to be taken for a farmer or a planter, was so treated by soldiery before a tobacco warehouse under guard. They wanted tobacco and begged him to allow some to be turned out. He approached a young lieutenant commanding the post, but the latter was insolent to the old southerner. The latter sent a soldier to General Grant, who himself rode up, post-haste, at the summons. The soldiers were given some of the Indian weed, and the donor, turning to the impertinent officer, who had thought him a converted reb, said, Young sir, do not judge by appearances, and for the future treat your elders with more respect. End of section 370. This recording is in the public domain. Section 371 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Nothing can touch him further. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell Returning to Washington from Richmond, Lincoln read twice to friends on the journey from his pocket Shakespeare. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, Nothing can touch him further. End of section 371. This recording is in the public domain. Section 372 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Went and returned. Read for LibriVox.org. On the last days of March, 1865, contained the three battles closing with that of Five Forks, signalizing the collapse of the Confederacy at Richmond. The President at the front sent the news of victories to the Cabinet at home. After the battles, the advance of the triumphing Unionists. On Monday morning, Lincoln was enabled to telegraph the talismanic words so often dreamed of in the last agonizing years of fluctuating hope, "'Richmond has fallen! I am about to enter!' Secretary Staunton of the War Office immediately implored, Do not peril your life. But in the morning he received this line from the most independent president known since Jackson. Received your dispatch, went to Richmond, and returned this morning. Expostulated with by Speaker Colfax on the apparent rashness, for he had completed the foolhardy act by occupying President Jefferson Davis's vacated house, he replied with the calm of a man of destiny, I should have been alarmed myself if any other person had been president and gone there, but I did not feel in any danger whatever. Note. Mark the analogy in great men. General Grant says of his first emotions in war, the Mexican, if some one else had been colonel and I had been lieutenant colonel, I do not think I would have felt any trepidation. End of section 372. This recording is in the public domain. Section 373 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams The Clear Foresight Read for LibriVox.org The Clear Foresight On the 2nd of April, 1865, the President was at City Point, Grant's headquarters, until he started forth 
for the culminating series of ceaseless strokes, that morning attack along the whole line had been commanded, and the president telegraphed to his wife at the capital during the raging battle. He knew that already the hostile lines had been pierced in one or more places, and that Sheridan's cavalry rush was supported by a division of infantry. He concludes foreseeing that at length pegging away was over and slugging begun. All is now favorable. In truth, on that same day, the rebel government at Richmond faded thence like a mirage, and within one week General Lee surrendered his enfeebled relic of a grand army. End of section 373. This recording is in the public domain. Section 374 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Do it unbeknownst. Read for LibriVox.org by Hannah Dowell. On April 7th, 1865, General Grant had enveloped the enemy so that he could be assured that the rebel government, if it remained in Richmond as the last ditch, would be trapped. He notified the President close by at Petersburg, and asked what should be done in the event of the game being bagged. The plan was, it seems, to have slain the ex-President and his cabinet officers in a route, and the charge had been described as massacre abroad. The arbiter on this point of anguish replied in his characteristic manner, I will tell you a story. There was once an Irishman, who signed the Father Matthew's temperance pledge, but a few days afterward he became terribly thirsty, and finally went into a familiar resort, where the barkeeper was, at first, startled to hear him call for a straight soda. He related that he had taken the pledge, so he hinted, with an Irishman's broadness of hint, you might put in some spirits, unbeknownst to me. Note, another and later version for the above was limitedly repeated at the time with gusto and appreciation of the subtlety, makes the hero a temperance lecturer at Lincoln's father's house. This is stupid, for Lincoln, a fervent temperance advocate, would not have decried the apostles of the doctrine for which he was also a sufferer. In course of time, doubt has been cast on this anecdote, by reason that the President would not have jested at such a juncture. But abundant confirmation was forthcoming at the time, Besides, we have so grave a general as Sherman alluding to the unbeknownst in an official document. End of section 374. This recording is in the public domain. Section 375 of The Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams one cannot die twice in lincoln's last interview with his rustic friends mrs armstrong repeated the fears many apprehended of evil being visited on the president-elect on his way to be inaugurated hannah if they do kill me i shall never die another death and laughed at her end of section three hundred seventy five this recording is in the public domain Section 376 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. No more invidious name calling. Read for LibriVox.org. On returning from a carriage drive into Washington, Mrs. Lincoln, who was not the Southern sympathizer the scandalous hinted, glanced at the city and said aloud with bitterness, That city is full of our enemies. Had she a premonition on the fatal eve? Right before the Marquise of Chambrin, their companion, the President serenely said, Enemies, Mary never speak of that. No wonder, when the dastardly taking off was brooded through the beaten but ever gallant South, they knew that they had lost their best friend, as General Pickett styled Lincoln. By the Marquise of Chambrin. End of section 376. This recording is in the public domain. Section 377 of the Lincoln Story Book by Henry L. Williams. The United States of America, the Treasury of the World. 
Read for LibriVox.org. The United States of America, the Treasury of the World. As Shiler Colfax was going west, Lincoln, in bidding him the last farewell, said foresightedly, I have very large ideas of the mineral wealth of our nation. Now that the rebellion is overthrown, and we know pretty nearly the amount of our national debt, the more gold and silver we mine, we make the payment of that debt the easier. Tell the miners from me that I shall promote their interests to the best of my ability, because their prosperity is the prosperity of the nation, and we shall prove in a few years that we are the treasury of the world. End of section 377 This recording is in the public domain. Section 378 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Hang on, not hang. Read for LibriVox.org. On April 11, 1865, Mr. Lincoln spoke out of his study window to an immense and joyous crowd. There were rockets and port fire and a huge bonfire while the president was serenaded. The finish of the rebellion delighted all persons. His offhand speech was full of compassion and brotherly love. Louisiana was already being reconstructed. Mr. Harlan, who followed the chief, touched the major key. "'What shall we do with the rebels?' to which the mob responded hoarsely, "'Hang them!' Lincoln's little son, Tad, was in the room, playing with the quills on the table where his father made his notes. He looked at his father and said, as one whose intimacy made him familiar with his inmost thoughts, "'No, papa, not hang them, but hang on to them.' The President triumphantly repeated, "'We must hang on to them. Tad's got it!' By Mrs. H. McCullough, present. End of section 378. This recording is in the public domain. Section 379 Of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Lincoln's Last Wish Read for LibriVox.org Lincoln's Last Wish Springfield How happy four years hence will I be to return there in peace and tranquillity. To the Marquise of Chambrun, April 1865 End of section 379 This recording is in the public domain. Section 380 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Assassination At Springfield, immediately upon the election for president, Lincoln began to receive letters with lethal menaces. His friends took them as serious, and two or more carried weapons and escorted him closely that no one with the dagger might reach his side. Calling on his stepmother for the farewell, she reiterated the general and rising fears. At Philadelphia, detectives and others whispered of a plot matured at Baltimore, and in his speech at raising the flag over Independence Hall, he said pointedly, If this country cannot be saved without giving up this principle, liberty to the world, I was about to say I would rather be assassinated on the spot than surrender it. I have said nothing but what I am willing to live by, and, if it be the pleasure of Almighty God, to die by. Speech, Philadelphia, February, 1861. End of section 380. This recording is in the public domain. Section 381 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. A President, Not an Emperor. Read for LibriVox.org. By Christine. A President, Not an Emperor. The President said to Colonel Halpin, as respected the lifeguards, which he soon dispensed with around his person, often going out unaware so as to dodge the escort in waiting. It will never do for the President of a Republic to have guards with drawn swords at his door, as if he fancied he were, or were trying to be, or were assuming to be an Emperor. End of section 381. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 382 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Plot to Waylay the President, 1860. Read for LibriVox.org by Steve Eberhardt. The dispute as to whether there was a foundation to the supposed plot to waylay and sequester President-elect Lincoln between Philadelphia and Washington is notable. From the later light and a letter from Wilkes Booth to his brother-in-law, Sleeper Clark, the comedian, no doubt is left that to kidnap him was a plot dated very early when the four-sided slaveholders were certain that he was a greater enemy from consistency than the louder-voiced and openly violent abolitionists. While Colonel Lehman doubted and wished he had not been beguiled into aiding the ignominious flight in disguise and secretly by train, Secretary Seward and General Scott gave it credence. The foreboding had touched Lincoln before he left his Illinois home. At Springfield his farewell speech is tinged with shade. At Philadelphia and Harrisburg he spoke of blood spilling and used the word assassination at the former. He took up the matter like a reasoner. Already the detective brothers, Pinkerton, had an inkling of the doings of the Knights of the Golden Circle, or some such secret society, designing regicide. So, as the concordance is held as a proof from the variance of the witnesses to scenes, he argued that the story was founded. Otherwise he would not have heard of the criminal attempt from all sides. That was what made him yield his dignity to the safety of a person whom he felt was chosen for the crisis. The next morning he had concluded to pass through Baltimore at another than the arranged hour to foil the plot. End of section 382 This recording is in the public domain. Section 383 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. I don't believe there is any danger. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine. I don't believe there is any danger. One night the President had been very late with the Secretary of War at the latter's department, but just the same he insisted on his getting home by the shortcut, a footpath lined and embowered by trees then leading from the war office to the White House. But Stanton stopped him. You ought not to go that way. It's dangerous for you in the daytime. It did lend itself to an ambustad, and persons who knew Wilkes Booth assert, having seen him prowling around. It's worse at night. I do not believe there is any danger there, night or day, responded the President, with Malcolm's confidence that he stood in the great hand of God. "'Well, Mr. President,' continued Stanton, a stubborn man himself, "'you shall not be killed returning from my department by that dark way while I am in it.' And he forced him to enter his carriage to return by the well-lighted avenue. Lincoln had previously consented to carry a cane. End of section 383 This recording is in the public domain. Section 384 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Worry till you get rid of things. Read for LibriVox.org. On Colonel Halpine trying to make the chief see that even indoors there was danger, he debated about the two menaces, violence of cranks and of a political fanatic. He thought too well of the sense of the people at Richmond, some of whom had been colleagues of his in his first stay at Washington as congressman. Do you think they would like to have Hannibal Hamlin, his first vice-president, here any better than myself? The story is repeated with his second vice substituted for the first, with the more justification, as Andy Johnson was impeached for his incompetency. Detective Baker put it this way, As to the crazy folks, I must take my chances, the most crazy people being, I fear, some of my own too zealous adherents. He had the same idea as in an ancient Chinese proverb, you may steal the captain out of his castle, but you cannot steal the castle. I am but a single individual, and it would not help their cause, or make the least difference in the progress of the war. Footnote. 
He might have said, as truly as his predecessor, John Tyler, reproached also for going about unguarded, My bodyguard is the people who elected me. Cited by F. B. Carpenter. End of section 384. This recording is in the public domain. Sections 385 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Fearlessness of the God Fearing. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine. The Fearlessness of the God Fearing. Lincoln said that by the death of his son Willie he was touched, by the victory of Gettysburg made a believer. It is plain that after this, a fortitude replaced the despondency stamping him. It may be due to this conviction of being one of the chosen, like Cromwell and Gordon, soldiers of Christ, that he met all adjurations for him to take care of his precious life with fanatical unconcern. He communicated to the cabinet, at the close of the conflict, how he had appointed to confer alone and without guards to terrify the emissary, a noted confederate. They were to discuss peace, and by that word Lincoln was drawn to any one. He answered the cautions with a simple saying, I am but an individual, and my removal will not in any way advance the other folks in their endeavors. In fact it was so. The misdeed was a double-edged blade which cut both ways. It will never be known, probably, how near a massacre followed the explosion of indignation at that maniac's murder of the emancipator. Fortunately, for the unsullied robe of Columbia, a hundred advocates of leaving retribution to heaven echoed Garfield's appeasing address. Lincoln met the intermediator, but the ultimate negotiation fell through, like the others all. He came home from City Point with sadness, but from his seed his outcome the Universal Peace Tribunal of the Hague. Professor Martins based his original plea of the Tsars on the Lincolnian Guide for the Soldiers in Our War. End of section 385. This recording is in the public domain. Section 386 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The Poisoning Plot. A servant at the White House testifies that he was approached by emissaries who offered him a sum almost preposterously large to put a powder in the milk for the Lincoln's family table. The agents knew that they were temperance followers, milk being as common as wine at previous tenants' table. This was laughed at before the shadow of Booth's patricide was cast ahead. But the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher publicly declares and he was in the state secrets as deeply as any layman, that President General Harrison, Tippecanoe, was poisoned that Tyler might fulfill the plan to annex Texas as a slave state. With even stronger convictions is it affirmed that President General Taylor was poisoned, that a less stern successor might give a suppler instrument to manage. Who doubts now that it was attempted Breckinridge in his room? End of section 386. This recording is in the public domain. Section 387 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Nothing like getting used to things. Read for LibriVox.org. Nothing like getting used to things. The more evident it grew that the president, at whom the stupid jeers persisted through incurable density of his enemies, was the vital motor of the Union cause, than threats of violently removing him were continually sent him. So many such letters accumulated that he grimly packeted them together and labelled the mass assassination papers. It was a Democlesian dagger of which he spoke lightly, because fear of death never awed him. When a man walks in the manifest path, traced out for him by heaven, he does not tremble. But friends, more concerned by the strain in watching over his safety, 
expressing surprise at his indifference, he tried to reassure them. Oh, there is nothing like getting used to things. End of section 387. This recording is in the public domain. Section 388 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Most Afraid of a Friendly Shot. Read for LibriVox.org. General Wadsworth, in his anxiety about the President's safety in Washington, swarming with insurgent agents, set a cavalry guard over the President's carriage. He went and complained to General Halleck, in charge of the Capitol, saying only partly facetiously, "'Why, Mrs. Lincoln and I cannot hear ourselves talk for the clatter of their sabres and spurs, and some of them appear to be new hands and very awkward, so that I am afraid of being shot by the accidental discharge of a carbine or revolver than any attempt upon my life by a roving squad of Jeb Stuart's cavalry. Since Stuart came twenty miles within the Union lines, he was the criterion of rebel raiders' possibilities. End of section 388. This recording is in the public domain. Section 389 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. The one word he had learned. Read for LibriVox.org. The one word he had learned. A tale-bearer came to the President with a plot against him and the government, which was a cock and bull without any adherence, and all superficial. Lincoln heard him out, but then sharply returned. There is one thing that I have learned, and that you have not. It's only one word, sorrow. Then bringing his huge hand down on the table-desk, to emphasize his meaning, he repeated, sorrow. End of section 389. This recording is in the public domain. Section number 390. Of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. Not to Disappoint the People. Read for LibriVox.org by Bill Elliott at Vocability.com. The strictly religious went so far as to call the Lincoln assassination a judgment, as it happened in a playhouse on a Good Friday. It appears that the president had compunctions, and at the last minute was disinclined to go, though a party had been made up to oblige a young espoused couple. But General Grant, who was to be a feature of the command performance, was called away, no doubt escaping the knife the murderer had in reserve to his pistol. The president said that he must go, not to disappoint the people on this gala night, as the rejoicing was wide over the dissolution of the Confederacy. End of section number 390. This recording is in the public domain. Section 391 of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams Nothing Like Prayer But Praise Read for LibriVox.org by Esther Nothing Like Prayer But Praise In 1862, the President suffered an affliction harder to bear than the war. His son Willie, William, next to the one that died in infancy, was carried off by typhoid fever under the presidential roof and another, Tad, Thomas, who actually lived to be twenty and passed away in Illinois, was given up by the physicians. At this crisis, Miss Dix, daughter of the general, famous for his order, if anyone offers to pull down the American flag, shoot him on the spot, recommended an army nurse, Mrs. Rebecca R. Pomeroy. She was a born succorer, pious and fortifying. She came reluctantly to the important errand, as she had to leave a wardful of wounded soldiers. She had lost many of her family, and was able to comfort, from gauging the affectionate father's grief. She led him to pray in his double racking of bad war news and the domestic distress. On next seeing him, and that he was less grieved, for news of the Fort Donaldson surrender to General Grant arrived in the meantime, she hastened to say, "'There is nothing like prayer, Mr. President.' Yes, there is. Praise. Prayer and praise must go together. The End 
End of section 391. End of the Lincoln Storybook by Henry L. Williams. This recording is in the public domain.